cast credit, notice, and explanatory of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Notice. All persons attempting to find a motive in this narrative will be prosecuted. Persons attempting to find a moral in it will be banished. Persons attempting to find a plot in it will be shot. By order of the author, per G. G., Chief of Ordnance. Explanatory in this book a number of dialects are used, to wit, the Missouri Negro dialect, the extremist form of the backwood southwestern dialect, the ordinary Pike County dialect, and four modified varieties of this last. The shadings have not been done in a haphazard fashion or by guesswork, but painstakingly, and with the trustworthy guidance and support of personal familiarity with these several forms of speech. I make this explanation for the reason that without it many readers would suppose that all these characters were trying to talk alike and not succeeding. The author Cast Credit Mark Twain read by Douglas Taylor Huckleberry Finn read by Patrick Seville Tom Sawyer read by Asher Gravy Miss Watson read by Rachel Jim Read by Oxenhandler. Ben Rogers. Read by Lydia. Judge Thatcher. Read by Douglas Taylor. Huck's Father. Read by Donald Cummings. John. Read by Willie. Ferryboat Captain. Read by Rachel. Man. Read by Nima. Mrs. Judith Loftus. Read by Rachel. Jim Turner. Read by Adele de Pignoles. Bill Bombs. Read by Adrian Strowett. Jake Packard. Read by John Burlinson. Watchman. Read by Larry Wilson. Parker. Read by Joseph Tabler. Colonel Grangerford. Read by Zames Curran. Bob Grangerford. Read by Kay Hand. Mrs. Grangerford. Read by Beth Thomas. Buck Grangerford. Read by Asher Gravy. Emmeline Grangerford, read by Rachel. Jack, read by Larry Wilson. A Shepherdson, read by Rachel. Another Shepherdson, read by David Purdy. The King, read by James Curran. Duke of Bridgewater, read by Edward Kirkby. A Spectator, read by Larry Wilson. Second Spectator, read by Joseph Tabler. Third Spectator, read by K. Hand. Hank, read by K. Hand. Colonel Shaban, read by Suman Barwa. Boggs's Daughter, read by Twinkle. Townsperson, read by Abai. Abner Shackelford, read by David Purdy. Dr. Robinson, read by Larry Wilson. Mary Jane Wilkes, read by K. Hand. Joanna Wilkes, read by Rachel. Susan Wilkes, read by Twinkle. Undertaker, read by Joseph Tabler. Another townsperson, read by Joseph Tabler. Harvey Wilkes, read by John Burlinson. Hines, read by Adele de Pignoles. Levy Bell, read by Suman Barua. Ab Turner, read by Douglas Taylor. Lies, read by Twinkle. Aunt Sally, read by Christine G. Uncle Silas, read by Evan Zeiger. Tom's Cousin, read by Super Coconut. Nat, read by Larry Wilson. Slave Girl, read by Super Coconut. Mrs. Hotchkiss, read by Kimberly Sawson. Mrs. Demrell, read by Beth Thomas. Mrs. Ridgway, read by Rachel. Aunt Polly, read by Mary J. End of cast credit, notice, and explanatory. Chapter 1
of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 1 Civilizing Huck. Miss Watson, Tom Sawyer, waits. You don't know about me without you have read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, but that ain't no matter. That book was made by Mr. Mark Twain, and he told the truth mainly. There was things which he stretched, but mainly he told the truth. That is nothing. I never seen anybody but lied one time or another. Without it was Aunt Polly, or the widow, or maybe Mary. Aunt Polly, Tom's Aunt Polly, she is, and Mary, and the widow Douglas, as all told about in that book, which is mostly a true book, with some stretchers, as I said before. Now the way that book winds up is this. Tom and me found the money that the robbers hid in the cave, and it made us rich. We got six thousand dollars apiece, all gold. It was an awful sight of money when it was piled up. Well, Judge Thatcher, he took it and put it out at interest, and it fetched us a dollar a day apiece, all the year round, more than a body could tell what to do with. The widow Douglas, she took me for her son, and allowed she would civilize me, but it was rough living in that house all the time, considering how dismal, regular, and decent the widow was in all her ways. And so when I couldn't stand it no longer, I lit out. I got into my old rags, in my sugar hog's head again, and was free and satisfied. But Tom Sawyer, he hunted me up, and said he was going to start a band of robbers, and I might join if I would go back to the widow and be respectable. So I went back. The widow, she cried over me, and called me a poor lost lamb, and she called me a lot of other names too, but she never meant no harm by it. She put me in them new clothes again, and I couldn't do nothing but sweat and sweat, and feel all cramped up. Well then, the old thing commenced again. The widow rung a bill for supper, and you had to come to time. When you got to the table, you couldn't go right to eatin', but you had to wait for the widow to tuck down her head and grumble a little over the victuals, though there weren't really anything the matter with them. That is, nothing, only everything was cooked by itself. In a barrel of odds and ends, it is different. Things get mixed up, and the juice kind of swaps around, and the things go better. After supper, she got out her book and learned me about Moses and the bulrushers, and I was in a sweat to find out all about him. But by and by, she let it out that Moses had been dead a considerable long time. So then, I didn't care no more about him, because I don't take no stock in dead people. Pretty soon, I wanted to smoke, and asked the widow to let me, but she wouldn't. She said it was a mean practice, and wasn't clean, and I must try not to do it any more. That is just the way with some people. They get down on a thing when they don't know nothing about it. Here she was a-bothering about Moses, which was no kin to her, and no use to anybody. Being gone, you see, yet finding a power of fault with me for doing a thing that had some good in it, and she took snuff, too. Of course, that was all right, because she'd done it herself. Her sister, Miss Watson, a tolerable slim old maid with goggles on, had just come to live with her, and took a sat at me now with a spelling book. She worked me middlin' hard for about an hour, and then the widow made her ease up. I couldn't stood it much longer. Then for an hour it was deadly dull, and it was fidgety. Miss Watson would say, Don't put your feet up there, Huckleberry. And, Don't scrunch up like that, Huckleberry. Sit up straight. And pretty soon she would say, Don't gap and stretch like that, Huckleberry. Why don't you try to behave? And then she told me all about the bad place, and I said I wished I was there. She got mad then, but I didn't mean no harm. All I wanted was to go somewheres. All I wanted was a change. I weren't particular. She said it was wicked to say what I said. Said she wouldn't say it for the whole world. She was going to live so as to go to the good place. Well, I couldn't see no advantage in going where she was going. So I made up my mind I wouldn't try for it. But I never said so, because it would only make trouble, and wouldn't do no good. Now she had got a start, and she went on and told me all about the good place. She said all a body would have to do there was to go around all day long with a harp and sing, forever and ever. So I didn't think much of it, but I never said so. 
asked her if she reckoned Tom Sawyer would go there, and she said, not by a considerable sight. I was glad about that, because I wanted him and me to be together. Miss Watson, she kept pecking at me, and I got tiresome and lonesome. By and by, they fetched the niggers in and had prayers, and then everybody was off to bed. I went up to my room with a piece of candle and put it on the table. Then I sat down in a chair by the window and tried to think of something cheerful, but it weren't no use. I felt so lonesome I most wish I was dead. The stars were shining and the leaves rustled in the woods, ever so mournful, and I heard an owl away off wooing about something that was dead, and a whippoorwill, and a dog crying about somebody that was going to die, and the wind was trying to whisper something to me, and I couldn't make out what it was, and so it made the cold shivers run over me. Then away out in the woods I heard that kind of a sound that a ghost makes when it wants to tell about something that's on its mind and can't make itself understood, and so can't rest easy in its grave, and has to go about that way every night grieving. I got so downhearted and scared I did wish I had some company. Pretty soon a spider went crawling up my shoulder, and I flipped it off and it lit it in the candle, and before I could budge it was all shriveled up. I didn't need anybody to tell me that that was an awful bad sign and would fetch me some bad luck. So I was scared, and most shook the clothes off of me. I got up and turned around in my tracks three times and crossed my breast every time, and then I tied up a little lock of my hair with a thread to keep witches away, but I had no confidence. You do that when you're lost a horseshoe that you found, instead of nailing it up over the door. But I hadn't ever heard anybody say it was any way to keep off bad luck when you killed a spider. I sat down again, a shaking all over, and got out my pipe for a smoke, for the house was all as still as death now, and so the widow wouldn't know. Well, after a long time, I heard the clock away off in the town go boom, 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 twelve licks, and all still again, stiller than ever. Pretty soon, I heard a twig snap down in the dark amongst the trees. Something was a-stirring. I sat still and listened. Directly, I could just barely hear a meow, meow, down there. That was good. Says I, meow, meow, as soft as I could, and then I put out the light and scrambled out of the window onto the shed. And then I slipped down the ground and crawled in among the trees, and sure enough, there was Tom Sawyer waiting for me. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 2 The Boys Escape Jim Tom Sawyer's Gang Deep Laid Plans We went tiptoeing along a path amongst the trees, back towards the end of the widow's garden, stooping down so as the branches wouldn't scrape our heads. When we was passing by the kitchen, I fell over a root and made a noise. We scrouched down and laid still. Miss Watson's big nigger, named Jim, was sitting in the kitchen door. We could see him pretty clear, because there was a light behind him. He got up and stretched his neck out, about a minute listening. Then he says, Who da? He listened some more. Then he came tiptoeing down and stood right between us. We could have touched him nearly. Well, likely it was minutes and minutes that there weren't a sound, and we all there were close together. There was a place in my ankle that got to itching, but I doesn't scratch it, and then my ear began to itch, and next my back, right between my shoulders. Seemed like I'd die if I couldn't scratch. Well, I've noticed that thing plenty of times since. If you are with the quality, or at a funeral, or trying to go to sleep when you ain't sleepy, if you were anywheres where it won't do for you to scratch, why, you will itch all over and upwards of a thousand places. Pretty soon, Jim says, Say who is you? Why is you? Dog my cats if I didn't hear something. Well, I know what I's going to do. I's going to sit down here and listen till I hears it again. So he sat down on the ground, betwixt me and Tom. He leaned his back up against the tree, 
and stretched his legs out till one of them most touched one of mine. My nose began to itch. It itched till the tears came into my eyes, but I doesn't scratch. Then it began to itch on the inside. Next it got to itching underneath. I didn't know how I was going to sit still. This miserableness went on as much as six or seven minutes, but it seemed a sight longer than that. I was itching in eleven different places now. I reckon I couldn't stand it more than a minute longer, but I set my teeth hard and got ready to try. Just then, Jim began to breathe heavy. Next, he began to snore, and then I was pretty soon comfortable again. Tom, he made a sign to me, kind of a little noise with his mouth and we went creeping away on our hands and knees. When we was ten foot off, Tom whispered to me, and wanted to tie Jim to the tree for fun. But I said no. He might wake, and make a disturbance, and then they'd find out I weren't in. Then Tom said he hadn't got candles enough, and he would slip in the kitchen and get some more. I didn't want him to try. I said Jim might wake up and come, but Tom wanted to risk it. So we slid in there and got three candles, and Tom laid five cents on the table for pay. Then we got out, and I was in a sweat to get away. But nothing would do Tom, but he must crawl to where Jim was, on his hands and knees, and play something on him. I waited, and it seemed a good while. Everything was so still and lonesome. As soon as Tom was back, we cut along the path around the garden fence, and by and by, fetched up on the steep top of the hill, the other side of the house. Tom said he slipped Jim's hat off off his head and hung it on a limb right over him, and Jim stirred a little, but he didn't wake. Afterwards, Jim said, the witches bewitched him and put him in a trance and rode him all over the state and then set him under the trees again and hung his hat on a limb to show who done it. And next time, Jim told it he said they rode him down to New Orleans, and after that, Every time he told it, he spread it more and more, till by and by he said they rode him all over the world, and tired him most to death, and his back was all over saddle boils. Jim was monstrous proud about it, and he got so he wouldn't hardly notice the other niggers. Niggers would come for miles to hear Jim tell about it, and he was more looked up to than any nigger in the country. Strange niggers would stand with their mouths open and look him all over, seem as if he was a wonder. Niggas is always talking about witches in the dark, by the kitchen fire, but when everyone was talking, and letting on to know all about such things, Jim would happen in and say, <laughs> What you know about witches? And that nigger was corked up and had to take a back seat. Jim always kept that five centerpiece round his neck with a string, and said it was a charm the devil gave to him with his own hands, and told him he could cure anybody with it and fetch witches whenever he wanted to, just by saying something to it. But he never told what it was, he said to it. Niggas would come from all around there, and give Jim anything they had, just for a sight of that five cent piece. But they wouldn't touch it, because the devil had had his hands on it. Jim was most ruined for a servant, because he got stuck up on account of having seen a devil, and been rode by witches. Well, when Tom and me got to the edge of the hilltop, we looked away down in the village, and could see three or four lights twinkling, where there was sick folks, maybe, and the stars over us was sparkling ever so fine, and down by the village was the river, a whole mile broad, and awful still and grand. We went down the hill and found Joe Harper, and Ben Rogers, and two or three more of the boys, hid in the old tan yard. So we unhitched a skiff, and pulled down the river two mile and a half to the big scar on the hillside, and went ashore. We went to a clump of bushes, and time made everybody swear to keep a secret, and then showed them a hole in the hill, right in the thickest part of the bushes. Then we lit the candles, and crawled in on our hands and knees. We went about two hundred yards, and then the cave opened up. Tom poked about amongst the passages, and pretty soon ducked under a wall, where he couldn't have noticed that there was a hole. We went along a narrow place, and got into a kind of room, all damp and sweaty and cold, and there we stopped. Tom says, Now, we'll start this band of robbers, and call it Tom Sawyer's gang. Everybody that wants to join has got to take an oath, and write his name in blood. Everybody was willing, so Tom got out a sheet of paper that he had wrote the oath on, 
and read it. It swore every boy to stick to the band and never tell any of the secrets. And if anybody had done anything to any boy in the band, whichever boy was ordered to kill that person and his family must do it. And you mustn't eat and you mustn't sleep till he had killed him and hacked the cross on their breasts, which was a sign of the band. And nobody that didn't belong to the band could use that mark. And if he did, he must be sued. And if he done it again, he must be killed. And if anybody that belonged to the band told the secrets, he must have his throat cut, and then have his carcass burn up, and the ashes scattered all around, and his name blotted out of the list with blood, and never mentioned again by the gang, but have a curse put on it, and be forgotten forever. Everybody said it was a real beautiful oath, and asked Tom if he had got it out of his own head. He said some of it, but the rest was out of the pirate books, and robber books, and every gang that was high-toned had it. Some thought it would be good to kill the families of the boys that told the secrets. Tom said it was a good idea, so he took a pencil and wrote it in. Then Ben Rogers says, Here's Huck Finn. He ain't got no family. What you gonna do about him? Well, ain't he got a father? Says Tom Sawyer. Yes, he's got a father, but you can't never find him these days. He used to lay drunk with the hogs in the tan yard, but he ain't been seen in these parts for a year or more. They talked it over, and they was going to rule me out, because they said every boy must have a family or somebody to kill, or else it wouldn't be fair and square for the others. Well, nobody could think of anything to do. Everybody was stumped and sat still. I was most ready to cry, but all at once I thought of a way, and so I offered them Miss Watson. They could kill her. Everybody said, Oh, oh she'll, she'll do. do. That's, That's all right. right. Huck, Huck can, can come in. in. Then they all stuck a pen in their fingers to get blood to sign with, and I made my mark on the paper. Now, says Ben Rogers, what's the line of business of this gang? Nothing. Only robbery and murder, Tom said. But who are we going to rob? Houses or cattle or... Stuff. Stealing cattle and such things ain't robbery, it's burglary, says Tom Sawyer. We ain't burglars. That ain't no sort of style. We are highwaymen. We stop stages and carriages on the road with masks on and kill the people and take their watches and money. Must we always kill the people? Oh, certainly. It's best. Some authorities think different, but mostly it's considered best to kill them. Except some that you bring to the cave here and keep them till they're ransomed. Ransomed? What's that? I don't know. But that's what they do. I've seen it in books. And so, of course, that's what we've got to do. But how can we do it if we don't know what it is? Why, blame it all, we've got to do it. Don't I tell you it's in the books? Do you want to go to doing different from what's in the books and get things all muddled up? Oh, that's all very fine to say, Tom Sawyer. But how in the nation are these fellows going to be ransomed if we don't know how to do it to them? That's the thing I want to get at. Now, what do you reckon it is? Well, I don't know. But perhaps if we keep them till they're ransomed, it means that we keep them till they're dead. Now, that's something like. That'll answer. Why couldn't you have said that before? We'll keep them till they're ransomed to death, and the bothersome lot they'll be, too, eating up everything and always trying to get loose. How you talk, Ben Rogers. How can they get loose when there's a guard over them, ready to shoot them down if they move a peg? A guard? Well, that is good. So somebody's got to sit up all night and never get any sleep just so as to watch them. I think that's foolishness. Why can't a body take a club and ransom them just as soon as they get here? Because it ain't in the book so. That's why. Now, Ben Rogers, do you want to do things regular or don't you? That's the idea. Don't you reckon that the people that made the books knows what's the correct thing to do? Do you reckon you can learn them anything? Not by a good deal. No, sir, we'll just go on and ransom them in the regular way. All right, I don't mind, but I say it's a full way anyhow. Say, do we kill the women too? Well, Ban Rogers, if I was as ignorant as you, I wouldn't let on. Kill the women? No. Nobody ever saw anything in the books like that. You fetch them to the cave, and you're always as polite as pie to them. And by and by they fall in love with you and never want to go home anymore. Well, if that's the way I'm agreed, but I don't take no stock in it. 
Mighty soon we'll have the cave so cluttered up with women and fellows waiting to be ransomed that there won't be no place for the robbers. But go ahead, I ain't got nothing to say. Little Tommy Barnes was asleep now, and when they wakened him up, he was scared and cried and said he wanted to go home to his ma and didn't want to be a robber any more. So they all made fun of him and called him Crybaby, and that made him mad, and he said he would go straight and tell all the secrets. But Tom gave him five cents to keep quiet and said would all go home and meet next week and rob somebody and kill some people. Ben Rogers said he couldn't get out much, only Sundays, and so he wanted to begin next Sunday. But all the boys said it would be wicked to do it on Sunday, and that settled the thing. They agreed to get together and fix a day as soon as they could, and then we elected Tom Sawyer, first captain, and Joe Harper, second captain of the gang, and so started for home. I club up the shed and crept into my window just before day was breaking. My new clothes was all greased up and clayey, and I was dog-tired. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter Three A Good Going Over. Grace Triumphant. One of Tom Sawyer's his Lies. Well, I got a good going over in the morning from old Miss Watson on account of my clothes. But the widow, she didn't scold, but only cleaned up the grease and clay, and looked so sorry that I thought I would behave a while if I could. But Miss Watson, she took me in the closet and prayed, but nothing come of it. She told me to pray every day, and whatever I asked for, I would get it. But it weren't so. I tried it. Once I got a fish line, but no hooks. It weren't any good to me without hooks. I tried for the hooks three or four times, but somehow I couldn't make it work. By and by, one day, I asked Miss Watson to try for me, but she said I was a fool. She never told me why, and I couldn't make it out no way. I sat down one time back in the woods and had a long think about it. I says to myself, if a body can get anything they prayed for, why don't Deacon Wynn get back the money he lost on pork? Why can't the widow get back her silver snuff-box that was stole? Why can't Miss Watson fat up? No, says I to myself, there ain't nothing in it. I went and told the widow about it, and she said the thing a body could get by praying for it was spiritual gifts. This was too many for me, but she told me what she meant. I must help other people and do everything I could for other people and look out for them all the time and never think about myself. This was including Miss Watson, as I took it. I went out in the woods and turned it over in my mind a long time, but I couldn't see no advantage about it except for the other people, so at last I reckoned I wouldn't worry about it any more, but just let it go. Sometimes the widow would take me one side and talk about Providence in a way to make a body's mouth water, but maybe the next day Miss Watson would take hold and knock it all down again. I judged. I could see that there was two providences, and the poor chap would stand considerable show with the widow's providence, but if Miss Watson's got him there, weren't no help for him any more. I thought it all out. I reckoned I would belong to the widow's if she wanted me, though I couldn't make out how he was a-going to be any better off than than what he was before, seeing I was so ignorant and so kind of low down and ornery. Pap, he hadn't been seen for more than a year and that was comfortable for me. I didn't want to see him no more. He used to always wail me when he was sober and could get his hands on me, though I used to take to the woods most of the time when he was around. Well, about this time, he was found in the river drowned, about twelve mile above town, so people said. They judged it was him anyway, said this drowned man was just his size, and was ragged, and had uncommon long hair which was all like pap, but they couldn't make nothing out of his face, because it had been in the water for so long, it weren't much of a face at all. 
They said he was floating on his back in the water. They took him and buried him on the bank, but I weren't comfortable long because I happened to think of something. I knowed mighty well that a drowned man don't float on his back but on his face. So I knowed then that this weren't pap, but a woman dressed up in a man's clothes. So I was uncomfortable again. I judged the old man would turn up again by and by, though I wished he wouldn't. We played robber now, and then about a month, and then I resigned. All the boys did. We hadn't robbed nobody, hadn't killed any people, but only just pretended. We used to hop out of the woods and go charging down on hog drivers and women in carts, taking garden stuff to market, but we never hived any of them. Tom Sawyer called the hogs ingots, and he called the turnips in the stuffed jewelry, and we would go to the cave and pow out over what we had done, and how many people we had killed and marked. But I couldn't see no profit in it. One time, Tom sent a boy to run about town with a blazing stick, which he called a slogan, which was the sign for the gang to get together. And then he said he had got secret news by his spies that the next day a whole parcel of Spanish merchants and rich Arabs was going to camp in Cave Hollow with two hundred elephants and six hundred camels and over a thousand sumpter mules all loaded down with diamonds and they didn't have only a guard or four hundred soldiers and so we would lay an ambuscade as he called it and kill the lot and scoop the things. He said we must slick up our swords and guns and get ready. He never could go after even a turnip cart but he must have the swords and the guns all scoured up for it, though they was only lath and broomsticks, and you might scour at them till you rotted, and then they weren't worth a mouthful of ashes, more than what they was before. I didn't believe we could lick such a crowd of Spaniards and Arabs, but I wanted to see the camels and elephants, so I was on hand next day, Saturday, in the ambuscade, and when we got the word, we rushed out of the woods, and down the hill, and there weren't no Spaniards and Arabs, and there weren't no camels nor elephants. It weren't anything but a Sunday school picnic, and only a primer class at that. We busted it up, and chased the children up the hollow, but we never got anything but some doughnuts and jam, though Ben Rogers got a rag doll, and Joe Harper got a hymn book and a tract, and then the teacher charged in, and made us drop everything and cut. I didn't see no diamonds, and I told Tom Sawyer so. He said there was loads of them there, anyway, and he said there was Arabs there, too, and elephants and things. I said, why couldn't we see him then? He said, if I weren't so ignorant, but had read a book called Don Quixote, I would know without asking. He said, it was all done by enchantment. He said there was hundreds of soldiers there, and elephants and treasure, and so on but we had enemies, which he called magicians, and they had turned the whole thing into an infant Sunday school, just out of spite. I said, all right, then the thing for us to do was to go for the magicians. Tom Sawyer said, I was a numbskull. Why, said he, a magician could call up a lot of genies, and they would hash you up like nothing before you could say Jack Robinson. They are as tall as a tree and as big around as a church. Well, I says, suppose we got some genies to help us. Can't we lick the other crowd then? How are you gonna get them? I don't know. How do they get them? Why, they rub an old tin lamp or an iron ring, and then the genies come tearing in, with the thunder and lightning a-ripping around and the smoke a-rolling. And everything's they're told to do, they up and do it. They don't think nothing of pulling a shot tower up by the roots and belting a Sunday school superintendent over the head with it. Or any other man. Who makes them tear around so? Why, whoever rubs the lamp or the ring. They belong to whoever rubs the lamp or the ring. And they've got to do whatever he says. If he tells them to build a palace 40 miles long out of diamonds and fill it full of chewing gum or whatever you want and fetch an emperor's daughter from China for you to marry, they've got to do it. And they've got to do it before sunup next morning too. And more, they've got to waltz that palace around over the country wherever you want it. You understand? Well, 
says I, I think they are a pack of flatheads for not keeping the palace themselves, stead of fooling them away like that. And what's more, if I was one of them, I would see a man in Jericho before I would drop my business and come to him for the rubbing of an old tin lamp. How you talk, Huck Finn, why you'd have to come when he rubbed it, whether you wanted to or not. What? And I as high as a tree and as big as a church? All right, then. I would come. But I lay. I'd make that man climb the highest tree there was in the country. Shucks. It ain't no use to talk to you, Huck Finn. You don't seem to know anything somehow. A perfect sap head. I thought this all over for two or three days, and then I reckoned I would see if there was anything in it. I got an old tin lamp and an iron ring, and went out in the woods and rubbed and rubbed till I sweat like an engine, calculating to build a palace and sell it, but it weren't no use. None of the genies come. So then I judged that all the stuff was only just one of Tom Sawyer's lies. I reckoned he believed in the Arabs and the elephants, but as for me, I think different. It had all the marks of a Sunday school. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter Four Huck and the Judge. Superstition. Well, three or four months run along, and it was well into the winter now. I had been to school most of the time, and could spell and read and write just a little, and could say the multiplication table up to six times seven is thirty-five, and I don't reckon I could ever get any further than that if I was to live forever. I don't take no stock in mathematics anyway. At first I hated the school, but by and by I got so I could stand it. Whenever I got uncommon tired, I played hooky and the hiding I got next day done me good and cheered me up. So, the longer I went to school, the easier it got to be. I was getting sort of used to the widow's ways, too, and they weren't so raspy on me. Living in a house and sleeping in a bed pulled on me pretty tightly, mostly. But before the cold weather, I used to slide out and sleep in the woods, sometimes, and so that was a rest to me. I liked the old ways best but I was getting so I liked the new ones, too, a little bit. The widow said I was coming along slow but sure, and doing very satisfactory. She said she weren't ashamed of me. One morning, I happened to turn over the salt cellar at breakfast. I reached for some of it as quick as I could to throw over my left shoulder and keep off the bad luck, but Miss Watson was in ahead of me and crossed me off. She says, Take your hands away, Huckleberry. What a mess you're always making. The widow put in a good word for me, but that weren't going to keep off the bad luck. I knowed that well enough. I started out after breakfast, feeling worried and shaky, and wondering where it was going to fall on me, and what it was going to be. There is ways to keep off some kinds of bad luck, but this wasn't one of them kind, so I never tried to do anything, but just poked along low-spirited, and on the watch-out. I went down to the front garden and clumb over the stile where you go through the high board fence. There was an inch of new snow on the ground, and I seen somebody's tracks. They had come up from the quarry and stood around the stile a while, and then went on around the garden fence. It was funny they hadn't come in after standing around so. I couldn't make it out. It was very curious, somehow. I was going to follow around, but I stooped down to look at the tracks first. I didn't notice anything at first, but next I did. There was a cross in the left boot heel, made with big nails to keep off the devil. I was up in a second, and shining down the hill. I looked over my shoulder every now and then, but I didn't see nobody. 
I was at Judge Thatcher's as quick as I could get there, he said. Why, my boy, you are all out of breath. Did you come for your interest? No, sir, I says. Is there some for me? Oh, yes, a half yearly is in last night. Over a hundred and fifty dollars. Quite a fortune for you. You had better let me invest it along with your six thousand, because if you take it, you'll spend it. No, sir, I says. I don't want to spend it. I don't want at all. No, the six thousand neither. I want you to take it. I want to give it to you, the six thousand and all. He looked surprised. He couldn't make it out, he says. What? What can you mean, my boy? I says. Don't you ask me no questions about it, please. You'll take it, won't you? He says. Well, I'm puzzled. Is something the matter? Please take it, says I. And don't ask me nothing. Then I won't have to tell no lies. He studied a while, and then he says, Oh, uh -huh. I think I see. You want to sell all your property to me, not give it. That's the correct idea. Then he wrote something on a paper, and read it over, and says, There, you see, it says, for consideration. That means I have bought it of you and paid you for it. Here's a dollar for you. Now you sign it. So I signed it and left. Miss Watson's nigger Jim had a hairball as big as your fist, which had been took out of the fourth stomach of an ox, and he used to do magic with it. He said there was a spirit inside of it, and it knowed everything. So I went to him that night and told him Pap was here again, for I found his tracks in the snow. What I wanted to know was what he was going to do, and was he going to stay. Jim got out his hairball and said something over it, and then he held it up and dropped it to the floor. It fell pretty solid and only rolled about an inch. Jim tried it again, and then another time, and it acted just the same. Jim got down on his knees and put his ear against it and listened. But it weren't no use. He said it wouldn't talk. He said sometimes it wouldn't talk without money. I told him I had an old stick counterfeit quarter that weren't no good because the brass showed through the silver a little and it wouldn't pass no how even if the brass didn't show because it was so slick it felt greasy and so that would tell on it every time. I reckoned I wouldn't say nothing about the dollar I got from the judge. I said it was pretty bad money but maybe the hairball would take it because maybe it wouldn't know the difference. Jim smelt it and bit it and rubbed it and said he would manage so the hairball would think it was good. He said he would split open a raw Irish potato and stick the quarter in between and keep it there all night. And next morning you couldn't see no brass and it wouldn't feel greasy no more. And so anybody in town would take it in a minute, let alone a hairball. Well, I knowed a potato would do that before, but I had forgot it. Jim put the quarter under the hairball and got down and listened again. This time he said the hairball was all right. He said it would tell my whole fortune if I wanted it to. I says go on. So the hairball talked to Jim, and Jim told it to me. He says, Your old father don't know yet what he's going to do. Sometimes he spec he'll go away, and then again he spec he'll stay. The best way is to rest easy and let the old man take his own way. There's two angels hovering round about him. One of them is white and shiny, and the other one is black. The white one gets him to go right a little while. Then the black one sail in and bust it all up. A body can't tell yet which one going to fetch him in the last. But you is all right. You going to have considerable trouble in your life. 
and considerable joy. Sometimes you're going to get hot, and sometimes you're going to get sick. But every time you're going to get well again, there's two gals flying about you in your life. One of them's light, and the other one is dark. One is rich, and the other is poor. You's going to marry the poor one first, and the rich one by and by. You wants to keep away from the water as much as you kin, and don't run no risk, case it's down in the bills that you going to get hung. When I lit my candle and went up to my room that night, there sat Pop, his own self. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter Five Huck's Father, The Fond Parent, Reform. I had shut the door too. Then I turned around, and there he was. I used to be scared of him all the time. He tanned me so much. I reckoned I was scared now, too. But in a minute, I see I was mistaken. That is, after the first jolt, as you may say, with my breath sort of hitched, he being so unexpected. But right away, after I see I wasn't scared of him, worth bothering about. He was most of fifty and he looked it. His hair was long and tangled and greasy, and hung down, and you could see his eyes shining through like he was behind vines. It was all black, no gray. So was his long mixed-up whiskers. There weren't no color in his face. Where his face showed, it was white. Not like another man's white, but a white to make a body sick, a white to make a body's flesh crawl. A tree toad white, a fish belly white. As for his clothes, just rags, that was all. He had one ankle resting on to other knee. The boot on that foot was busted, and two of his toes stuck through, and he worked them now and then. His hat was laying on the floor, an old black slouch with the top caved in like a lid. I stood a looking at him. He sat there a-looking at me, with his chair tilted back a little. I set the candle down. I noticed the window was up, so we had climbed in by the shed. He kept a-looking me all over. By and by, he says, Starchy clothes, very. You think you're a good deal of a big bug, don't you? Maybe I am, maybe I ain't, I says. Don't you give me none of your lip, says he. You've put on considerable many frills since I've been away. I'll take you down a peg before I get done with you. You're educated, too, they say. Can read and write. You think you're better than your father now, don't you? Because he can't. I'll take it out of you. Who told you you might meddle with such high and foolishness, eh? Hey? Who told you you could? The widow, she told me. The widow, hey? And who told the widow she could put in her shovel about a thing that ain't none of her business? Nobody never told her. Well, I'll learn her out of metal. And looky here, you drop that school, you hear? I'll learn people to bring up a boy to put on airs over his own father and let on to be better than he is. You let me catch you fooling around that school again, you hear? Your mother couldn't read, and she couldn't write another before she died. None of the family could before they died. I can't, and here you're a swelling yourself up like this. I ain't the man to stand it, you hear? Say, let me hear you read. I took up a book and began something about General Washington and the wars. When I had read about a half a minute, he fetched the book a whack with his hand and knocked it across the house. He says, It's so. You can do it. I had my doubts when you told me. Now looky here. You stop that putting on frills. I won't have it. I'll lay for you, my smarty. 
and if i catch you about that school i'll tan you good first you know you'll get religion too i never seen such a son he took up a little blue and yaller picture of some cows and a boy and says what's this it's something they give me for learning my lessons good he tore it up and says i'll give you something better i'll give you a cowhide he sat there a mumbling and a growling a minute and then he says ain't you a sweet scented dandy though a bed and bedclothes and a looking glass and a piece of carpet on the floor and your own father got to sleep with the hogs in the tan yard i never see such a son i bet i'll take some of these frills out of you before i'm done with you why there ain't no end to your airs they say you're rich hey how's that they lie that's how looky here mind how you talk to me i'm a-standin about all i can stand now so don't give me no sass i've been in town two days and i hain't heard nothin but about you bein rich i heard about it away down the river too that's why i come you get me that money tomorrow. i want it i ain't got no money it's a lie judge thatcher's got it you get it i want it i hain't got no money i tell you you ask judge thatcher he'll tell you the same all right i'll ask him and i'll make him pungle too or i'll know the reason why say how much you got in your pocket i want it i hain't got only a dollar and i want that too it don't make no difference what you want it for you just shell it out he took it and bid it to see if it was good and then he said he was going down to town to get some whiskey said he hadn't got a drink all day when he had got out on the shed he put his head in again and cussed me for putting on frills and trying to be better than him and when i reckoned he was gone he come back and put his head in again and told me to mind about that school because he was going to lay for me and lick me if i didn't drop that the next day he was drunk and he went to judge thatcher's and bully ragged him and tried to make him give up the money but he couldn't and then he swore he'd make the law force him the judge and the widow went to law to get the court to take me away from him and that one of them be my guardian but it was a new judge that had just come and he didn't know the old man so he said courts mustn't interfere and separate families if they could help it said he'd rather not take a child away from its father so judge thatcher and the widow had to quit on the business that pleased the old man till he couldn't rest he said he'd cowhide me till i was black and blue if i didn't raise some money for him i borrowed three dollars from judge thatcher and pap took it and got drunk and went a blowin around and cussin and whoopin and carrying on and he kept it up all over town with a tin pan till most midnight then they jailed him and next day they had him before court and jailed him again for a week but he said he was satisfied said he was boss of his son and he'd make it warm for him when he got out the new judge said he was a goin to make a man of him so he took him to his own house and dressed him up clean and nice and had him to breakfast and dinner and supper with the family it was just old pie to him so to speak and after supper he talked to him about temperance and such things till the old man cried and said he'd been a fool and fooled away his life but now he was a-goin to turn over a new leaf and to be a man nobody wouldn't be ashamed of and he hoped the judge would help him and not look down on him the judge said he could hug him for them words so he cried and his wife she cried again pep said he'd been a man that had always been misunderstood before and the judge said he believed it the old man said that what a man wanted that was down was sympathy and the judge said it was so so they cried again and when it was bedtime the old man rose up and held out his hand and says look at it gentlemen and ladies all take a hold of it shake it there is a hand that was the hand of a hog but it ain't so no more it's the hand of a man that started in on a new life and'll die before he'll go back you mark them words don't forget i said them it's a clean hand now 
shake it don't be afeard so they shook it one after the other all around and cried the judge's wife she kissed it then the old man he signed the pledge made his mark the judge said it was the holiest time on record or something like that then they tucked the old man into a beautiful room which was a spare room and in the night some time he got powerful thirsty and clumb out on to the porch roof and slid down the stanchion and traded his new coat for a jug of forty rod and clumb back again and had a good old time and towards daylight he crawled out again drunk as a fiddler and rolled off the porch and broke his left arm in two places and was most froze to death when somebody found him after sun-up and when they came to look at that spare room they had to take soundings before they could navigate it the judge he felt kind of sore he said he reckoned a body could reform the old man with a shotgun maybe but he didn't know no other way End of chapter five chapter six of the adventures of huckleberry finn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the adventures of huckleberry finn by mark twain chapter six he went for judge thatcher huck decided to leave political economy thrashing around well pretty soon the old man was up and around again and then he went for judge thatcher in the courts to make him give up that money and he went for me too for not stopping school he catched me a couple times and thrashed me but i went to school just the same and dodged him or outrun him most of the time i didn't want to go to school much before but i reckoned i go now to spite pap that law trial was a slow business appeared like they weren't ever going to get started on it so every now and then i borrow two or three dollars off of the judge for him to keep from getting a cow hiding every time he got money he got drunk and every time he got drunk he raised cane around town and every time he raised cane he got jailed he was just suited this kind of thing was right in his line he got to hanging around the widows too much and so she told him at last that if he didn't quit using around there she would make trouble for him well wasn't he mad he said he would show who was huck finn's boss so he watched out for me one day in the spring and catched me and took me up the river about three mile in a skiff and crossed over to the illinois shore where it was woody and where wouldn't no houses but an old log hut in a place where the timber was so thick you couldn't find it if you didn't know where it was he kept me with him all the time and i never got a chance to run off we lived in that old cabin and he always locked the door and put the key under his head nights he had a gun which he had stole i reckon and we fished and hunted and that was what we lived on every little while he locked me in and went down to the store three miles to the ferry and traded fish and game for whiskey and fetched it home and got drunk and had a good time and licked me the widow she found out where i was by and by and she set a man over to try to get a hold of me but pap drove him off with a gun and it wasn't long after till i was used to being where i was and liked it all but the cowhide part it was kind of lazy and jolly laying off comfortable all day smoking and fishing and no books nor study two months or more run along and my clothes got to be all rags and dirt and i didn't see how i'd ever got to like it so well at the widow's where you had to wash and eat on a plate and comb up and go to bed and get up regular and be forever bothering over a book and have old miss watson pecking at you all the time i didn't want to go back no more i had stopped cussing because the widow didn't like it but now i took to it again because pap hadn't no objections it was pretty good times up in the woods there taking it all around but by and by pap got too handy with his hickory and i couldn't stand it 
I was all over welts. He got to going away so much, too, and locked me in. Once he'd locked me in and was gone three days. It was dreadful lonesome. I judged he had got drownded, and I wasn't ever going to get out any more. I was scared. I made up my mind I would fix up some way to leave there. I had tried to get out of that cabin many a time, but I couldn't find no way. There weren't a window to it big enough for a dog to get through. I couldn't get up the chimney. It was too narrow. The door was thick, solid oak slabs. Pep was pretty careful not to leave a knife or anything in the cabin when he was away. I reckoned I had hunted the place over as much as a hundred times. Well, I was most all the time at it, because it was about the only way to put in the time. But this time I found something at last. I found an old rusty wood saw without any handle. It was laid in between a rafter and the clapboards of the roof. I greased it up and went to work. There was an old horse blanket nailed against the logs at the far end of the cabin, behind the table, to keep the wind from blowing through the chinks and putting the candle out. I got under the table and raised the blanket. I went to work to saw a section of the big bottom log out, big enough to let me through. Well, it was a good long job, but I was getting toward the end of it when I heard Pap's gun in the woods. I got rid of the signs of my work and dropped the blanket and hid my saw, and pretty soon Pap came in. Pap weren't in good humor, so he was his natural self. He said he was downtown, and everything was going wrong. His lawyer said he reckoned he would win his lawsuit and get the money, if they ever got started on the trial. But then there was ways to put it off a long time. The Judge Thatcher knowed it how to do it. And he said, people allowed there be another trial to get me away from him and give me to the widow for my guardian and they guessed it would win this time this shook me up considerable because i didn't want to go back to the widow any more and be so cramped up and civilized as they called it then the old man got to cussing and cussed everything and everybody he could think of and then cussed them all over again to make sure he hadn't skipped any and after that he polished off with the kind of a general cuss all around, including a considerable parcel of people, which he didn't know the names of, and so called them what's his name when he got to them, and went right along with his cussin'. He said he would like to see the widow get me. He said he would watch out, and if they tried to come any such game on him, he knowed of a place six or seven mile off to show me in, where they might hunt till they dropped and they couldn't find me. That made me pretty uneasy again, but only for a minute. I reckoned I wouldn't stay on till he got that chance. The old man made me go to the skiff and fetch the things he had got. There was a fifty-pound sack of cornmeal, and a side of bacon, ammunition, and a four-gallon jug of whiskey, and an old book and two newspapers for wadding, besides some tow. I towed it up a load, and went back and sat down on the bow of the skiff to rest. I thought it all over, and I reckoned I would walk off with the gun and some lines, and take to the woods when I run away. I guessed I wouldn't stay in one place, but just tramp right across the country, most night times, and hunt and fish to keep alive, and so get so far away that the old man nor the widow couldn't ever find me any more. I judged I would saw out and leave that night if Pap got drunk enough, and I reckoned he would. I got so full of it, I didn't notice how long I was staying till the old man hollered and asked me whether I was asleep or drowned. I got the things all up to the cabin, and then it was about dark. While I was cooking supper, the old man took a swig or two and got sort of warmed up and went to ripping again. He had been drunk over in town, and laid in the gutter all night, and he was a sight to look at. A body would a thought he was Adam. He was just all mud. Whenever his liquor began to work, he most always went for the government. This time, he says, Call this a government? Why, just look at it and see what it's like. Here's the law standing ready to take a man's son away from him, a man's own son. 
which he has had all the trouble and all the anxiety and all the expense of raising yes just as that man has got that son raised at last and ready to go to work and begin to do something for him and give him a rest the law up and goes for him and they call that government that ain't all another the law backs that old judge thatcher up and helps him to keep me out of my property here's what the law does the law takes a man worth six thousand dollars and upwards and jams him into an old trap of a cabin like this and lets him go round in clothes that ain't fitting for a hog they call that government a man can't get his rights in a government like this sometimes i've a mighty notion to just leave the country for good and all yes and i told him so i told old thatcher so to his face lots of em heard me and can tell what i said says i for two cents i'd leave the blamed country and never come near it again them's the very words i says look at my hat if you call it a hat but the lid raises up and the rest of it goes down till it's below my chin and then it ain't rightly a hat at all but more like my head was shoved up through a gin of stovepipe look at it says i such a hat for me to wear one of the wealthiest men in this town if i could get my rights oh yes this is a wonderful government wonderful well looky here there was a free nigger up there from ohio a mulatter most as white as a white man he had the whitest shirt on you ever see too and the shiniest hat and there ain't a man in that town as got as fine clothes as what he had and he had a gold watch and chain and a silver-headed cane the awfulest old gray-headed nabob in the state and what do you think they said he was a professor in a college and could talk all kinds of languages and knowed everything and that ain't the worst they said he could vote when he was at home well that let me out thinks i what is the country a coming to it was election day and i was just about to go and vote myself if i warn't too drunk to get there but when they told me there was a state in this country where they'd let that nigger vote i draw it out i says i'll never vote again them's the very words i said they all heard me and the country may rot for all me i'll never vote again as long as i live and to see the cool way of that nigger why he wouldn't give me the road if i hadn't shoved him out of the way i says to the people why ain't this nigger put up at auction and sold that's what i want to know and what do you reckon they said why they said he couldn't be sold till he had been in the state six months and he hadn't been there that long yet there now that's a specimen they call that a government that can't sell a free nigger till he's been in the state six months here's a government that calls itself a government and lets on to be a government and thinks it is a government and yet it's got to sit stock still for six whole months before it can take a hold of a prowling thieving infernal white-shirted free nigger and pap was a goin on so he never noticed where his old limber legs was taking him to so he went head over heels over the tub of salt pork and barked both shins and the rest of his speech was all the hottest kind of language mostly hove at the nigger and the government though he give the tub some too all along here and there he hopped about the cabin considerable first on one leg and then on the other holding first one shin and then the other one and at last he let out with his left foot all of a sudden and fetched the tub a rattling kick but it weren't good judgment because that was the boot that had a couple of his toes leaking out of the front end of it so now he raised a howl and fairly made a body's hair rise and down he went in the dirt and rolled there and held his toes and the cussing he done then laid over anything he had ever done previous he said so his own self afterwards he had heard old salberry hagin in his best days and said it laid over him too but i reckon that was sort of piling it on maybe after supper pap took the jug and said he had enough whiskey there for two drunks and one delirium trempins that was always his word i judged he would be blind drunk in about an hour and then i would steal the key or saw myself out one or t'nother he drank and drank and tumbled down on his blankets by and by but luck didn't run my way he didn't go sound asleep but was uneasy he groaned and moaned and thrashed around his way in that for a long time at last i got so sleepy i couldn't keep my eyes open all i could do and so before i knowed what i was about i was sound sleep 
and the candle burning. I don't know how long I was asleep, but all of a sudden there was an awful scream, and I was up. There was Pap looking wild, and skipping about every which way and yelling about snakes. He said they was crawling up his legs, and then he would give a jump and a scream, and say one had bit him on the cheek. But I couldn't see no snakes. He started and run round and round the cabin, hollering, Take him off! Take him off! He's biting me on the neck! I never see a man look so wild in his eyes. Pretty soon he was all fagged out and fell down panting. Then he rolled over and over wonderful fast, kicking things every which way and striking and jabbing at the air with his hands and screaming and saying there was devils a hold of him. He wore out by and by and laid still a while moaning. Then he laid stiller and didn't make a sound. I could hear the owls and the wolves away off in the woods, and it seemed terrible still. He was laying over by the corner. By and by, he raised up part way and listened with his head to one side. He says very low, Tramp, tramp, tramp. That's the dead. Tramp, tramp, tramp. They're coming after me, but I won't go. Oh, the hair. Don't touch me. Don't. Hands off. They're cold. Let go. Oh, let a poor devil alone. Then he went down on all fours and crawled off, begging them to let him alone, and he rolled himself up in his blanket and wallowed in under the old pine table, still a begging, and then he went to crying. I could hear him through the blanket. By and by, he rolled out and jumped up on his feet, looking wild, and he see me and went for me. He chased me round and round the place with a clasp knife calling me the angel of death and saying he would kill me and then i couldn't come for him no more i begged and told him i was only hook but he laughed such a screechy laugh and roared and cussed and kept on chasing me up once when i turned short and dodged under his arm he made a grab and got me by the jacket between my shoulders and i thought i was gone but i slid out of the jacket quick as lightning and saved myself pretty soon he was all tired out and dropped down with his back against the door and said he would rest a minute and then kill me he put his knife under him and said he would sleep and get strong and then he would see who was who so he dozed off pretty soon by and by i got the old split bottom chair and clumb up as easy as i could not to make any noise and got down the gun I slipped the ramrod down it to make sure it was loaded. Then I laid it across the turnip barrel, pointing towards Pap, and sat down behind it to wait for him to stir. And how slow and still the time did drag along. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 7 Laying for Him Locked in the Cabin Sinking the Body Resting Get up! What you bout? I opened my eyes and looked around, trying to make out where I was. It was after sun-up and I had been sound asleep. Pop was standing over me, looking sour and sick, too. He says, What you doing with this gun? I judged he didn't know nothing about what he had been doing. So I says, Somebody tried to get in, so I was laying for him. Why didn't you rouse me out? Well, I tried to, but I couldn't. I couldn't budge you. Well, all right. Don't stand there palavering all day, but out with you and see if there's a fish on the lines for breakfast. I'll be along in a minute. He unlocked the door, and I cleared out up the river bank. I noticed some pieces of limbs and such things floating down, and a sprinkling of bark, so I knowed the river had begun to rise. I reckoned I would have great times now, if I was over at the town. The June rise used to be always luck for me, because as soon as that rise begins, here comes cordwood floating down, and pieces of log rafts. 
sometimes a dozen logs together, so all you have to do is catch them and sell them to the woodyards in the sawmill. I went along up the bank with one eye out for Pap and to other one out for what the rides might fetch along. Well, all that once, here comes a canoe. Just a beauty, too, about thirteen or fourteen feet long, riding high like a duck. I shot head first off of the bank like a frog, clothes on and all, and struck out for the canoe. I just expected there to be somebody laying down in it, because people often done that, to fool folks, and when the chap had pulled a skiff out, most to it they'd rise up and laugh at him. But it weren't so this time. It was a drift canoe sure enough, and I clum in and paddled her ashore. Thanks, I, the old man will be glad when he sees this. She's worth ten dollars. But when I got to shore, Pep wasn't in sight yet, and as I was running her into the little creek, like a gully, all hung over with vines and willows, I struck another idea. I judged I'd hide her good, and then, instead of taking to the woods, when I run off, I go down the river, about fifty mile, and camp in one place for good and not have such a rough time tramping on foot. I was pretty close to the shanty, and I thought I heard the old man coming all the time, but I got her hid, and then I out, and looked around a bunch of willows, and there was an old man, down the path a piece, just drawing on a bead, on that bird with his gun. So we hadn't seen anything. When he got along, I was hard at it taking up a trot line. He abused me a little for being so slow, but I told him I fell in the river, and that was what made me so long. I knowed he would see I was wet, and then he would be asking questions. We got five catfish off the lines, and went home. While we laid off after breakfast to sleep up, both of us being about wore out, I got to thinking that if I could fix up some way to keep Pap and the widow from trying to follow me, I would be a certainer thing than trusting to luck to get far enough off before they missed me. You see, all kinds of things might happen. Well, I didn't see no way for a while, but by and by, Pap raised up a minute to drink another barrel of water, and he says, Another time a man comes a-prowling around here, you roust me out, you hear? That man weren't here for no good. I'd a shot him. Next time you roust me out, you hear? Then he dropped down and went to sleep again, but what he had been saying give me the very idea I wanted. I says to myself, I can fix it now, so nobody won't think of following me. About twelve o'clock, we turned out and went along up the bank. The river was coming up pretty fast, and lots of driftwood going by on the rise. By and by, along comes part of a log raft. Nine logs fast together. We went out with the skiff and towed it ashore. Then we had dinner. Anybody but Pap would have waited and seen the day through so as to catch more stuff. But that weren't Pap's style. Nine logs was enough for one time. He must shove right over to town and sell. So he locked me in and took the skiff, and started off towing the raft about half past three. I judged he wouldn't come back that night. I waited till I reckoned he had got a good start. Then I out with my saw and went to work on that log again. Before he was to other side of the river, I was out of the hole. Him and his raft was just a speck on the water, away off yonder. I took the sack of corn meal, and took it to where the canoe was hid, and shoved the vines and branches apart, and put it in. Then I done the same with the side of bacon, then the whiskey jug. I took all the coffee, and sugar there was, and all the ammunition, I took the wadden. I took the bucket and the gourd. I took a dipper and a tin cup, and my old saw and two blankets, and the skillet and the coffee pot. I took fish lines and matches and other things, everything that was worth a cent. I cleaned out the place. I wanted an axe, but there wasn't any, only the one out of the wood pile, and I knowed why I was going to leave that. I fetched out the gun and now I was done. I had wore the ground a good deal crawling out of the hole, and dragging out so many things, so I fixed that as good as I could, 
from the outside by scattering dust on the place, which covered up the smoothness and the sawdust. Then I fixed the piece of the log back into its place, and put two rocks under it, and one against it to hold it there, for it was bent up at that place, and didn't quite touch ground. If you stood four or five foot away, and didn't know it was sawed, you wouldn't never notice it, and besides, this was the back of the cabin, and it weren't likely anybody would go foolin' around there. It was all grass, clear to the canoe, so it hadn't left a track. I followed around to see. I stood on the bank and looked out over the river, all safe. So I took the gun and went up a piece into the woods, and was a-hunting around for some birds when I saw a wild pig. Hogs soon went wild in them bottoms after they had got away from the prairie farms. I shot this fellow and took him into camp. I took the axe and smashed in the door. I beat in and hacked it considerable a doing it. I fetched the pig in and took him back nearly to the table and hacked into his throat with the axe and laid him down on the ground to bleed. I say ground because it was ground, hard packed and no boards. Well, next I took an old sack and put a lot of big rocks in it, all I could drag, and I started it from the pig and dragged it to the door and threw the woods down to the river and dumped it in, and down it sunk out of sight. You could easy see that something had been dragged over the ground. I did wish Tom Sawyer was there. I know he would take an interest in this kind of business and throw in the fancy touches. Nobody could spread himself like Tom Sawyer and such a thing as that. Well, at last I pulled out some of my hair and abutted the axe good and stuck it on the back side and slung the axe in the corner. Then I took up the pig and held him to my breast with my jacket so he couldn't drip till I got a good piece below the house and then dumped him into the river. Now I thought of something else, so I went and got the bag of meal and my old saw out of the canoe and fetched them to the house. I took the bag to where it used to stand and ripped a hole in the bottom of it with the saw, for there weren't no knives and forks on the place. Pap done everything with his clap knife about the cooking. Then I carried the sack about a hundred yards across the grass and through the willows east of the house to a shallow lake that was five miles wide and full of rushes, and ducks too, you might say, in the season. There was a slow or a creek leading out of it on the other side that went miles away. I don't know where, but it didn't go to the river. The meal stiffed it out and made a little track all the way to the lake. I dropped Pap's whetstone there, too, so as to look like it had been done by accident. Then I tied up the rip in the meal sack with a string, so it wouldn't leak no more, and took it into my saw to the canoe again. It was about dark now, so I dropped the canoe down the river, under some willows that hung over the bank, and waited for the moon to rise. I made fast to a willow, then I took a bite to eat, and by and by laid down in the canoe to smoke a pipe and lay out a plan. I says to myself, they'll follow the track of that sack full of rocks to the shore and then drag the river for me, and they'll follow that meal track to the lake and go browsing down the creek that leads out of it to find the robbers that killed me and took the things. They won't ever hunt the river for anything but my dead carcass. They'll soon get tired of that and won't bother no more about me. All right. I can stop anywhere I want to. Jackson's Island is good enough for me. I knows that island pretty well, and nobody ever comes there. And then I can paddle over to the town nights, and slink around and pick off things I want. Jackson's Island's the place. I was pretty tired, and the first thing I knowed I was asleep. When I woke up I didn't know where I was for a minute. I sat up and looked around, a little scared. Then I remembered. The river looked miles and miles across. The moon was so bright I could have counted the drift logs that went a-slipping along, black and still, hundreds of yards out from the shore. Everything was dead quiet, and it looked late, and smelt late. You know what I mean. I don't know the words to put it in. I took a good gap in a stretch, and was just going to unhitch and start when I heard a sound away over the water. 
I listened. Pretty soon I made it out. It was that dull kind of a regular sound that comes from moors working in rowlocks when it's a still night. I peeped out through the widow branches, and there it was, a skiff, away across the water. I couldn't tell how many was in it. It kept a coming, and when it was abreast of me, I see there wasn't but one man in it. Thinks I, maybe it's Pap, though I weren't expecting him. He dropped below me with the current, and by and by he came a-swinging up the shore in the easy water, and he went by so close I could a reached out the gun and touched him. Well, it was Pap, sure enough, and sober too by the way he laid his oars. I didn't lose no time. The next minute I was a-spinning downstream, soft but quick, in the shade of the bank. I made two mile and a half, and then stuck out a quarter of a mile or more towards the middle of the river, because pretty soon I would be passing the ferry landing, and people might see me and hail me. I got out amongst the driftwood, and then laid down in the bottom of the canoe, and let her float. I laid there, and had a good rest, and a smoke out of my pipe, looking away into the sky, not a cloud in it. The sky looks ever so deep when you lay down on your back in the moonshine. I never knowed it before, and how far a body can hear on the water such nights. I heard people talking at the ferry landing. I heard what they said, too, every word of it. One man said it was getting towards the long days and the short nights now. The other one said this weren't one of the short ones, he reckoned, and then they laughed and he said it over again, and they laughed again. Then they waked up another fellow and told him, and laughed, but he didn't laugh. He ripped out something brisk, and said let him alone. The first fellow said he loathed to tell it to his old woman. She would think it was pretty good, but he said that were nothing to some things he had said in his time. I heard one man say it was nearly three o'clock and he hoped daylight wouldn't wait more than about a week longer. After that, the talk got further and further away, and I couldn't make out the words any more, but I could hear the mumble, and now and then a laugh, too, but it seemed a long ways off. I was away below the ferry now. I rose up, and there was Jackson's Island, about two mile and a half downstream, heavy-timbered, and standing up out of the middle of the river, big and dark and solid like a steamboat without any lights. There weren't any signs of the bar at the head. It was all under the water now. It didn't take me long to get there. I shot past the head at a ripping rate. The current was so swift, and then I got into the dead water and landed on the side towards the Illinois shore. I run the canoe into a deep dent in the bank that I knowed about. I had to part the willow branches to get in, and when I made fast, nobody could have seen the canoe from the outside. I went up and sat down on a log at the head of the island and looked out on the big river and the black driftwood and away over to the town, three mile away, where there was three or four lights twinkling. A monstrous big lumber raft was about a mile upstream, coming along down, with a lantern in the middle of it. I watched it come creeping down, and when it was most abreast of where I stood, I heard a man say, Stern oar there! Heave her head to starboard! I heard that just as plain as if the man was by my side. There was a little gray in the sky now, so I stepped into the woods and laid down for a nap before breakfast. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter Eight Sleeping in the Woods, Raising the Dead, Exploring the Island, Finding Jim, Jim's Escape, Signs, Balam. The sun was up so high when I waked that I judged it it was after eight o'clock. I'd laid there in the grass and the cool shade thinking about things and feeling rested and rather comfortable and satisfied 
I could see the sun out at one or two holes, but mostly it was big trees all about, and gloomy in there amongst them. There was freckled places on the ground, where light sifted down through the leaves, and the freckled places swamped about a little, showing there was a little breeze up there. A couple of squirrels sat on a limb, and jabbered at me very friendly. I was powerful lazy and comfortable. Didn't want to get up and cook breakfast. Well, I was dozing off again when I thinks I hears a deep sound of boom away up the river. I rouses up and rests on my elbow and listens. Pretty soon I hears it again. I hopped up and went and looked out at a hole in the leaves, and I see a bunch of smoke lying on the water a long ways up, about abreast the ferry. And there was the ferry boat full of people floating along down. I knowed what was the matter now. Boom! I see the white smoke squirting out of the ferry boat side. You see, they was firing cannon over the water, trying to make my carcass come to the top. I was pretty hungry, but I weren't going to do for me to start a fire, because they might see the smoke. So I sat up there and watched the cannon smoke and listened to the boom. The river was a mile wide there and it always looks pretty on a summer morning, so I was having a good enough time seeing them hunt for my remainders, if I only had a bite to eat. Well, then I happened to think how they always put quicksilver in loaves of bread, and float them off, because they always go right to the drowned carcass, and stop there. So, says I, I'll keep a lookout, and if any of them is floating around after me, I'll give them a show. I changed to the Illinois edge of the island to see what look I could have, and I weren't disappointed. A big double loaf came along, and I most got it with a long stick, but my foot slipped and she floated out further. Of course, I was where the current was set in the closest to the shore. I knowed enough for that, but by and by, along comes another one, and this time I won. I took out the plug and shook out the little dab of quicksilver and sit my teeth in it. It was baker's bread. What the quality eat. None of your low-down corn pone. I got a good place amongst the leaves, and sat there on the log, munching the bread and watching the ferry boat, and very well satisfied. And then something struck me. I says, now I reckon the widow or the parson or somebody prayed that this bread would find me, and here it has gone and done it. So there ain't no doubt, but there is something in that thing, that is, there is something in it when a body like the widow or the parson prays. But it don't work for me, and I reckon it don't work for only just the right kind. I lit a pipe, and had a good long smoke, and went on watching. The ferry boat was floating with the current, and I allowed I'd have a chance to see who was aboard when she came along because she would come in close, where the bread did. When she'd got pretty well along down towards me, I put out my pipe and went to where I fished out the bread, and laid down behind a log on the bank, in a little open place. Where the log forked, I could peep through. By and by, she came along, and drifted in so close that they could a run out a plank and walk the shore. Most everybody was on the boat, Pap and the Judge Thatcher, and Bessie Thatcher, and Joe Harper, and Tom Sawyer, and his old Aunt Polly, and Sid and Mary, and plenty more. Everybody was talking about the murder, but the captain broke in and says, Look sharp now, the current sits in the closest here, and maybe he's washed ashore and got tangled amongst the brush at the water's edge. I hope so, anyway. I didn't hope so. They all crowded up and leaned over the rails, nearly in my face, and kept still watching with all their might. I could see them first rate, but they couldn't see me. Then the captain sung out, Stand away! And the cannon let off such a blast right before me that it made me deaf with the noise and pretty near blind with the smoke, and I judged I was gone. If they'd a had some bullets in, I reckon they'd a got the corpse they was after. Well, I see I weren't hurt, thanks to goodness. The boat floated on and went out of sight around the shoulder of the island. I could hear the booming now and then, 
further and further off, and by and by, after an hour, I didn't hear it no more. The island was three miles long. I judged they had got to the foot and was giving it up, but they didn't yet a while. They turned around the foot of the island and started up the channel on the Missouri side under steam and booming once in a while as they went. I crossed over to that side and watched them. When they got abreast the head of the island, they quit shooting and dropped over to the Missouri shore and went home to the town. I knowed I was all right now. Nobody else would come a-hunting after me. I got my traps out, and the canoe made me a nice camp in the thick woods. I made a kind of a tent out of my blankets to put my things under so the rain couldn't get at them. I catched a catfish and haggled him open with my saw, and toward sundown I started my campfire and had supper. Then I set out a line to catch some fish for breakfast. When it was dark, I sat by my campfire smoking and feeling pretty well satisfied. But by and by, it got sort of lonesome, and so I went and sat on the bank and listened to the current swashing along and counted the stars and drifted logs and rafts that came down and then went to bed. There ain't no better way to put in time when you are lonesome. You can't say so. You soon get over it. And so for three days and nights, no difference. Just the same thing. But the next day, I went exploring around down through the island. I was boss of it. It all belonged to me, so to say. And I wanted to know all about it. But mainly, I wanted to put in the time. I found plenty strawberries, ripe and prime, and great summer grapes, and green raspberries, and the green blackberries was just beginning to show. They would all come handy by and by, I judged. Well, I went fooling along in the deep woods till I judged I weren't far from the foot of the island. I had my gun along, but I hadn't shot nothing. It was for protection thought I would kill some game nigh home. About this time, I mighty near stepped on a good-sized snake, and it went sliding off through the grass and flowers, and I after it, trying to get a shot at it. I clipped along, and all of a sudden, I bounded right on to the ashes of a campfire that was still smoking. My heart jumped up amongst my lungs. I never waited for it to look further but uncocked my gun and went sneaking back on my tiptoes as fast as ever I could. Every now and then I stopped a second amongst the thick leaves and listened, but my breath come so hard I couldn't hear nothing else. I slunk along another piece further, then listened again, and so on, and so on. If I see a stump, I took it for a man. If I trod on a stick and broke it, it made me feel like a person had cut one of my breaths in two, and I only got half, and the short half too. When I got to camp, I weren't feeling very brash. There weren't much sand in my craw. But I says, this ain't no time to be fooling around. So I got all my traps into my canoe again, so as to have them out of sight. And I put out the fire and scattered the ashes around to look like an old last year's camp. And then clump up a tree. I reckon I was up in the tree two hours, but I didn't see nothing. I didn't hear nothing. I only thought I heard and seen as much as a thousand things. Well, I couldn't stay up there forever, so at last I got down, but I kept in the thick woods and on the lookout all the time. All I could get to eat was berries and what was left over from breakfast. By the time it was night, I was pretty hungry, so when it was good and dark, I slid out from shore before moonrise and paddled over to the Illinois bank, about a quarter of a mile. I went out in the woods and cooked a supper, and I had about made up my mind I would stay there all night when I hear a plunkety-plunk, plinkety-plunk, and says to myself, Horse is coming. And next I hear people's voices. I got everything into the canoe as quick as I could, and then went creeping through the woods to see what I could find out. I hadn't got far when I hear a man say, 
we better camp here if we can find a good place the horses is about beat out let's look around i didn't wait but shoved out and pedaled away easy i tied up in the old place and reckoned i would sleep in the canoe i didn't sleep much i couldn't somehow for thinking and every time i waked up i thought somebody had me by the neck so the sleep didn't do me no good by and by i says to myself i can't live this way i'm a-goin to find out whose it is that's here on the island with me i'll find it out or bust well i felt better right off so i took my paddle and slid out from shore just a step or two and then let the canoe drop along down amongst the shadows the moon was shining and outside of the shadows it made it most as light as day i poked along well on to an hour everything still as rocks and sound asleep well by this time i was most down to the foot of the island a little ripply cool breeze begun to blow and that was as good as saying the night was about done i give her a turn with the paddle and brung her nose to shore then i got my gun and slipped out and into the edge of the woods i sat down there on a log and looked out through the leaves i see the moon go off watch and the darkness began to blanket the river but in a little while i see the pale streak over the treetops it knowed the day was coming so i took my gun and slipped off toward where i had run across that camp fire stopped every minute or two to listen but i hadn't no luck somehow i couldn't seem to find the place but by and by sure enough i catched a glimpse of fire away through the trees i went for it cautious and slow by and by i was close enough to have a look and there laid a man on the ground it most give me the fantods he had a blanket around his head and his head was nearly in the fire i sat there behind a clump of bushes in about six foot of him and kept my eyes on him steady it was getting gray daylight now pretty soon he gapped and stretched himself and hove off the blanket and it was miss watson's jim i bet i was glad to see him i says hello jim and skipped out he bounced up and stared at me wild then he drops down on his knees and puts his hands together and says don't hurt me don't i hain't ever done no harm to a ghost i always liked dead people and done all i could for em you go and get in the river again why you belongs and don't do nothin to old jim i as all as your friend well i weren't long making him understand i weren't dead i was ever so glad to see jim i weren't so lonesome now i told him i weren't afraid of him telling the people where i was i talked along but he only sat there and looked at me never said nothing then i says it's good daylight let's get breakfast make up your campfire good what's de use for making up to campfire to cook strawberries and sich truck but you got a gun hain't you then we can get something better than strawberries strawberries and such truck i says is that what you live on i couldn't get nothing else he says why how long have you been on the island jim i come here tonight out of use killed what all that time yes indeedy and ain't you had nothing but that kind of rubbish to eat no saw nothing else well you must be most starved ain't you reckon i could eat a hoss i think i could how long you been on the island since the night i got killed no why what has you lived on but you got a gun oh yes you got a gun that's good now you kill something and i'll make up the fire so we went over to where the canoe was and while he butt a fire in a grassy open place amongst the trees i fetched meal and bacon and coffee and coffee pot and frying pan and sugar in the tin cups 
and the nigger was set back considerable because he reckoned it was all done with witchcraft. I catched a good big catfish too, and Jim cleaned him with his knife and fried him. When breakfast was ready, we lolled on the grass and eat it smoking hot. Jim laid it in with all his might, for he was most about starved. Then when we had got pretty well stuffed, we laid off and lazied. By and by, Jim says, But looky here, Huck, who was it that us killed in that shanty if it want you? Then I told him the whole thing, and he said it was smart. He said Tom Sawyer couldn't get up no better plan than what I had. Then I says, how do you come to be here, Jim, and how'd you get here? He looked pretty uneasy, and didn't say nothing for a minute. Then he says, Maybe I better not tell. Why, Jim? Well, there's reasons. But you wouldn't tell on me if I was to tell you, would you, Huck? Blamed if I would, Jim. Well, I believe you, Huck. I run off. Jim! But mind, you said you wouldn't tell. You know you said you wouldn't tell, Huck. Well, I did. I said I wouldn't, and I'll stick to it. Honest injun, I will. People will call me a low-down abolitionist, and despise me for keeping mum. But that didn't make no difference. I ain't a-goin' to tell, and I ain't a-goin' back there anyways. So now, that's no all about it. Well, you see, it, it, it is this way. Old Mrs., that's Miss Watson, she pecks on me all the time and treats me port of rough. But she always said she wouldn't sell me down to Orleans. But I noticed they was a nigger trader round the place considerable lately, and I begin to get uneasy. Well, one night I creeps to the door party late, and the door wa'n't quite shut, and I hear old Mrs. tell the widow she going to sell me down to Orleans. But she didn't want to, but she could get eight hundred dollars for me, and it is such a big stack of money she couldn't resist. The widow, she tried to get her to say she wouldn't do it, but I never waited to hear the rest. I lit out mighty quick, I tell you. I tuck out and shin down the hill, and spec to steal a skit long the shore summers above the town, but there was people stirring yet, so I hid in the old tumble-down copper shop on the bank to wait for everybody to go away. Well, I was dar all night. There was somebody round all the time. Long about six in the morning, skiffs begin to go by, and about eight or nine, every skiff that went along was talking about how your pap come over to the town and say, you's killed. Dessa last skiffs was full of ladies and gentlemen a going over to see the place. Sometimes they'd pull up at the shore and take a rest before they started across. So by the talk, I got to know all about the killing. I was powerful sorry for you killed, Huck. But I ain't no more now. I lay down under the shavings all day. I was hungry, but I wa not scared, because I knowed old missus and the widder was going to start to the camp meeting right out of breakfast and be gone all day, and they knows I go off with the cattle about daylight. So they wouldn't expect to see me round the place, and so they wouldn't miss me till out of dark in the evening. The other servants wouldn't miss me, cause they'd shin out and take holiday soon as the old folks is out in the way. Well, when I come dark, I tuck up the river road and went about two mile or more to why they want no houses. I'd made up my mind about what I was going to do. You see, if I kept on trying to get away afoot, 
the dogs would track me. If I stole a skiff to cross over, they'd miss that skiff, you see, and they'd know about why I'd lane and the other side and why to pick up my track. So I says, a raft is what I order. It don't make no track. I see a light a coming round the point by me by, so I wade in and shove a log ahead of me and swum more than halfway across the river and got in amongst the driftwood and kept my head down low and kinder swum again the current till the raft come along. Then I swum to the stern of it and took a halt. It clouded up, and it's pretty dark for a while, so I clumb up and laid down on the planks. The men is all way yonder in the middle, while the lantern was. The river was a rising, and they was a good current, so I reckoned at by four in the morning, I'd be twenty-five miles down the river, and then I'd slip and just before daylight and swim ashore and take to the woods on the Illinois side. But I didn't have no luck. When we was most down to the head of the island, a man began to come aft with the lantern. I see it want no use for to wait, so I slid overboard and struck out for the island. Well, I had a notion I could lane most anywheres, but I couldn't bank to bluff. I was most to the foot of the island before I found a good place. I went into the woods and judged I wouldn't fool with rafts no more long as they moved the lantern round so. I had my pipe and a plug, a dog leg, and some matches in my cap and they want wet so eyes all right and so you ain't had no meat nor bread to eat all this time why didn't you get mud turtles how you going to get em you couldn't slip up on em and grab em and how's a body going to hit em with a rock how could a body do it in the night and i want going to show myself on the bank in the daytime. Well, that's so. You've had to keep in the woods all the time, of course. Did you hear em shooting the cannon? Oh, yes. I know they was out of you. I see em go by here. Watched em throw the bushes. Some young birds come along, flying a yard or two at a time and lighting. Jim said it was a sign it was going to rain. He said it was a sign when young chickens flew that way, and so he reckoned it was the same way when young birds done it. I was going to catch some of them, but Jim wouldn't let me. He said it was death. He said his father laid mighty sick once, and some of them catched a bird, and his old granny said his father would die, and he did. And Jim said you mustn't count the things you were going to cook for dinner, because that would bring bad luck. The same if you shook the tablecloth after sundown. And he said if a man owned a beehive, and that man died, the bees must be told about it before sunup next morning, or else the bees would all weaken down and quit work and die. Jim said bees wouldn't sting idiots. But I didn't believe that, because I had tried them lots of times myself, and they wouldn't sting me. And I heard about some of these things before, but not all of them. Jim knowed all kinds of signs. He said he knowed most everything. I said it looked to me like all the signs was about bad luck. And so I asked him if there weren't any good luck signs. He says, Mighty few, and they ain't no use to a body. What you want to know when good luck's a coming for? Want to keep it off? And he said, If you got hairy arms and a hairy breast, it's a sign that you's a going to be rich. Well, there's some use in a sign like that, case it's so fur ahead. You see, maybe you's got to be poor a long time fust, 
and so you might get discouraged and kill yourself. You didn't know by the sign that you going to be rich by me by. Have you got hairy arms and a hairy breast, Jim? What's the use to ask that question? Don't you see I has? Well, are you rich? No, but I've been rich once, and going to be rich again. Once I had fourteen dollars, but I took to speculating and got busted out. What did you speculate in, Jim? Well, first I tackled stock. What kind of stock? Why, livestock, cattle, you know. I put ten dollars in a cow. But I ain't going to risk no more money in stock. The cow up and died on my hands. So you lost ten dollars? No, I didn't lose it all. I only lost about nine of it. I sold the hide and tile for a dollar and ten cents. You had five dollars and ten cents left. Did you speculate any more? Yes. You know that one-legged nigger that belongs to the old master Bradish? Well, he sought up a bank and say anybody that put in a dollar would get four dollars more at the end of the year. Well, all the niggers went in, but they didn't have much. I was the only one that had much. So I stuck out for more than four dollars, and I said, if I didn't get it, I'd start a bank myself. Well, of course, that nigger want to keep me out of the business, because he says they want business enough for two banks. So he say I could put in my five dollars, and he pay me thirty-five dollars at the end of the year. So I done it. Then I reckoned I'd invest the thirty-five dollars right off and keep things a moving. There was a nigger named Bob that had catched a wood flat, and his master didn't know it, and I bought it off in him and told him to take the thirty-five dollars when the end of year come, but somebody stole the wood flat that night, and next day the one-legged nigger say he the banks busted, so they didn't none of us get no money. What did you do with the ten cents, Jim? Well, I was going to spend it, but I had a dream, and the dream told me to give it to a nigger named Balaam. Balaam's ass, they call him for short. He's one of them chuckleheads, you know. But he's lucky, they say, and I, I, I see I want lucky. The dream say let Balaam invest the ten cents, and he'd make a raise for me. Well, Balaam, he took the money, and when he was in church, he heard the preacher say that whoever give to the poor lend to the Lord, and bound to get his money back a hundred times. So Balaam, he took and give the ten cents to the poor, and laid low to see what was going to come of it. Well, what did come of it, Jim? Nothing never come of it. I couldn't manage to collect that money. No way. And Balaam, he couldn't. I ain't going to lend no more money. Doubt I see the security. Bound to get your money back a hundred times, the preacher say. If I could get in ten cents back, I'd call it square and be glad of the chance. Well, it's all right anyway, Jim, as long as you're going to be rich again some time or other. Yes, and I's rich now, come to look at it. I owns myself, and I's worth eight hundred dollars. I wished I had the money. I wouldn't want no more. End of chapter 8、Chapter、Nine、of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 9 The Cave. The Floating House. 
I wanted to go and look at a place right about the middle of the island that I had found when I was exploring. So we started and soon got to it, because the island was only three miles long and a quarter of a mile wide. This place was a tolerable long, steep hill or ridge about forty foot high. We had a rough time getting to the top. The sides were so steep and the bushes so thick. We tramped and clubbed around all over it, and by and by found a good big cavern in a rock, most up to the top, on the side towards Illinois. The cavern was as big as two or three rooms bunched together, and Jim could stand up straight in it. It was cool in there. Jim was for putting our traps in there right away, but I said we didn't want to be climbing up and down there all the time. Jim said if we had the canoe hid in a good place and had all the traps in the cavern, we could rush there if anybody was to come to the island, and they would never find us without dogs. And besides, he said them little birds had said it was going to rain, and did I want the things to get wet? So we went back and got the canoe, and paddled up abreast the cavern, and lugged all the traps up there. Then we hunted to a place close by, to hide the canoe in, amongst the thick willows. We took some fish off of the lines, and set them again, and begun to get ready for dinner. The door of the cavern was big enough to roll a hog's head in, and on one side of the door the floor stuck out a little bit, and was flat and a good place to build a fire on, so we built it there and cooked dinner. We spread the blankets inside for a carpet, and ate our dinner in there. We put all the other things handy at the back of the cavern. Pretty soon it darkened up and begun to thunder and lightning, so the birds was right about it. Directly it began to rain, and it rained like gall fury, too, and I never see the wind blow so. It was one of those regular summer storms. It would get so dark that it looked all blue-black outside and lovely, and the rain would thrash along by so thick that the trees off a little ways looked dim and spider-webby. And here would come a blast of wind that would bend the trees down and turn up the pale underside of the leaves, and then a perfect ripper of a gust would follow along and set the branches to toss in their arms as if they was just wild, and next, when it was just about the bluest and blackest, psst, it was as bright as glory and you'd have a little glimpse of tree-tops and a plunging about away off yonder in the storm, hundreds of yards further than you could see before, dark as sin, against in a second, and now you'd hear the thunder let go with an awful crash, and then go rumbling, grumbling, tumbling, down the sky towards the underside of the world, like rolling empty barrels downstairs, where it's long stairs, and they bounce a good deal, you know. Jim, this is nice. I says, I wouldn't want to be nowhere else but here. Pass me along another hunk of fish and some hot cornbread. Well, you wouldn't have been here if it hadn't have been for Jim. You'd have been down dar in the woods, without any dinner, and getting most drowned too. That you would, honey. Chickens knows when it's going to rain, and so do the birds, child. The river went on rising and rising for ten or twelve days, till at last it was over the banks. The water was three or four feet deep on the island, in the low places, and on the Illinois bottom. On that side it was a good many miles wide, but on the Missouri side it was the same old distance across, a half a mile, because the Missouri shore was just a wall of high bluffs, Daytimes we paddled all over the island in the canoe. It was mighty cool and shady in the deep woods, even if the sun was blazing outside. We went winding in and out amongst the trees, and sometimes the vines hung so thick we had to back away and go some other way. Well, on every old broken-down tree you could see rabbits and snakes and such things. And when the island had been overflowed a day or two, they got so tame on account of being hungry, that you could paddle right up and put your hand on them if you wanted to. But not the snakes and turtles. They would slide off in the water. The ridge of our cavern was in was full of them. We could have had pets enough if we wanted them. One night, 
we catched a little section of a lumber raft. Nice pine planks. It was twelve foot wide and about fifteen or sixteen feet long. In the top stood above the water six or seven inches, a solid level floor. We could see saw logs go by in the daylight sometimes, but we let them go. We didn't show ourselves in daylight. Another night, when we was up at the head of the island, just before daylight, here comes a frame house down on the west side. She was a two-story and a tilted over considerable. We paddled out and got aboard, clomb in at the upstairs window, but it was too dark to see yet, so we made the canoe fast and set in her to wait for daylight. The light begun to come before we got to the foot of the island. Then we looked in at the window. We could make out a bed and a table and two old chairs and lots of things around about on the floor. There was clothes hanging against the wall. There was something lying on the floor in the far corner that looked like a man, so Jim says. Hello, you. But it didn't budge. So I hollered again, and then Jim says. The man ain't asleep. He's dead. You hold still, I'll go and see. He went, and bent down and looked, and says. It's a dead man. Yes, indeed he naked too. He's been shot in the back. I reckon he's been dead two or three days. Come in, Huck, but don't look at his face. It's too ghastly. I didn't look at him at all. Jim throwed some old rags over him, but he needn't done it. I didn't want to see him. There was heaps of old greasy cards scattered around over the floor, and old whiskey bottles, and a couple of masks made out of black cloth, and all over the walls was the ignorantest kind of words and pictures made with charcoal. There was two old dirty calico dresses, and a sun bonnet, and some women's underclothes hanging against the wall, and some men's clothing too. We put the lot into the canoe. It might come good. There was a boy's old speckled straw hat on the floor. I took that too. And there was a bottle that had had milk in it, and it had a rag stopper for a baby to suck. We would a took the bottle, but it was broke. There was a seedy old chest, and an old hair trunk with the hinges broke. They stood open, but there weren't nothing left in them that was any account. The way things was scattered about, we reckoned the people's left in a hurry, and weren't fixed so as to carry off most of their stuff. We got an old tin lantern and a butcher knife without any handle, and a brand new barlow knife, worth two bits in any store, and a lot of tallow candles, and a tin candlestick, and a gourd, and a tin cup, and a ratty old bed quilt off the bed, and a reticule with needles and pins, and beeswax and buntings and thread, and all such truck in it, and a hatchet and some nails, and a fish line, as thick as my little finger, with some monstrous hooks on it, and a roll of buckskin and a leather dog collar, and a horseshoe, and some vitals of medicine that didn't have no label on them. And just as we was leaving, I found a tolerable good curry comb, and Jim, he found a ratty old fiddle bow, and a wooden leg. The straps was broke off of it, but bearing that, it was a good enough leg, though it was too long for me, and not long enough for Jim, and we couldn't find the other one, though we hunted all around. And so, take it all around we made a good haul then we was ready to shove off as we was a quarter of a mile below the island and it was pretty broad day so i made jim lay down in the canoe and cover up with the quilt because if he sat up people would tell he was a nigger a good ways off i paddled over to the illinois shore and drifted down most a half a mile doing it i crept up the dead water under the bank and hadn't no accidents and didn't see nobody. We got home all safe. End of chapter 9
Old Hank Bunker, in disguise. After breakfast, I wanted to talk about the dead man and guess out how he could be killed, but Jim didn't want to. He said it would fetch bad luck, and besides, he said, he might come and haunt us. He said a man that weren't buried was more likely to go a-haunting around than one that was planted and comfortable. That sounded pretty reasonable, so I didn't say no more. But I couldn't keep from studying over it and wishing I knowed who shot the man and what they done it for. We rummaged the clothes we got and found eight dollars in silver sewed up in the lining of an old blanket overcoat. Jim said he reckoned the people in that house stole the coat, because if they'd a known the money was there, they wouldn't a left it. I said, I reckon they killed him too, but Jim didn't want to talk about that. I says, now you think it's bad luck, but what did you say when I fetched in the snake skin that I found at the top of the ridge day before yesterday? You said it was worse bad luck in the world to touch a snake skin with my hands. Well, here's your bad luck. We've raked in all this truck, and eight dollars besides. I wish we could have some bad luck like this every day, Jim. Never you mind, honey. Never you mind. Don't you get too pert. It's a coming. Mind I tell you, it's a coming. It did come, too. It was a Tuesday that we had that talk. Well, after dinner Friday, we was lying around in the grass at the upper end of the ridge and got out of tobacco. I went to the cavern to get some and found a rattlesnake in there. I killed him and curled him up on the foot of Jim's blanket ever so natural, thinking there'd be some fun when Jim found him there. Well, by night, I forgot all about the snake and when Jim flung himself down on the blanket, while I struck a light, the snake's mate was there, and bit him. He jumped up yelling, and the first thing the light showed was the vermin curled up and ready for another spring. I laid him out in a second with a stick, and Jim grabbed Pap's whiskey jug and begun to pour it down. He was barefooted, and the snake bit him right on the heel. That all comes of my being such a fool as not to remember that wherever you leave a dead snake, its mate always comes there and curls around it. Jim told me to chop off the snake's head and throw it away, and then skin the body and roast a piece of it. I'd done it, and he ate it and said it would help cure him. He made me take off the rattles and tie them around his wrist, too. He said that that would help. Then I slid out quiet and throwed the snakes clear away amongst the bushes, for I weren't going to let Jim find out it was all my fault, not if I could help it. Jim sucked and sucked at the jug, and now and then he got out his head and pitched around and yelled, but every time he come to himself he went a-sucking at the jug again. His foot swelled up pretty big, and so did his leg, but by and by the drunk began to come, and so I judged he was all right, but I'd rather been bit with a snake than pap's whiskey jim was laid up for four days and nights then the swelling was all gone and he was around again i made up my mind i wouldn't ever take a holt of a snake skin again with my hands now that i see what had come of it jim said he reckoned i would believe him next time and he said that handling a snake skin was such awful bad luck that maybe we hadn't got to the end of it yet. He said he'd rather see the new moon over his left shoulder as much as a thousand times than take up a snakeskin in his hand. Well, I was getting to feel that way myself, though I've always reckoned that looking at the new moon over your left shoulder is one of the carelessest and foolishest things a body can do. Old Hank Bunker done it once and bragged about it, and in less than two years he got drunk and fell off of the shot tower and spread himself out so that he was just a kind of layer, as you may say. And they slid him edgeways between two barn doors for a coffin and buried him so, so they say, but I didn't see it. Pap told me. But anyway, it all come of looking at the moon that way, like a fool. Well, 
the days went along and the river went down between its banks again and about the first thing we done was to bait one of the big hooks with a skinned rabbit and set it and catch a catfish that was as big as a man six foot two inches long and weighed over two hundred pounds we couldn't handle him of course he would flung us into illinois we just sat there and watched him rip and tear around till he drowned we found a brass button in his stomach and a round ball and lots of rubbish we split the ball open with the hatchet and there was a spool in it jim said he had it there a long time to coat it over so and make a ball of it it was as big as a fish and was ever catched in the mississippi i reckon jim said he hadn't even seen a bigger one he would have been worth a good deal over at the village they piddled out such a fish as that by the pound in the market house there everybody buys some of him his meat's as white as snow and makes a good fry next morning i said it was getting slow and dull and i wanted to get a stirring up some way i said i reckoned i would slip over the river and find out what was going on jim liked that notion but he said i must go in the dark and look sharp then he studied it over and said couldn't i put on some of them old things and dress up like a girl that was a good notion too so we shortened up one of the calico gowns and i turned up my trouser legs to my knees and got into it jim hitched it behind with the hooks and it was a fair fit i put on the sunbonnet and tied it under my chin and then for a body to look in and see my face was like looking down a joint of stovepipe jim said nobody would know me even in the daytime hardly i practiced around all day to get the hang of the things and by and by i could do pretty well in them only jim said i didn't walk like a girl and he said i must quit pulling up my gown to get at my breeches pocket i took notice and done better i started up the illinois shore in the canoe just after dark i started across to the town from a little below the ferry landing and the drift of the current fetched me in at the bottom of the town i tied up and started along the bank there was a light burning in a little shanty that hadn't been lived in for a very long time and i wondered who had took up quarters there i slept up and peeped in at the window there was a woman about forty year old in there knitting by a candle that was on a pine table i didn't know her face she was a stranger for you couldn't start a face in that town that i didn't know now this was lucky because i was weakening i was getting afraid i had come people might know my voice and find me out but if this woman had been in such a little town two days she could tell me all they wanted to know so i knocked at the door and made up my mind i wouldn't forget i was a girl End of chapter 10of the adventures of huckleberry finn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the adventures of huckleberry finn by mark twain chapter eleven huck and the woman the search prevarication going to goshen come in says the woman and i did she says take a chair i done it she looked me all over with her little shiny eyes and says what might your name be sarah williams whereabouts do you live in this neighborhood no mum in hookervale seven mile below i've walked all the way and i'm all tired out hungry too i reckon i'll find you something no mum i ain't hungry i was so hungry i had to stop two miles below here's at a farm so i ain't hungry no more it's what makes me so late my mother's down sick and out of money and everything and i come to tell my uncle abner moore he lives at the upper end of the town she says i ain't ever been here before do you know him 
"'No, but I don't know everybody yet. "'I haven't lived here quite two weeks. "'It's a considerable ways to the upper end of town. "'You better stay here all night. "'Take off your bonnet.' "'No,' I says. "'I'll rest a while, I reckon, and go on. "'I ain't afeard of the dark.' "'She said she wouldn't let me go by myself, "'but her husband would be in by and by, "'maybe in an hour and a half, "'and she'd send him along with me. "'Then she got to talking about her husband.' and about her relations up the river, and her relations down the river, and about how much better off they used to was, and how they didn't know, but they'd made a mistake coming to our town, instead of letting well alone, and so on and so on, till I was afeard I had made a mistake coming to her, to find out what was going on in the town, but by and by she dropped on to Pap, and the murder, and then I was pretty willing to let her clatter right along, she told about me and Tom Sawyer finding the six thousand dollars, only she got it ten, and all about Pap, and what a hard lot he was, and what a hard lot I was, and at last she got down to where I was murdered, I says. Who done it? We've heard considerable about these goings on down in the Hookerville, but we don't know who twas that killed Huck Finn. Well, I reckon there's a right smart chance of people here that'd like to know who killed him. Something old Finn did in himself. No, is that so? Most everybody thought it at first. He'll never know how nigh he come to getting lynched. But before night they changed around and judged it was done by a runaway nigger named Jim. Why, he... I stopped. I reckoned I'd better keep still. She run on, and never noticed I had put in at all. The nigger run off the very night Huck Finn was killed. So there's a reward out for him, three hundred dollars. And there's a reward out for old Finn, too, two hundred dollars. You see, he come to town the morning after the murder and told about it, and was out with him on the ferryboat hunt, and right away after he up and left. Before night they wanted to lynch him, but he was gone, you see. Well, next day they found out the nigger was gone. They found out he hadn't been since ten o'clock, the night the murder was done. So then they put it on him, you see, and while they was full of it, next day back comes old Finn, and went boo-hooing to Judge Thatch to get money to hunt for the nigger all over Illinois with. The judge gave him some, and that evening they got drunk, and was around till after midnight with a couple of mighty hard-looking strangers, and then went off with them. Well, he ain't come back since, and they ain't looking for him back till this thing blows over a little, for people thinks now that he killed his boy and fixed things so folks would think robbers done it, and then he'd get Huck's money without having to bother a long time with a lawsuit. People do say he weren't any too good to do it. Oh, he's sly, I reckon. If he don't come back for a year, he'll be all right. You can't prove anything on him, you know. Everything will be quieted down then, and he'll walk in Huck's money as easy as nothing. Yes, I reckon so. I don't see nothing in the way of it. Has everybody quit thinking the nigger done it? Oh, no, not everybody. A good many thinks he done it. But they'll get the nigger pretty soon now, and maybe they can scare it out of him. Why? Are they after him yet? Well, you're innocent, ain't you? It's three hundred dollars lay around every day for people to pick up. Some folks think the nigger ain't far from here. I'm one of them, but I ain't talked it around. A few days ago I was talking with an old couple that lives next door in the log shanty, and they happen to say hardly anybody never goes to that island over yonder they call Jackson's Island. Don't anybody live there, says I? No, nobody, says they. I didn't say any more, but I'd done some thinking. I was pretty near certain I'd seen smoke over there, about the head of the island, a day or two before that. So I says to myself, like it's not that nigger's hiding over there. Anyway, says I, it's worth the trouble to give the place a hunt. I ain't seen any smoke since, so I reckon maybe he's gone, if it was him, but husband's going over to see, him and another man. He was gone up the river, but he got back today, and I told him as soon as he got here two hours ago. I had got so uneasy I couldn't sit still. I had to do something with my hands, so I took up a needle off of the table and went to threading it. My hands shook, and I was making a bad job of it. When the woman stopped talking, I looked up, and she was looking at me pretty curious and smiling a little. I put down the needle and thread and let on to be interested. And I was, too, I says. Three hundred dollars is a power of money. I wish my mother could get it. Is your husband going over there tonight? Oh, yes. He went up town with the man I was telling you of to get a boat and see if they could borrow another gun. They'll go over after midnight. Couldn't they see better if they was to wait till daytime? 
"'Yes, and couldn't the nigger see better, too? After midnight he'll likely be asleep, and they can slip around through the woods and hunt up his campfire, all the better for the dark if he's got one.' "'I didn't think of that. The woman kept looking at me pretty curious, and I didn't feel a bit comfortable. Pretty soon she says, "'What'd you say your name was, honey?' M M "'Mary Williams?' Somehow, it didn't seem to me that I said it was Mary before, so I didn't look up. Seemed to me I said it was Sarah, so I felt sort of concerned, and was afeard maybe I was looking it too. I wished the woman would say something more. The longer she sat still, the uneasier I was. But now, she says, Honey, I thought you said it was Sarah when you first came in. Oh, yes, am I did. Sarah? mary williams sarah's my first name some calls me sarah some calls me mary oh well, that's the way of it yes m i was feeling better then but i wished i was out of there anyway i couldn't look up yet well the woman fell to talking about how hard times was and how poor they had to live and how the rats was as free as if they owned the place and so forth and so on and then i got easy again she was right about the rats. You'd see one stick his nose out of a hole in the corner every little while. She said she had to have things handy to throw at them when she was alone, or they wouldn't give her no peace. She showed me a bar of lead twisted up into a knot, and said she was a good shot with it generally. But she'd wrenched her arm a day or two ago, and didn't know whether she could throw true now but she watched for a chance, and directly banged away at the rat. But she missed him wide, and said, Ouch! It hurt her arm so. Then she told me to try for the next one. I wanted to be getting away before the old man got back, but of course I didn't let on. I got the thing, and the first rat that showed his nose I let drive, and if he'd a stayed where he was, He'd a been a tolerable sick rat. She said that was first rate, and she reckoned I would have the next one. She went and got the lump of lead and fetched it back, and brought along a hank of yarn which she wanted me to help her with. I held up my two hands, and she put the hank over them, and went on talking about her and her husband's matters. But she broke off to say, Keep your eye on the rat. You better have the lead in your lap handy. So she dropped the lump into my lap, just at that moment, and I clapped my legs together on it, and she went on talking, but only about a minute. Then she took off the hank and looked at me straight in the face, and very pleasant, and says, Come now, what's your real name? What, what, mum? What's your real name? Is it Bill or Tom or Bob, or what is it? I reckon I shook like a leaf, and I didn't know hardly what to do, but I says, Please don't poke fun at poor little girl like me, mum. If I'm in the way here, I'll... No, you won't. Sit down and stay where you are. I ain't going to hurt you, and I ain't going to tell any other. You just tell me your secret, and trust me. I'll keep it, and what's more, I'll help you. Sold my old man if you want him to. You see, you're a runaway apprentice, that's all. It ain't anything. There ain't no harm in it. You've been treated bad, and you made up your mind to cut. Bless you, child. I wouldn't tell on you. Tell me all about it now, that's good boy. So I said... It wouldn't be no use to try to play it any longer, and I would just make a clean breast and tell her everything, but she mustn't go back on her promise. Then I told her my father and mother was dead, and the law had bound me out to a main old farmer in the country, thirty mile back from the river, and he treated me so bad I couldn't stand it no longer. He went away to be gone a couple of days, and so I took my chance and stole some of his daughter's old clothes and cleared out. And I had been three nights coming the thirty miles. I traveled nights, and hid daytimes and slept, and the bag of bread and meat I carried from home lasted me all the way, and I had a plenty. I said I believed my Uncle Abner Moore would take care of me. So that was why I struck out for this town of Goshen. Goshen, child? This ain't Goshen. This is St. Petersburg. Goshen's ten mile further up the river. Who told you this was Goshen? Why, a man I met at daybreak this morning 
just as I was going to turn into the woods for my regular sleep. He told me when the roads forked I must take the right road, and five mile would fetch me to Goshen. He was drunk, I reckon. He told you just exactly wrong. Well, he did act like he was drunk, but it ain't no matter now. I got to be moving along. I'll fetch Goshen before daylight. Hold on a minute. I'll put you up a snack to eat. You might want it. So she put me up a snack and says, Say, when a cow's laying down, which end of her gets up first? Answer up prompt now. Don't stop to study over it. Which end gets up first? The hind end, mum. Well, then, a horse. The forward end, mum. Which side of a tree does the moss grow on? The north side. If fifteen cows is browsing on a hillside, how many of them eats with their heads pointed the same direction? The whole fifteen, mum. Well, I reckon you have lived in the country. I thought maybe you was just trying to hocus me again. What's your real name now? George Peters, mum. Well, try to remember it, George. Don't forget and tell me it's Alexander before you go, and then get out by saying it's George Alexander when I catch you. And don't go about women in that old calico. You do a girl tolerable poor, but you might fool men, maybe. Bless you, child, when you set out to thread a needle, don't hold the thread still and fetch the needle up to it. Hold the needle still and poke the thread at it. That's the way a woman most always does, but a man always does it the other way. And when you throw at a rat or anything, hitch yourself up a tiptoe and fetch your hand up over your head as awkward as you can, and miss your rat about six or seven foot. Throw stiff-armed from the shoulder, like there was a pivot there for it to turn on, like a girl, not from the wrist and elbow, with your arm out to one side, like a boy. And mind you, when a girl tries to catch anything in her lap, she throws her knees apart. She don't clap them together, the way you did when you catched the lump of lead. Why, I spotted you for a boy when you was threading the needle, and I contrived the other things just to make certain. Now trot along to your uncle, Sarah Mary Williams George Alexander Peters, and if you get into trouble, you send word to Mrs. Judith Loftus, which is me, and I'll do what I can to get you out of it. Keep the river road all the way, and next time you tramp take shoes and socks with you. The river road's a rocky one, and your feet'll be in a condition when you get to Goshen, I reckon. I went up the bank about fifty yards, and then I doubled on my track and slipped back to where my canoe was, a good piece below the house. I jumped in and was off in a hurry. I went upstream far enough to make the head of the island, and then started across. I took off the sunbonnet, for I didn't want no blinders on then. When I was about the middle, I heard the clock begin to strike, so I stops and listens. The sound come faint over the water, but clear eleven. When I struck the head of the island, I never waited to blow, though I was most winded. But I shoved right into the timber where my old camp used to be, and started a good fire there on a high and dry spot. Then I jumped in the canoe and dug out for our place a mile and a half below, as hard as I could go. I landed and sloped through the timber and up the ridge and into the cavern. There Jim laid, sound asleep on the ground. I roused him out and says, Get up and hump yourself, Jim. There ain't a minute to lose. They're after us. Jim never asked no questions. He never said a word. But the way he worked for the next half an hour showed about how he was scared. By that time, everything we had in the world was on our raft. And she was ready to be shoved out from the willow cove where she was hid. We put out the campfire at the cavern the first thing. I didn't show a candle outside after that. I took the canoe out from the shore a little piece and took a look, but if there was a boat around, I couldn't see it, for stars and shadows ain't good to see by. Then we got out the raft and slipped along down in the shade, past the foot of the island dead still, never saying a word. End of chapter 11《ハクルベリー・フェン》です。これは、ハクルベリー・フェン。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 12 Slow Navigation Borrowing Things Boarding the Wreck The Plotters Hunting for the Boat it must have been close on to one o'clock 
when we got below the island at last, and the raft did seem to go mighty slow. If a boat was to come along, we was going to take to the canoe and break for the Illinois shore, and it was well a boat didn't come, for we hadn't ever thought to put the gun in the canoe, or a fishing line, or anything to eat. We was in rather too much of a sweat to think of so many things. It weren't good judgment to put everything on the raft. If the men went to the island, I'd just expect they found the campfire I built, and watched it all night for Jim to come. Anyways, they stayed away from us, and if my building the fire never fooled them, it weren't no fault of mine. I played it as low down on them as I could. When the first streak of day began to show, we tied up to a towhead in a big bend on the Illinois side, and tacked off cottonwood branches with the hatchet, and covered up the raft with them, so she looked like there had been a cave-in in the bank there. A towhead is a sandbar that has cottonwoods on it as thick as harrow teeth. We had mountains on the Missouri shore and heavy timber on the Illinois side, and the channel was down the Missouri shore at the place, so we weren't afraid of anybody running across us. We laid there all day and watched the rafts and the steamboats spin down the Missouri shore and upbound steamboats fight the big river in the middle. I told Jim all about the time I had jabbered with that woman, and Jim said she was a smart one. And if she was to start after us herself, she wouldn't sit down and watch a campfire. No, sir. She'd fetch a dog. Well, then, I said, why couldn't she tell her husband to fetch a dog? Jim said he bet she did think of it by the time the man was ready to start, and he believed they must have gone up town to get a dog, and so they lost all that time or else we wouldn't be here on a towhead, sixteen or seventeen mile below the village. No, indeedy, we would be in the same old town again. So I said, I didn't care what was the reason. They didn't get us as long as they didn't. When it was beginning to come on dark, we poked our heads out of the cottonwood thicket, and looked up and down and across, nothing in sight. So Jim took up some of the top planks of the raft and built a snug wigwam to get under in blazing weather and rainy, and to keep the things dry. Jim made a floor for the wigwam and raised it a foot or more above the level of the raft, so now the blankets and all the traps was out of reach of the steamboat waves. Right in the middle of the wigwam we made a layer of dirt about five or six inches deep, with a frame around it for to hold it to its place. This was to build a fire on in sloppy weather or chilly. The wigwam would keep it from being seen. We made an extra steering oar, too, because one of the others might get broke on a snag or something. We fixed up a short forked stick to hang the old lantern on, because we must always light the lantern whenever we see a steamboat coming downstream, to keep from getting run over and we wouldn't have to light it for upstream boats, unless we see we was in what they call a crossing, for the river was pretty high yet. Very low banks being still a little under water, so upbound boats didn't always run the channel, but hunted easy water. The second night we run between seven and eight hours, with a current that was making over four mile an hour. We catched fish, and talked, and we took a swim now and then to keep off sleepiness. It was kind of solemn, drifting down the big still river, laying on our backs, looking up at the stars, and we didn't ever feel like talking loud, and it weren't often that we laughed, only a little kind of low chuckle. We had mighty good weather, as a general thing, and nothing ever happened to us at all, that night or the next nor the next. Every night we passed towns, some of them away up on black hillsides, nothing but just a shiny bed of lights, not a house could you see. The fifth night we passed St. Louis, and it was like the whole world lit up. In St. Petersburg, they used to say there was twenty or thirty thousand people in St. Louis. 
but I never believed it till I see that wonderful spread of lights at two o'clock that still night. There weren't a sound there. Everybody was asleep. Every night now I used to slip ashore towards ten o'clock at some little village and buy ten or fifteen cents worth of meal or bacon or other stuff to eat. And sometimes I lifted a chicken that weren't roosting comfortable and took him along. Pop always says, take a chicken when you get a chance, because if you didn't want him yourself, you can easy find somebody that does, and a good deed ain't ever forgot. I never see Pap when he didn't want the chicken himself, but that is what he used to say anyway. Mornings before daylight, I slipped into cornfields and borrowed a watermelon, or a mushmelon, or a pumpkin, or some new corn, or things of that kind. Pap always said it weren't no harm to borrow things if you was meanin' to pay them back some time. But the widow said I weren't anything but a soft name for stealin', and no decent body would do it. Jim said he reckoned the widow was partly right, and Pap was partly right, so the best way would be for us to pick out two or three things from the list and say we wouldn't borrow them any more. Then he reckoned it wouldn't be no harm to borrow the others. So we talked it over all one night, drifting along down the river, trying to make up our minds whether to drop the watermelons, or the cantaloupes, or the mushmelons, or what. But towards daylight we got it all settled satisfactory, and concluded to drop crab apples and persimmons. We weren't feeling just right before that, but it was all comfortable now. I was glad the way it come out, too, because crab apples ain't ever good and the persimmons wouldn't be ripe for two or three months yet. We shot a waterfowl now and then that got up too early in the morning or didn't go to bed early enough in the evening. Take it all round. We lived pretty high. The fifth night below St. Louis, we had a big storm after midnight with a power of thunder and lightning, and the rain poured down in a solid sheet. We stayed in the wigwam and let the raft take care of itself. When the lightning glared out, we could see a big straight river ahead, and high, rocky bluffs on both sides. By and by, says I, hello, Jim, looky yonder. It was a steamboat that had killed herself on a rock. We was drifting straight down for her. The lightning showed her very distinct. She was leaning over with part of her upper deck above water, and you could see every little chimbley guy clean and clear, and a chair by the big bell, with an old slouch hat hanging on the back of it, when the flash has come. Well, it being away in the night and stormy, and all too mysterious like, I felt just the way any other boy would. I felt, when I see that wreck lying there so mournful and lonesome in the middle of the river, I wanted to get aboard of her, and slink around a little, and see what there was. So I says, Let's land on her, Jim. But Jim was dead against it at first. He says, I don't want to go foolin' long or no wreck. We's doin' blame well, and we better let blame well alone, as the good book says. Like as not days a watchman on dat wreck. Watchman your grandmother, I says. There ain't nothing to watch but the texas and the pilot house and do you reckon anybody's going to risk his life for a texas and a pilot house such a night as this when it's likely to break up and wash off down the river any minute jim couldn't say nothing to that so we didn't try and besides i says we might borrow something worth having out of the captain's stateroom seegers i bet you and cost five cents apiece, solid cash. Steamboat captains is always rich, and get sixty dollars a month, and they don't care a cent what a thing costs, you know, long as they want it. Stick a candle in your pocket. I can't rest, Jim, till we give her a rummaging. Do you reckon Tom Sawyer would ever go by this thing? Not for pie, he wouldn't. He'd call it an adventure. That's what he'd call it. 
and he'd land on that wreck if it was his last act and wouldn't he throw style into it wouldn't he spread himself nor nothing why you'd think it was christopher columbus discovering kingdom come i wish tom sawyer was here jim grumbled a little but give in he said we mustn't talk any more than we could help and then talk mighty low the lightning showed us the wreck again just in time and we fetched the starboard derrick and made fast there the deck was high out here we went sneaking down the slopes of it to labboard in the dark towards the texas feeling our way slow with our feet and spreading our hands out to fend off the guys for it was so dark we couldn't see no sign of them pretty soon we struck the forward end of the skylight and clumb on to it and the next step fetched us in front of the captain's door which was open and by jiminy away down through the texas hall we see a light and all in the same second we seemed to hear low voices in yonder jim whispered and said he was feeling powerful sick and told me to come along i says all right and was going to start for the raft but just then i heard a voice wail out and say oh please don't boys i swear i won't ever tell another voice said pretty loud it's a lie jim turner you've acted this way before you always want more than your share of the truck and you've always got it too because you swore it if you didn't you'd tell but this time you said it just one time too many you're the meanest treacherous hound in this country by this time jim was gone for the raft i was just a billin with curiosity and i says to myself tom sawyer wouldn't back out now and so i won't either i'm a-goin to see what's goin on here so i dropped on my hands and knees in the little passage and crept aft in the dark till there weren't but one stateroom betwixt me and the cross hall of the texas then in there i see a man stretched on the floor and tied hand and foot and two men standing over him and one of them had a dim lantern in his hand and the other one had a pistol this one kept pointing the pistol at the man's head on the floor and saying i'd like to and i ought to too a mean skunk the man on the floor would shrivel up and say oh please don't bill i ain't ever gonna tell and every time he said that the man with the lantern would laugh and say deed you ain't you never said no truer thing than that you bet you and once he said hear him beg and yet if we hadn't got the best of him and tied him he'd a killed us both and what for just for nothing just cause we stood on our rights that's what for but i lay you ain't a goin to threaten nobody any more jim turner put up that pistol bill bill says i don't want to jake packard i'm for killing him and didn't he kill old hatfield just the same way and don't he deserve it but i don't want him killed and i've got my reasons for it bless your heart for them words jake packard i'll never forget you as long as i live says the man on the floor sort of blubbering packard didn't take no notice of that but hung up his lantern on a nail and started towards where i was there in the dark and motion bill to come i crawled fished as fast as i could about two yards but the boat slanted so that i couldn't make very good time so to keep from getting run over and catched i crawled into a stateroom on the upper side the man came appalling along in the dark and when packard got to my stateroom he says here come in here and in he come and bill after him but before they got in i was up in the upper berth cornered and sorry i come then they stood there with their hands on the ledge of the berth and talked i couldn't see them but i could tell where they was by the whiskey they'd been having i was glad i didn't drink whiskey 
but it wouldn't make much difference anyway because most of the time they couldn't a treed me because i didn't breathe i was too scared and besides a body couldn't breathe and hear much talk they talked low and earnest bill wanted to kill turner he says he said he'll tell and he will if we was to give him both our shares to him now it wouldn't make no difference after the row and the way we've served him sure as you're born he'll turn state's evidence now you hear me i'm for putting him out of his troubles so am i says packard very quiet blame it i sort of begun to think you wasn't well then that's all right let's go and do it hold on a minute i ain't had my say yet you listen to me shootin's good but there's quieter ways if the thing's got to be done but i says this it ain't good sense to go courtin round after a halter if you can get at what you're up to in some way that's just as good and at the same time don't bring you into no risks ain't that so you bet it is but how you gonna manage it this time well my idea is this we'll rustle around and gather up whatever pickings we've overlooked in the staterooms and shove for shore and hide the truck then we'll wait now i say it ain't a going to be more than two hours before this wreck breaks up and washes off down the river see he'll be drowned and won't have nobody to blame for it but his own self i reckon that's a considerable sight better than killing of him i'm unfavorable to killing a man as long as you can get around it it ain't good sense it ain't good morals ain't i right yes i reckon you are but suppose she don't break up and wash off well we can wait the two hours anyway and see can't we all right then come along so they started and i lit out all in a cold sweat and scrambled forward it was dark as pitch there but i said in a kind of a coarse whisper jim and he answered up right at my elbow with a sort of a moan and i says quick jim it ain't no time for foolin around and moanin there is a gang of murderers in yonder and if we don't hunt up their boat and set her driftin down the river so these fellows can't get away from the wreck there's one of em goin to be in a bad fix but if we find their boat we can put all of em in a bad fix for the sheriff will get em quick hurry i'll hunt the larboard side you hunt the starboard you start at the raft and oh my lordy lordy raft they ain't no raft no more she done broke loose and gone and here we is end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter Thirteen: Escaping from the Wreck, The Watchman, Sinking. Well, I catched my breath and most fainted, shut up on a wreck with such a gang as that but it weren't no time to be sentimentering we'd got to find that boat now had to have it for ourselves so we went a quaking and shaking down the starboard side and slow work it was too seemed a week before we got to the stern no sign of a boat jim said he didn't believe he could go any further so scared he hadn't hardly any strength left he said but i said come on if we get left on this wreck we are in a fix sure so on we prowled again we struck for the stern of the texas and found it and then scrambled along forwards on the skylight hanging on from shutter to shutter for the edge of the skylight was in the water 
when we got pretty close to the cross hall door there was a skiff sure enough i could just barely see her i felt ever so thankful in another second i would have been aboard of her but just then the door opened one of the men struck his head out only about a couple of foot from me and i thought i was gone but he jerked it in again and says heave that blame lantern out of sight bill he flung a bag of something into the boat and then got in himself and sat down it was packard then bill he come out and got in packard says in a low voice already shove off i couldn't hardly hang on to the shutters i was so weak but bill says hold on did you go through him no didn't you no so he's got his share of the cash yet well then come along no use to take truck and leave money say won't he suspicion what we're up to maybe he won't but we got to have it anyway come along so they got out and went in the door slammed too because it was on the careen side and in a half a second i was in the boat and jim come tumbling after me i out with my knife and cut the rope and away we went we didn't touch an oar and we didn't speak no whisper nor hardly even breathe we went gliding swift along dead silent past the tip of the paddle box and past the stern then in a second or two more we was a hundred yards below the wreck and the darkness soaked her up every last sign of her and we was safe and knowed it when we was three or four hundred yards downstream we seen the lantern show like a little spark at the texas door for a second and we knowed by that the rascals had missed their boat and was beginning to understand that they was in just as much trouble now as jim turner was then jim manned the oars and we took out after our raft now was the first time that i begun to worry about the men i reckon i hadn't had time to before i begun to think how dreadful it was even for murderers to be in such a fix i says to myself there ain't no tellin but i might come to be a murderer myself yet and then how would i like it so says i to jim the first lot we see we'll land a hundred yards below it or above it in a place where it's a good hiding place for you in the skiff and then i'll go and fix up some kind of a yarn and get somebody to go for that gang and get them out of their scrape so they can be hung when their time comes but that idea was a failure for pretty soon it begun to storm again and this time worse than ever the rain poured down and never a light showed everybody in bed i reckon we boomed along down the river watching for lights and watching for our raft after a long time the rain lit up but the clouds stayed and the lightning kept whimpering and by and by a flash showed us a black thing ahead floating and we made for it it was a raft and mighty glad was we to get aboard of it again we seen a light now away down to the right on shore so i said i would go for it the skiff was half full of plunder which that gang had stole there on the wreck we hustled it on to the raft in a pile and i told jim to float along down and show a light when he judged he had gone about two mile and keep it burning till i come then i manned my oars and shoved for the light as i got down towards it three or four more showed up on a hillside it was a village i closed in above the shore light and laid on my oars and floated as i went by i see it was a lantern hanging on the jackstaff of a double hull ferry boat i skimmed around for the watchman a wonderin whereabouts he slept and by and by i found him roostin on the bits forward and his head down between his knees i gave his shoulder two or three little shoves and began to cry he stirred up in a kind of a startlish way but when he sees it was only me he took a good gap and stretch and then he says hello what's up don't cry bub what's the trouble i says pap and ma'am and sis and then i broke down 
he says oh dang it now don't take on so we all has to have our troubles and this'll come out all right what's the matter with him there there are you the watchman of the boat yes he says kind of pretty well satisfied like i'm the captain and the owner and the mate and the pilot and watchman and head deck hand and sometimes i'm the freight and passengers i ain't as rich as old jim hornback and i can't be so blamed generous and good to tom dick and harry as what he is and slam around money the way he does but i told him a many a time i wouldn't trade places with him for says i a sailor's life's the life for me and i'm durned if i'd ha lived two mile out of town where there ain't nothin ever goin on not for all his spondulux and as much more on top of it says i i broke in and says they're in an awful peck of trouble and who is why pap and ma'am and sis and miss hooker and if you take your ferry boat and go up there up where where are they on the wreck what wreck why there ain't but one what you don't mean the walter scott yes good land what are they doing there for gracious sakes well they didn't go there a purpose i bet they didn't why great goodness there ain't no chance for em if they don't get off mighty quick why how in the nation did they ever get into such a scrape easy enough miss hooker was a visiting up there to the town yes booth's landing go on she was a visiting there at booth's landing and just in the edge of the evening she started over with her nigger woman in the horse ferry to stay all night at her friend's house miss what you may call her i disremember her name and they lost their steering oar and swung around and went a floating down stern first about two mile and settle bags on the wreck and the ferryman and the nigger woman and the horses was all lost but miss hooker she made a grab and got aboard the wreck well about an hour after dark we come along down in our trading scow and it was so dark we didn't notice the wreck till we was right on it and so we saddle bags but all of us was saved but bill wimple and oh he was the best creature i most wished it had been me i do ah george it's the beatenest thing i ever struck and then what did you all do well we hollered and took on but it's so wide there we couldn't make nobody hear so pap said somebody got to get ashore and get help somehow i was the only one that could swim so i made a dash for it and miss hooker she said if i didn't strike help sooner come here and hunt up her uncle and he'd fix the thing i made the land about a mile below and been foolin along ever since trying to get people to do something but they said what in such a night in such a current there ain't no sense in it go for the steam ferry now if you'll go and by jackson i'd like to and blame it i don't know but i will but who in the ding nations a goin to pay for it do you reckon your papa why that's all right miss hooker she told me particular that her uncle hornback great guns is he her uncle looky here you break for that light over yonder way and turn out west when you get there and about a quarter of a mile out you'll come to the tavern tell him to dart you out to jim hornback's and he'll foot the bill and don't you fool around any because he'll want to know the news tell him i'll have his niece all safe before he can get to town hump yourself now i'm a-going up around the corner here to roust out my engineer i struck for the light but as soon as he turned the corner i went back and got into my skiff and bailed her out and then pulled up shore in the easy water about six hundred yards and tucked myself in among some wood boats for i couldn't rest easy till i could see the ferry boat start but take it all around i was feeling rather comfortable on accounts of taking all this trouble for that gang for not many would a done it 
I wish the widow knowed about it. I judge she would be proud of me for helping these rapscallions, because rapscallions and deadbeats is the kind the widow and good people takes the most interest in. Well, before long, here comes the wreck, dim and dusty, sliding along down. A kind of cold shiver went through me, and then I struck out for her. She was very deep, and I see in a minute there weren't much chance for anybody being alive in her. I pulled all around her, and hollered a little, but there wasn't any answer, all dead still. I felt a little bit heavy-hearted about the gang, but not much, for I reckoned if they could stand it, I could. Then there comes the ferry boat, so I shoved for the middle of the river on a long downstream slant, and when I judged I was out of eye reach, I laid on my oars and looked back and see her go and smell around the wreck for Miss Hooker's remainders, because the captain would know her Uncle Hornback would want them. And then pretty soon the ferry boat gave it up and went for the shore, and I laid into my work and went a booming down the river. It did seem a powerful long time before Jim's light showed up, and when it did show, it looked like it was a thousand mile off. By the time I got there, the sky was beginning to get a little gray in the east, so we struck for an island, and hid the raft, and sunk the skiff, and turned in, and slept like dead people. End of chapter 13「fourteen, of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter fourteen, A General Good Time. The Harem. French. By and by, when we got up, we turned over the truck the gang had stole off of the wreck and found boots and blankets and clothes and all sorts of other things and a lot of books and a spy-glass and three boxes of cigars we hadn't ever been this rich before in neither of our lives the cigars was prime we laid off all the afternoon in the woods talking and me reading the books and having a general good time i told jim all about what happened inside the wreck and at the ferry boat and I said these kinds of things was adventures. But he said he didn't want no more adventures. He said that when I went in the Texas, and he crawled back to get on the raft, and found her gone, he nearly died. Because he judged it was all up to him anyway, it could be fixed. For if he didn't get saved, he would get drowned. And if he did get saved, whoever saved him would send him back home, so as to get the reward and then Miss Watson would sell him south, sure. Well, he was right. He was most always right. He had an uncommon level head for a nigger. I read considerable to Jim about kings and dukes and earls and such, and how gaudy they dressed, and how much style they put on, and called each other your majesty and your grace and your lordship, and so on, instead of mister, and Jim's eyes bugged out, and he was interested he says i didn't know dey was so many on em i hain't heard bout none on em scarcely but old king solomon unless you count dem kings dat's in a pack o cards how much do a king get get i says why they get a thousand dollars a month if they want it they can have just as much as they want everything belongs to them ain't that gay and what they got to do huck they don't do nothing why how you talk they just sit around no is that so of course it is they just sit around except maybe when there's a war then they go to the war but other times they just lazy around or just talking just talking and so Shh. do you hear the noise we skipped out and looked, but it weren't nothing but the flutter of a steamboat's wheel away down, coming around the point. So we come back. Yes, says I, 
and other times when things is dull they fuss with the parliament and if everybody don't go just so he whacks their heads off but mostly they hang around the harem round the witch harem what's the harem the place where it keeps his wives don't you know about the harem solomon had one he had about a million wives why yes that's so i i done forgot it a harem's a boarding house i reckon most likely they has rackety times in the nursery and i reckon the wives quarrels considerable and that creased the racket yet they say solomon the wisest man that ever live i don't take no stock in that because why would a wise man want to live in the midst of such a blim blamin all the time no deed he wouldn't a wise man had taken bill a biller factory and then he could shut down the biller factory when he wants to rest well but he was the wisest man anyway because the widow she told me so her own self i don't care what the widow say he warn't no wise man nother he had some of the dad fetchedest ways i ever see does you know about that child that he is going to chop in too yes the widow told me all about it well then warn that the beatinest notion in the world you just take a look at it a minute does the stump da that's one of the women he has you that's the yotter one i solomon and this yeah dollar bills the child before and you's claim it what does i do does i shin around among the neighbors and find out which one of you the bill do belong to and hand it over to the right one all safe and sound the way that anybody that had any gumption would no i take and whack the bill in two and give half of it to you and the other half to the other woman that's the way solomon was going to do it with the child now i want to ask you what's the use of that half a bill can't buy nothing with it and what use is half a child i wouldn't give a darn for a million on em but hang it jim you've clean missed the point blame it you've missed it a thousand mile who me go along don't talk to me about yo pence i reckon i no sense when i sees it and they ain't no sense in such doing as dat dispute it want about a half a child dispute was about a whole child and the man that think he can settle a spute about a whole child with a half a child don't know enough to come in out of the rain don't talk to me about solomon huck i knows him by the back but i tell you you don't get the point blame the point i reckon i knows what i knows and mind you the real punt is down ye futter it's down deeper it lays in the way solomon was raised you take a man that's got only one or two chillin is that man going to be wasteful or chillin no he ain't he can't afford it he knows how to value em but you take a man that's got about five million chillin running round the house and it's different he is soon chop a child in two as a cat there's plenty more a child or two more or less want no consequence to solomon dad fetch him i never see such a nigger if he got a notion in his head once there weren't no getting it out again he was the most down on solomon of any nigger i ever see so i went to talking about other kings and let solomon slide I told him about Louis the Sixteenth that got his head cut off in France a long time ago, and about his little boy, the dolphin, 
that would have been a king but they took him and shut him up in jail and some say he died there oh little chap but some says he got out and got away and come to america that's good but he'll be party lonesome they ain't no kings here is they huck no then he can't get no situation what he goin to do well i don't know some of them gets on the police and some of them learns people how to talk french why well, huck don't the french people talk the same way we does no jim you couldn't understand a word they said not a single word well now i be ding busted how did that come i don't know but it's so i got some of their jabber out of a book suppose a man was to come to you and say parlez vous fancy what would you think i wouldn't think nothing i'd take and bust him over the head that is if he want white i wouldn't low no nigger to call me that shucks it ain't calling you anything it's only saying do you know how to talk french well then why couldn't he say it why he is a saying it it's a frenchman's way of saying it well it's a blame ridiculous way and i don't want to hear no more about it there ain't no sense in it looky here jim does a cat talk like we do no a cat don't well does a cow no a cow don't nother does a cat talk like a cow or a cow talk like a cat no they don't it's natural and right for em to talk different from each other ain't it course and ain't it natural and right for a cat and a cow to talk different from us why well, most surely it is well then why ain't it natural and right for a frenchman to talk different from us you answer me that is a cat a man huh no well then there ain't no sense in a cat talking like a man is a cow a man or is a cow a cat no she ain't either of em well then she ain't got no business to talk like either one or the other of em is a french man a man yes well then dad blame it why don't he talk like a man you answer me dad i see it weren't no use wasting words you can't learn a nigger to argue so why quit end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the adventures of huckleberry finn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the adventures of huckleberry finn by mark twain chapter fifteen huck loses the raft in the fog huck finds the raft trash we judge that three nights more would fetch us to cairo at the bottom of illinois where the ohio river comes in and that was what we was after we would sail the raft and get on a steamboat and go way up the ohio amongst the free states and then to be out of trouble well the second night a fog begun to come on and we made for a towhead to tie to for it wouldn't do to try to run in a fog but when i paddled ahead in the canoe with the line to make fast there weren't anything but little saplings to tie to i passed the line around one of them right on the edge of the cut bank but there was a stiff current and the raft came booming down so lively she tore it out by the roots and away she went i see the fog closing down and it made me so sick and scared i couldn't budge for most half a minute it seemed to me and then there weren't no raft in sight you couldn't see twenty yards i jumped into the canoe and run back to the stern and grabbed the paddle and set her back a stroke but she didn't come i was in such a hurry i hadn't untied her i got up and tried to untie her but i was so excited my hands shook so i couldn't hardly do anything with them as soon as i got started i took out after the raft hot and heavy right down the towhead that was all right as far as it went but the towhead weren't sixty yards long 
and the minute I flew by the foot of it I shot out into the solid white fog, and had no more idea which way I was going than a dead man. Thinks I, it wouldn't do to paddle. First I know, I'll run into the bank, or a towhead, or something. I got to sit still and float, and yet it's mighty fidgety business to have to hold your hand still at such a time. I whooped and listened. Away down there somewheres, I hears a small whoop, and up comes my spirits. I went tearing after it, listening sharp to hear it again. The next time it come, I see I weren't heading for it, but heading away to the right of it, and the next time I was heading away to the left of it, and not gaining on it much either, for I was flying around this way and that and to other, but it was going straight ahead all the time. I did wish the fool would think to beat a tin pan, and beat it all the time, but he never did, and it was the still places between the whoops that was making the trouble for me. Well, I fought along, and directly I hears the whoop behind me. I was tangled good now. That was somebody else's whoop, or else I was turned around. I throwed the paddle down. I heard the whoop again. It was behind me yet but in a different place. It kept coming, and kept changing its place, and I kept answering, till by and by it was in front of me again, and I knowed the current had swung the canoe's head downstream. And I was all right if that was Jim, and not some other raftsman hollering. I couldn't tell nothing about voices in a fog, for nothing didn't look natural, nor sound natural in a fog. The whooping went on, and in about a minute, I come a-boomin' down on a cut bank with smoky ghosts of big trees on it, and the current throwed me off to the left and shot by. Amongst a lot of snags that fairly roared, the current was tearing by them so swift. In another second or two, it was solid white and still again. I sat perfectly still then, listening to my heart thump, and I reckon I didn't draw a breath while it thumped a hundred. I just give up then. I knowed what the matter was. That cut bank was an island, and Jim had gone down to other side of it. It weren't no towhead that you could float by in ten minutes. It had the big timber of a regular island. It might be five or six miles long, and more than a half a mile wide. I kept quiet, with my ears cocked. About fifteen minutes, I reckon. I was floating along, of course four or five miles an hour but you didn't ever think of that no you feel like you are laying dead still on the water and if a little glimpse of a snag slips by you don't think to yourself how fast you're going but you catch your breath and think my how that snag's tearing along if you think it ain't dismal and lonesome out in a fog that way by yourself in the night you try it once you'll see Next, for about in half an hour, I whoops now and then. At last I hears the answer a long ways off, and tries to follow it, but I couldn't do it. Indirectly, I judged I got into a nest of towheads, for I had little dim glimpses of them on both sides of me, sometimes just a narrow channel between, and some that I couldn't see. I knowed was there, because I hear the wash of the current against the old dead brush, and trash that hung over the banks. Well, I weren't long losing the whoops down amongst the towheads, and I only tried to chase them a little while, anyway, because it was worse than chasing a jack-o'-lantern. You never knowed a sound dodge around so, and swamp places so quick and so much. I had to claw away from the bank, pretty lively, four or five times, to keep from knocking the islands out of the river and so I judged the raft must be butting into the bank every now and then, or else it would get further ahead and clear out of hearing. It was floating a little faster than what I was. Well, I seemed to be in the open river again by and by, but I couldn't hear no sign of a whoop nowheres. I reckon Jim had fetched up on a snag, maybe, and it was all up with him. I was good and tired, so I laid down in the canoe, and said I wouldn't bother no more. I didn't want to go to sleep, of course, but
but I was so sleepy I couldn't help it, so I thought I would take just one little cat nap. But I reckon it was more than a cat nap, for when I waked up, the stars were shining bright, the fog was all gone, and I was spinning down a big bend stern first. First, I didn't know where I was. I thought I was dreaming, and when things began to come back to me, they seemed to come up dim out of last week. It was a monstrous big river here, with the tallest and the thickest kind of timber on both banks, just a solid wall, as well as I could see by the stars. I looked away downstream and seen a black speck on the water. I took after it, but when I got to it, it weren't nothing but a couple of saw logs made fast together. Then I see another speck and chased that, then another, and this time I was right. It was the raft. When I got to it, Jim was settin' there with his head down between his knees asleep, with his right arm hanging over the steering oar. The other oar was smashed off, and the raft was littered up with leaves and branches and dirt. So she'd had a rough time. I made fast and laid down under Jim's nose on the raft, and began to gap, and stretched my fists out against him, and says, "'Hello, Jim. Have I been asleep? Why didn't you stir me up?' "'Goodness gracious, is that you, Huck? And you ain't dead. You ain't drowned. You back again. Oh, it's too good for true, honey. It's too good for true. Let me look at you, child.' Let me feel of you. No, you ain't dead. You's back again, live and sound, just the same old Huck. The same old Huck. Thanks to goodness. What's the matter with you, Jim? You been a drinkin'? Drinkin'? Has I been a drinkin'? <laughs> Has I had a chance to be a drinkin'? Well then, what makes you talk so wild? How does I talk wild? How? Why, hain't you been talking about my coming back, and all that stuff, as if I had been gone away? Huck, Huck Finn, you look me in the eye. Look me in the eye. Ain't you been gone away? Gone away? Why, what in the nation do you mean? I hain't been gone anywheres. Where would I go to? Well, looky here, boss. There's something wrong there is. Is I me, or who is I? Is I here, or why is I? Now that's what I wants to know. Well, I think you're here, plain enough. But I think you're a tangle-headed old fool, Jim. I is, is I? Well, you answer me this. Didn't you tote out the line in the canoe for to make fast to the towhead? No, I didn't. What towhead? I hain't seen no towhead. You hain't seen no towhead? Looky here. Didn't the line pull loose and the raft go a humming down the river and leave you and the canoe behind in the fog? What fog? Why, the fog, the fog that's been around all night. And didn't you whoop and didn't I whoop till we got mixed up in the islands and one of us got lost and to other one was just as good as lost case he didn't know why he was and didn't I bust up again a lot of them islands and have a terrible time and most get drownded? Now ain't that so, boss? Ain't that ain't it so? You answer me that. Well, this is too many for me, Jim. I hain't seen no fog, nor no islands, nor nor troubles, nor nothing. I've been sitting here talking with you all night till you went to sleep, about ten minutes ago, and I reckon I done the same. You couldn't a got drunk in that time. So, of course, you've been dreaming. Dad, fetch it. How is I going to dream all that in ten minutes? Well, hang it all. You did dream it, because there didn't any of it happen. But, Huck, it's all just as plain to me as... It don't make no difference how plain it is. There ain't nothing in it. I know, because I've been here all the time. Jim didn't say nothing for about five minutes but sit there studying over it. Then he says, Well, then I reckon I did dream it, Huck. But dog my cats if it ain't the powerfulest dream I ever see. And I hain't ever had no dream before that's tired me like this one. Oh, well, that's all right. Because a dream does tire a body like everything sometimes. 
but this one was a staving dream tell me all about it jim so jim went to work and told me the whole thing right through just as it happened only he painted it up considerable then he said he must start in and interpret it because it was sent for a warning he said the first towhead stood for a man that would try to do us some good but the current was another man that would get us away from him the whoops was warnings that would come to us every now and then and if we didn't try hard to make out to understand them they'd just take us into bad luck stead of keeping us out of it the lot of towheads was troubles we was going to get into with quarrelsome people and all kinds of mean folks if we minded our business and didn't talk back and aggravate them we would pull through and get out of the fog and into the big clear river which was the free states and wouldn't have no trouble it had clouded up pretty dark just after i got on to the raft but it was clearing up again now oh well that's all interpreted well enough as far as it goes jim i says but what does these things stand for it was the leaves and rubbish on the raft in the smashed door you could see them first rate now jim looked at the trash and then looked at me and back at the trash again he had got the dream fixed so strong in his head that he couldn't seem to shake it loose and get the facts back into its place again right away but when he did get the thing straightened around he looked at me steadily without ever smiling and says what did they stand for i was going to tell you when i got all wore out with work and with the calling for you and went to sleep my heart was most broke because you was lost and i didn't care no more what become of me in the wrath and when I wake up and find you back again all safe and sound, the tears coming, and I could have got down on my knees and kiss your foot. I was so thankful. And all you was thinking was how you could make a fool of old Jim with a lie. That truck da is trash. And trash is what people is that puts dirt on the head of their friends and makes them ashamed. Then he got up slow and walked to the wigwam and went in there without saying anything but that was enough it made me feel so mean i could almost kiss his foot to get him to take it back it was fifteen minutes before i could work myself up to go and humble myself to a nigger but i done it and i weren't ever sorry for it afterwards neither i didn't do him no more mean tricks and i wouldn't a done that one if i'd a known it would make him feel that way End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 16 Expectation a white lie floating currency running by cairo swimming ashore we slept most all day and started out at night a little ways behind a monstrous long raft that was as long going as a procession she had four long sweeps at each end so we judged she carried as many as thirty men likely she had five big wigwams aboard wide apart and an open campfire in the middle and a tall flagpole at each end there was a power of style about her it amounted to something being a raftsman on such a craft as that we went drifting down into a big bend in the night clouded up and got hot the river was very wide and was walled with solid timber on both sides you couldn't see a break in it hardly ever or a light we talked about cairo and wondered whether we would know it when we got to it i said likely we wouldn't because i had heard say there weren't but about a dozen houses there and if they didn't happen to have them lit up how was we going to know we was passing a town jim said if two big rivers joined together there 
that would show. But I said maybe we might think we was passing the foot of an island and coming into the same old river again. That disturbed Jim, and me too. So the question was, what to do? I said, paddle ashore, the first time a light showed, and then tell them Pap was behind, coming along with a trading scow, and was a green hand at the business, and wanted to know how far it was to Cairo. Jim thought it was a good idea, so we took a smoke on it, and waited. There weren't nothing to do now but to look out sharp for the town, and not pass it without seeing it. He said he'd be mighty sure to see it, because he'd be a free man the minute he seen it, but if he missed it, he'd be in a slave country again, and no more show for freedom. Every little while he jumps up and says, Dar she is. But it weren't. It was jack-o'-lanterns, or lightning bugs, so we sat down again and went to watching, same as before. Jim said it made him all over trembly and feverish to be so close to freedom. Well, I can tell you, it made me all over trembly and feverish, too, to hear him, because I had begun to get it through my head that he was most free. And who was to blame for it? Why, me. I couldn't get that out of my conscience. Not how, nor no way. It got to trouble in me, so I couldn't rest. I couldn't stay still in one place. It had never come home to me before what this thing was that I was doing. But now it did, and it stayed with me, and scorched me more and more. I tried to make out to myself that I weren't to blame, because I didn't run Jim off from his rightful owner. But it weren't no use. Conscience up and says every time, but you knowed he was running for his freedom, and you could have paddled ashore and told somebody. That was so. I couldn't get around that no way. That was where it pinched. Conscience says to me, What had poor Miss Watson done to you, that you could see her nigger go off right under your eyes and never say one single word? What did that poor old woman do to you, that you could treat her so mean? Why? She tried to learn you your book. She tried to learn you your manners. She tried to be good to you every way she knowed how. That's what she done. I got to feeling so mean and so miserable, I most wished I was dead. I fidgeted up and down the raft, abusing myself to myself, and Jim was fidgeting up and down past me. We neither of us could keep still. Every time he danced around and says, does Cairo? It went through me like a shot, and I thought if it was Cairo, I reckoned I would die of miserableness. Jim talked out loud all the time while I was talking to myself. He was saying how the first thing he would do when he got to a free state, he would go to saving up money and never spend a single cent, and when he got enough, he would buy his wife which was owned on a farm close to where Miss Watson lived, and then they would both work to buy the two children, and if their master weren't sell them, they'd get an abolitionist to go and steal them. It most froze me to hear such talk. He would never dare to talk such talk in his life before. Just see what a difference it made in him the minute he judged he was about free. It was according to the old saying, Give a nigger an inch, and he'll take an now. Thinks I, this was what comes of my not thinking. Here was this nigger, which I had as good as helped to run away, coming right out flat-footed, and saying he would steal his children, children that belonged to a man I didn't even know, a man that hadn't ever done me no harm. I was sorry to hear Jim say that. It was such a lowering of him. My conscience got to stirring me up hotter than ever, until at last I says to it, Let up on me. It ain't too late yet. I'll paddle ashore at the first light and tail. I felt easy and happy, and light as a feather right off. All my troubles was gone. I went to looking out sharp for a light, and sort of singing to myself. By and by, one showed. Jim sings out. We safe, Huck. We safe. Jump up and crack your heels. That's the good old Cairo at last. I just knows it. 
I says, I'll take the canoe and go and see Jim. It mightn't be, you know. He jumped and got the canoe ready, and put his old coat in the bottom for me to sit on, and give me a paddle. And as I shoved off, he says, Pretty soon I'll be a-shoutin' for joy, and I'll say it's all on account o' Huck. I was a free man, and I couldn't ever been free if it hadn't been for Huck. Huck done it. Jim won't ever forget you, Huck. You's the best friend Jim's ever had, and you's the only friend old Jim's got now. I was paddling off, all in a sweat, to tell on him, but when he says this, it seemed to kind of take the tuck all out of me. I went along slow then, and I weren't right down certain whether I was glad I started or whether I weren't. When I was fifty yards off, Jim says, There you goes, the old true Huck, the only white gentleman that ever kept his promise to old Jim. Well, I just felt sick, but I says, I got to do it. I can't get out of it. Right then along comes a skiff with two men in it with guns, and they stopped and I stopped. One of them says, What's that yonder? A piece of a raft, I says. Do you belong on it? Yes, sir. Any men on it? Only one, sir. Well, there's five niggers run off tonight up yonder, above the head of the bend. Is your man white or black? I didn't answer up prompt. I tried to, but the words wouldn't come. I tried for a second or two to brace up and out with it, but I weren't man enough. Hadn't the spunk of a rabbit. I see I was weakening, so I just give up trying, and up and says, He's white. I reckon we'll go see for ourselves. I wish you would, says I, because it's Pap that's there. And maybe you'd help me tow the raft ashore where the light is. He's sick, and so is ma'am and Mary Ann. Oh, the devil. We're in a hurry, boy, but I suppose we've got to. Come, buckle to your paddle, and let's get along. I buckled to my paddle, and they laid to their oars. When we had made a stroke or two, I says, Pap'll be mighty much obliged to you, I can tell you. Everybody goes away when I want them to help me tow the raft ashore, and I can't do it myself. Well, that's infernal mean. Odd, too. Say, boy, what's the matter with your father? It's the, uh, the, well, it ain't anything much. They stopped pulling. It weren't but a mighty little ways to the raft now. One says, Boy, that's a lie. What is the matter with your pap? Answer up square now, and it'll be the better for you. Will, sir, I will, honest, but don't leave us, please. It's the, the, the gentleman. If you'll only pull ahead and let me heave you the headline, you won't have to come near the raft, please do. Set her back, John, set her back, says one. They backed water. Keep away, boy, keep to lured. Confound it. I just expect the wind has blown it to us. Your pap's got the smallpox, and you know it precious well. Why didn't you come out and say so? Do you want to spread it all over? Well, says I, a blubberin', I've told everybody before, and they just went away and left us. Poor devil, there's something in that. We are right down sorry for you, but we, well, hang it, we don't want the smallpox, you see. Look here, I'll tell you what to do. Don't you try to land by yourself, or you'll smash everything to pieces. You float along down about twenty miles, and you'll come to a town on the left-hand side of the river. It'll be long after sun-up then, and when you ask for help, you tell them your folks are all down with chills and fever. Don't be a fool again and let people guess what is the matter. Now we're trying to do you a kindness, so you just put twenty miles between us. That's a good boy. It wouldn't do any good to land yonder where the light is. It's only a wood yard. Say, I reckon your father's poor, and I'm bound to say he's in pretty hard luck. Here, I'll put a twenty-dollar gold piece on this board, and you get it when it floats by. I feel mighty mean to leave you, but my kingdom, it won't do to fool with smallpox, don't you see? Hold on, Parker, says the other man. Here's the twenty to put on the board for me. Goodbye, boy. You do as Mr. Parker told you, and you'll be all right. That's so, my boy. Goodbye. Goodbye. 
if you see any runaway niggas, you get help and nab them, and you can make some money by it. Goodbye, sir, says I. I won't let no runaway niggers get by me if I can help it. They went off, and I got aboard the raft, feeling bad and low, because I knowed very well I had done wrong, and I see it weren't no use for me to try to learn to do right. A body that don't get started right when he's little ain't got no show. When the pinch comes, there ain't nothing to back him up and keep him to his work, and so he gets beat. Then I thought a minute, and says to myself, Hold on, suppose you'd a done right and give Jim up. Would you felt better than what you do now? No, says I, I'd feel bad. I'd feel just the same way I do now. Well then, says I, what's the use you learnin' to do right when it's troublesome to do right? and ain't no trouble to do wrong, and the wages is just the same. I was stuck. I couldn't answer that, so I reckoned I wouldn't bother no more about it, but after this, always do whichever come handiest at the time. I went into the wigwam. Jim wasn't there. I looked all around. He wasn't anywhere. I says, Jim. Here I is, Huck. Is they out of sight yet? Don't talk loud. He was in the river, under the stern oar, with just his nose out. I told him they were out of sight, so he come aboard, he says. I was listening to all the talk, and I slips into the river, and was going to shove for shore if they come aboard. Then I was going to swim to the raft again when they was gone. But lawsy, how you did fool em, Huck. That was the smartest dodge. I tell you, child, I spec it save old Jim. Old Jim ain't going to forget you for that, honey. Then we talked about the money. It was a pretty good raise, twenty dollars apiece. Jim said we could take deck passage on a steamboat now, and the money would last us as far as we wanted to go in the free states. He said twenty mile more weren't far for the raft to go, but he wished we was already there. Towards daybreak, we tied up, and Jim was mighty particular about hiding the raft good. Then he worked all day, fixing things in bundles, and getting all ready to quit rafting. That night, about ten, we hove in sight of the lights of a town, away down in the left-hand bend. I went off in the canoe to ask about it. Pretty soon, I found a man out in the river with a skiff, setting a trot line. I ranged up and says, Mister, is that town Cairo? Cairo? No, you must be a blame fool. What town is it, mister? If you want to know, go and find out. If you stay here bothering around me for about half a minute longer, you'll get something you won't want. I paddled to the raft. Jim was awful disappointed. But I said, never mind, Cairo would be the next place, I reckoned. We passed another town before daylight, and that was going out again, but it was high ground, so I didn't go. No high ground about Cairo, Jim said. I had forgot it. We laid up for the day on a towhead, tolerable close to the left-hand bank. I began to suspicion something. So did Jim. I says, Maybe we went by Cairo in the fog that night. He says, Don't let's talk about it, Huck. Poor niggers can't have no luck. I all expected that rattlesnake skin want done with its work. I wish I'd never seen that snake skin, Jim. I do wish I'd never laid eyes on it. It ain't your fault, Huck. You didn't know. Don't you blame yourself about it. When it was daylight, here was the clear Ohio water and shore, sure enough, and outside was the old regular muddy, so it was all up with Cairo. We talked it all over. It wouldn't do to take to the shore. We couldn't take the raft up the stream, of course. There weren't no way but to wait for dark and start back in the canoe and take the chances. So we slept all day amongst the cottonwood thicket, so as to be fresh for the work. And when we went back to the raft about dark, the canoe was gone. We didn't say a word for a good while. 
there were anything to say. We both knowed well enough it was some more work of the rattlesnake skin. So what was the use to talk about it? It would only look like we was finding fault, and that would be bound to fetch more bad luck, and keep it on fetching it too, till we knowed enough to keep still. By and by we talked about what we better do, and found there weren't no way but just to go along down with the raft till we got a chance to buy a canoe to go back in. We weren't going to borrow it when there weren't anybody around, the way Pop would do, for that might set people after us. So we shoved out after dark on the raft. Anybody that don't believe yet that it's foolishness to handle a snakeskin, after all that, snakeskin done for us, will believe it now if they read on and see what more it done for us. The place to buy canoes is off off rafts, lying up at shore. But we didn't see no rafts lying up, so we went along during three hours and more. Well, the night got gray and rather thick, which is the next meanest thing to fog. You can't tell the shape of the river, and you can't see no distance. It got to be very late and still, and then along comes a steamboat up the river. We lit the lantern and judged she would see it. Upstream, boats didn't generally come too close to us. They go out and follow the bars and hunt for easy water under the reefs, but nights like this, they bowl right up the channel against the whole river. We could hear her pounding along, but we didn't see her good till she was close. She aimed right for us. Often they do that and try to see how close they can come without touching. Sometimes the wheel bites off a sweep, and when the pilot sticks his head out and laughs, and he thinks he's mighty smart. Well, here she comes, and we said she was going to try to shave us, but she didn't seem to be shearing off a bit. She was a big one, and she was coming in a hurry too, looking like a black cloud with rows of glow-worms around it. But all of a sudden she bulged out, big and scary with a long row of wide-open furnace doors shining like red-hot teeth, and her monstrous bows and guards hanging right over us. There was a yell at us, and a jingling of bells to stop the engines, a pow-wow of cussing and a whistling of steam, and as Jim went overboard on one side and I on the other, she comes smashing straight through the raft. I dived and I aimed to find the bottom, too, for a thirty-foot wheel had got to go over me, and I wanted it to have plenty of room. I could always stay under water a minute. This time, I reckoned, I stayed under a minute and a half. Then I bounced for the top in a hurry, for I was nearly busting. I popped out to my armpits and blowed the water out of my nose, and puffed a bit. Of course, there was a booming current. And, of course, that boat started her engines again ten seconds after she stopped them, for they never cared much for raftsmen, so now she was churning along up the river, out of sight, in the thick weather, though I could hear her. I sung out for Jim about a dozen times, but I didn't get any answer, so I grabbed a plank that touched me while I was treading water, and struck out for shore, shoving it ahead of me but I made out to see that the drift of the current was towards the left-hand shore, which meant that I was in a crossing, so I changed off and went that way. It was one of those long, slanting, two-mile crossings, so I was a good long time in getting over. I made a safe landing and clumb up the bank. I couldn't see but a little ways, but I went poking along over rough ground for a quarter of a mile or more, and then I run across the big old-fashioned double log house before I noticed it. I was going to rush by and get away, but a lot of dogs jumped out and went to howling and barking at me, and I knowed better than to move another peg. End of chapter 16「Chapter 17 of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 17 An Evening Call. The Farm in Arkansas. Interior Decorations. Stephen Doling Botts. Poetical Effusions. In about a minute, somebody spoke out of a window without putting his head out and says, Be done, boys. Who's there? I says, It's me. Who's me? George Jackson, sir. What do you want? I don't want nothing, sir. I only want to go along by, but the dogs won't let me. What are you prowling around here this time of night for, hey? I weren't prowling about, sir. I fell overboard off of the steamboat. Oh, you did, did you? Strike a light there, somebody. What did you say your name was? George Jackson, sir. I'm only a boy. Look here. If you're telling the truth, you needn't be afraid. Nobody will hurt you. But don't try to budge. Stand right where you are. Rouse out Bob and Tom, some of you, and fetch the guns. George Jackson, is there anyone with you? No, sir. Nobody. I heard the people stirring about in the house now, and see a light. The man sung out. Snatch that light away, Betsy, you old fool. Ain't you got any sense? Put it on the floor behind the door. Bob, if you and Tom are ready, take your places. All ready. Now, George Jackson, do you know the Shepherdsons? No, sir. I never heard of them. Well, that may be so, and it mayn't. Now, all ready? Step forward, George Jackson, and mind, don't you hurry. Come mighty slow. If there's anyone with you, let him keep back. If he shows himself, he'll be shot. Come along now. Come slow. Push the door open yourself. Just enough to squeeze in. Do you hear? I didn't hurry. I couldn't if I'd a wanted to. I took one slow step at a time, and there weren't a sound. Only I thought I couldn't hear my heart. The dogs were as still as the humans, but they followed a little behind me. When I got to the three log doorsteps, I heard them unlocking and unbarring and unbolting. I put my hand on the door and pushed it a little and a little more till somebody said, There, that's enough. Put your head in. I done it, but I judged they would take it off. The candle was on the floor and there they all was, looking at me, and me at them, for about a quarter of a minute. Three big men with guns pointed at me, which made me wince, I tell you. The oldest, gray and about sixty, the other two thirty or more, all of them fine and handsome, and the sweetest old gray-headed lady, and back of her two young women, which I couldn't see right well. The old gentleman says, there i reckon it's all right come in as soon as i was in the old gentleman he locked the door and barred it and bolted it and told the young men to come in with their guns and they all went in a big parlor that had a new rag carpet on the floor and got together in a corner that was out of the range of the front windows there weren't none on the side they held the candle and took a good look at me and all said why he ain't a shepherdson no there ain't any shepherdson about him then the old man said he hoped i wouldn't mind being searched for arms because he didn't mean no harm by it it was only to make sure so he didn't pry into my pockets but only felt outside with his hands and said it was all right he told me to take myself easy and at home and tell all about myself but the old lady says why, bless you, Saul, the poor thing's as wet as he can be, and don't you reckon it may be he's hungry? True for you, Rachel. I forgot. So the old lady says, Betsy, this was a nigger woman, you fly round and get him something to eat as quick as you can, poor thing, and one of you girls go and wake up Buck and tell him, oh, here he is himself. Buck, take this little stranger and get the wet clothes off from him and dress him up in something of yours that's dry. Buck looked about as old as me thirteen or fourteen or along there though he was a little bigger than me 
He hadn't on anything but a shirt, and he was very drowsy-headed. He came in, gaping and digging one fist into his eyes, and he was dragging a gun along with the other one. He says, Ain't they no Shepherdsons around? They said no. Twas a false alarm. Well, he says, They'd a been some. I reckon I'd a got one. They all laughed, and Bob says, Why, Buck, they might have scalped us all. You've been so slow in coming. Well, nobody come after me. It ain't right. I'm always kept down. I don't get no show. Never mind, Buck, my boy, says the old man. You'll have show enough all in good time. Don't you fret about it. Go along with you now, and do as your mother told you. When we got upstairs to his room, he got me a coarse shirt and a roundabout and pants of his, and I put them on. While I was at it, he asked me what my name was, but before I could tell him, he started to tell me about a blue jay and a young rabbit he had catched in the woods day before yesterday, and he asked me where Moses was when the candle went out. I said I didn't know. I hadn't heard about it before. No way. Well, guess, he says. How am I going to guess, says I, when I never heard tell of it before? But you can guess, can't you? It's just as easy. Which candle, I says. Why, any candle, he says. I don't know where he was, says I. Where was he? Why, he was in the dark. That's where he was. Well, if you knowed where he was, what did you ask me for? Why blame it? It's a riddle, don't you see? Say, how long are you going to stay here? You got to stay always. We can just have booming times. They don't have no school now. Do you own a dog? I've got a dog. And he'll go in the river and bring out chips that you throw in. Do you like to come up on Sundays? And all that kind of foolishness? Bet I don't. But ma, she makes me. Confound these old britches. I reckon I better put them on. But I'd rather not. It's so warm. Are you all ready? All right. Come along, old hoss. Cold corn pone. Cold corn beef. Butter and buttermilk. That is what they had for me down there. And there ain't nothing better that ever I've come across yet. Buck and his ma and all of them smoked cob pipes, except the nigger woman, which was gone, and the two young women. They all smoked and talked, and I eat and talked. The young women had quilts about them, and their hair down their backs. They all asked me questions, and I told them how Pap and me and all the family was living on a little farm down at the bottom of Arkansas, and my sister Mary Ann run off, and got married, and never was heard of no more. And Bill went to hunt them, and he weren't heard of no more. And Tom and Mort died, and then there weren't nobody but just me and Pap left, and he was just trimmed down to nothing on account of his troubles. So when he died, I took what there was left, because the farm didn't belong to us, and started up the river, deck passage, and fell overboard, and that was how I come to be here. So they said I could have a home there as long as I wanted it. Then it was most daylight, and everybody went to bed, and I went to bed with Buck, and when I waked up in the morning, daft it all, I had forgot what my name was. So I laid there about an hour trying to think, and when Buck waked up, I says, can you spell, Buck? Yes, he says. I bet you can't spell my name, says I. I bet you what you dare I can, says he. All right, says I, go ahead. G-E-O-R-G-E-J-A-X-O-N. There now, he says. Well, says I, you done it. But I didn't think you could. It ain't no slouch of a name to spell, right off without studying. I set it down, private, because somebody might want me to spell it next, and so I wanted to be handy with it and rattle it off like I was used to it. It was a mighty nice family, and a mighty nice house, too. I hadn't seen no house out in the country before that was so nice, and had so much style. It didn't have an iron latch on the front door, 
nor a wooden one, but a buckskin string, but a brass knob to turn, the same as houses in town. There weren't no bed in the parlor, nor a sign of a bed. But heaps of parlors and towns has beds in them. There was a big fireplace that was bricked on the bottom, and the bricks was kept clean and red by pouring water on them and scrubbing them with another brick. Sometimes they washed them over with red water paint that they called Spanish brown, same as they do in town. They had big brass dog irons that could hold up a saw log. There was a clock on the middle of the mantelpiece with a picture of a town painted on the bottom half of the glass front and a round place in the middle of it for the sun and you could see the pendulum swinging behind it it was beautiful to hear that clock tick and sometimes when one of these peddlers had been along and scoured her up and got her in good shape she would start in and strike a hundred and fifty before she got tuckered out they wouldn't took any money for her well there was a big outlandish parrot on each side of the clock which made out something like chalk and painted up gaudy by one of the parrots was a cat made of cockery and a cockery dog by the other and when you pressed down on them they squeaked but didn't open their mouths nor look different nor interested they squeaked through underneath there was a couple of big wild turkey wing fans spread out behind those things on the table in the middle of the room was a kind of a lovely cockery basket that had apples and oranges and peaches and grapes piled up in it which was much redder and yellower and prettier than the real ones is but they weren't real because you could see where pieces had been chipped off and showed the white chalk or whatever it was underneath this table had a cover made out of a beautiful oilcloth with a red and blue spread eagle painted on it and a painted border all around it come all the way from philadelphia they said there was some books too piled up perfectly exact on each corner of the table one was a big family bible full of pictures one was pilgrim's progress about a man that left his family it didn't say why i read considerable in it now and then the statements was interesting but tough another was friendship's offering full of beautiful stuff and poetry but i didn't read the poetry another was henry clay's speeches and another was dr gunn's family medicine which told you all about what to do if a body was sick or dead there was a hymn book and a lot of other books and there was nice split bottom chairs and perfectly sound too not bagged down in the middle and busted like an old basket they had pictures hung on the walls, mainly Washingtons and Lafayettes, and Battles and Highland Marys, and one called Signing the Declaration. There was some that they called crayons, which one of the daughters which was dead made her own self when she was only fifteen years old. They was different from any pictures I ever seen before, black or mostly. That is common. One was a woman in a slim black dress built tits small under the armpits with bulges like a cabbage in the middle of the sleeves and a large black scoop shovel bonnet with a black veil and white slim ankles crossed about with black tape and very wee black slippers like a chisel and she was leaning pensive on a tombstone on her right elbow under a weeping willow and her other hand hanging down her side holding a white handkerchief and a rectical and underneath the picture it said shall i never see thee more alas another one was a young lady with her hair all combed up straight to the top of her head and nodded there in front of a comb like a chair back and she was crying into a handkerchief and had a dead bird laying on its back and her other hand with its heels up and underneath the picture it said i shall never hear thy sweet chirp more alas there was one where a young lady was at a window looking up at the moon and tears running down her cheeks and she had an open letter in one hand with a black sealing wax showing on one edge of it and she was mashing a locket with a chain to it against her mouth and underneath the picture it said 
and aren't thou gone yes thou art gone alas these were all nice pictures i reckon but i didn't somehow seem to take to them because if ever i was down a little they always give me the fantods everybody was sorry she died because she had laid out a lot more of these pictures to do and a body could see by what she had done what they had lost but i reckon that with her disposition she was having a better time in the graveyard she was at work on what they said was her greatest picture when she took sick and every day and every night it was her prayer to be allowed to live till she got it done but she never got the chance it was a picture of a young woman in a long white gown standing on the rail of a bridge all ready to jump off with her hair all down her back and looking up to the moon with the tears running down her face and she had two arms folded across her breast and two arms stretched out in front and two more reaching up towards the moon and the idea was to see which pair would look best and then scratch out the other arms but as i was saying she died before she got her mind made up and now they kept this picture over the head of the bed in her room and every time her birthday come they hung flowers on it other times it was hid with a little curtain the young woman in the picture had a kind of a nice sweet face but there was so many arms it made her look too spidery seemed to me this young girl kept a scrapbook when she was alive and used to paste obituaries and accidents and cases of patient suffering in it out of the presbyterian observer and write poetry after them out of her own head it was very good poetry this is what she wrote about a boy by the name of stephen dowling botts that fell down a well and was drowned oh to stephen dowling botts deceased and did young stephen sicken and did young stephen die and did the sad hearts thicken and did the mourners cry no such was not the fate of young stephen dowling botts though sad hearts round him thickened twas not from sickness shots no whooping cough did rack his frame nor measles drear with spots not these impaired the sacred name of stephen dowling botts despised love struck not with woe that head of curly knots nor stomach troubles laid him low young stephen dowling botts oh no then list with tearful eye whilst i his fate do tell his soul did from this cold world fly by falling down a well they got him out and emptied him alas it was too late his spirit was gone for to sport aloft in the realms of the good and great if emmeline granford could make poetry like that before she was fourteen there ain't no telling what she could a done by and by buck said she could rattle off poetry like nothing she didn't ever have to stop to think he said she would slap down a line and if she couldn't find anything to rhyme with it would just scratch it out and slap down another one and go ahead she weren't particular she could write about anything you choose to give to her to write about just so it was sadful every time a man died or a woman died or a child died she would be on hand with her tribute before he was cold she called them tributes the neighbor said it was the doctor first then emmeline then the undertaker the undertaker never got in ahead of emmeline but once and then she hung fire on a rhyme for the dead person's name which was whistler she weren't ever the same after that she never complained but she kinder pined away and did not live long poor thing many's the time i made myself go up to the little room that used to be hers and get out her poor scrapbook and read in it when her pictures had been aggravating me and i had soured on her a little i liked all that family dead ones and all and weren't going to let anything come between us poor emmeline made poetry about all the dead people when she was alive and it didn't seem right that there weren't nobody to make some about her now she was gone so i tried to sweat out a verse or two myself but i couldn't seem to make it go somehow 
they kept emmeline's room trim and nice and all the things fixed in it just the way she liked to have them when she was alive and nobody ever slept there the old lady took care of the room herself though there was plenty of niggers and she sewed there a good deal and read her bible there mostly well as i was saying about the parlor there was beautiful curtains on the windows white with pictures painted on them of castles with vines all down the walls and cattle coming down to drink there was a little old piano too that had ten pans in it i reckon and nothing was ever so lovely as to hear the young lady sing the last link is broken and play the battle of prague on it the walls of all the rooms was plastered and most had carpets on the floors and the whole house was whitewashed on the outside it was a double house and the big open place betwixt them was roofed and floored and sometimes the table was set there in the middle of the day and it was a cool comfortable place nothing couldn't be better and weren't the cooking good in just bushels of it too End of chapter seventeen Chapter eighteen of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter eighteen Colonel Grangerford Aristocracy Feuds The Testament Recovering the Raft The Woodpile Pork and Cabbage Colonel Grangerford was a gentleman, you see. He was a gentleman all over, and so was his family. He was well born, as the saying is, and that's worth as much in a man as it is in a horse, so the widow Douglas said, and nobody ever denied that she was of the first aristocracy in our town. And Pop, he always said it too, though he weren't no more quality than a mud cat himself. Colonel Grangerford was very tall and very slim, and had a darkish paley complexion, not a sign of red in it anywheres. He was clean-shaved every morning, all over his thin face, and he had the thinnest kind of lips, and the thinnest kind of nostrils, and a high nose, and heavy eyebrows, and the blackest kind of eyes sunk so deep back that they seemed like they was looking out of caverns at you, as you may say his forehead was high and his hair was black and straight and hung to his shoulders his hands was long and thin and every day of his life he put on a clean shirt and a full suit from head to foot made out of linen so white it hurt your eyes to look at it and on sundays he wore a blue tail coat with brass buttons on it he carried a mahogany cane with a silver head to it there weren't no frivolousness about him not a bit and he weren't ever loud he was as kind as he could be you could feel that you know and so you had confidence sometimes he smiled and it was good to see but when he straightened himself up like a liberty pole and the lightning begun to flicker out from under his eyebrows you wanted to climb a tree first and find out what the matter was afterwards he didn't ever have to tell anybody to mind their manners everybody was always good-mannered where he was everybody loved to have him around too he was sunshine most always i mean he made it seem like good weather when he turned into a cloud bank it was awful dark for half a minute and that was enough there wouldn't nothing go wrong again for a week when him and the old lady come down in the morning all the family got up out of their chairs and give them good day and didn't sit down again till they had sat down then tom and bob went to the sideboard where the decanter was and mixed a glass of bitters and handed it to him and he held it in his hand and waited till tom's and bob's was mixed and then they bowed and said our, our duty, duty to you sir and madam. madam and they bowed the least bit in the world and said thank you and so they drank all three and bob and tom
poured a spoonful of water on the sugar, and a mite of whiskey or apple brandy in the bottom of their tumblers, and give it to me and Buck, and we drank to the old people too. Bob was the oldest, and Tom next, tall, beautiful men, with very broad shoulders and brown faces, and long black hair and black eyes. They dressed in white linen from head to foot, like the old gentleman, and wore broad Panama hats. Then there was Miss Charlotte. She was twenty-five, and tall and proud and grand, but as good as she could be when she weren't stirred up, but when she was, she had a look that would make you wilt in your tracks like her father. She was beautiful. So was her sister, Miss Sophia, but it was a different kind. She was gentle and sweet, like a dove, and she was only twenty. Each person had their own nigger to wait on them, Buck too. My nigger had a monstrous easy time, because I weren't used to having anybody do anything for me. But Buck's was on the jump most of the time. This was all there was of the family now, but there used to be more. Three sons, they got killed, and Emmeline that died. The old gentleman owned a lot of farms, and over a hundred niggers. Sometimes a stack of people would come there, horseback, from ten or fifteen mile around, and stay five or six days, and have such junketings around about and on the river, and dances and picnics in the woods daytimes, and the balls at the house nights. These people was mostly kinfolks of the family. The men brought their guns with them. It was a handsome lot of quality, I tell you. There was another clan of aristocracy around there, five or six families, mostly of the name of Shepherdson. They was as high-toned and well-born and rich and grand as the tribe of Grangerfords. The Shepherdsons and the Grangerfords used the same steamboat landing, which was about two mile above our house. So sometimes when I went up there with a lot of our folks, I used to see a lot of the Shepherdsons there on their fine horses. One day, Buck and me was away out in the woods hunting, and heard a horse coming. We was crossing the road. Buck says, Quick, jump for the woods. We done it, and then peeped down the woods through the leaves. Pretty soon a splendid young man came galloping down the road, setting his horse easy and looking like a soldier. He had his gun across his pommel. I had seen him before. It was young Harness Shepherdson. I heard Buck's gun go off at my ear, and Harney's hat tumbled off of his head. He grabbed his gun and rode straight to the place where we was hid. But we didn't wait. We started through the woods on a run. The woods weren't thick, so I looked over my shoulder to dodge the bullet, and twice I seen Harney cover Buck with his gun, and then he rode away the way he come to get his hat. I reckon, but I couldn't see. We never stopped running till we got home. The old gentleman's eyes blazed a minute. Twas pleasure mainly, I judged. Then his face sort of smoothed down, and he says, kind of gentle, I don't like that shooting from behind a bush. Why don't you step into the road, my boy? The Shepherdsons don't, father. They always take advantage. Miss Charlotte, she had her head up like a queen while Buck was telling his tale, and her nostrils spread and her eyes snapped. The two young men looked dark, but never said nothing. Miss Sophia turned pale, but the color come back when she found the man wasn't hurt. Soon as I could get Buck down, by the corn cribs, under the trees by ourselves, I says, Did you want to kill him, Buck? Well, I bet I did. What did he do to you? Him? He's never done nothing to me. Well, then, what did you want to kill him for? Why, nothing. Only it's on the count of the feud. What's a feud? Why, where was you raised? Don't you know what a feud is? Never heard of it before. Tell me about it. Well, says Buck, a feud is this way. Man has a quarrel with another man and kills him, and that other man's brother kills him and then the other brothers on both sides goes for one another. Then the cousins chip in, 
and by and by everyone's killed off, and there ain't no more feud. But it's kind of slow and takes a long time. Has this one been going on long, Buck? Well, I should reckon. It started thirty year ago, or summers along there. There was trouble about something, and then a lawsuit to settle it, and then the suit went again, one of the men. And so he up and shot the man who won the suit, which he would naturally do, of course. Anyone would. What was the trouble about, Buck? Land? I reckon maybe. I don't know. Well, who done the shooting? Was it a Grangerford or a Shepherdson? Laws? How do I know? So long ago. Don't anybody know? Oh, yes, Pa knows, I reckon, and some of the other old people, but they don't know what now what this row was about in the first place. Has there been many killed, Buck? Yes, right smart chance of funerals, but they don't always kill. Pa's got a few buckshot in him, but he don't mind it cause he don't weigh much anyway. Pa's been carged up some with a bowie, and Tom's been hurt once or twice. Has anybody been killed this year, Buck? Yes, we got one and they got one. About three months ago, my cousin Bud, 14-year-old, was riding through the woods on the other side of the river and didn't have no weapon with him, which was blame foolish. In a lonesome place, he hears a horse coming behind him and sees old Baldy Shepherdson a linking after him with his gun in his hand and his white hair a-flying in the wind. Instead of jumping off and taking to the brush, Bud loud he could outrun him. So they had it, nip and tuck for five mile or more. The old man again in all the time, so at last Bud seen it weren't any use, and so he stopped and faced around, so as to have the bullet holes in the front, you know. And the old man he rode up and shot him down, but he didn't get much chance to enjoy his luck. For inside of a week, our folks laid him out. I reckon that old man was a coward, Buck. I reckon he weren't a coward, not by a blame sight. There ain't a coward amongst them, Shepherdsons, not a one. And there ain't no cowards amongst the Granger Fords, either. While that old man kept up his end in a fight one day, for well, half an hour against three Granger Fords, he came out winner. There was all a horse pack, and he lit off his horse and got behind a little wood pile and kept his horse for him to stop the bullets. But the Granger Ford stayed on their horses and capered around the old man, peppered away at him. He peppered away at them. Him and his horse both went home pretty leaky and crippled. The Granger Fords had to be fetched home, and one of them was dead. And the other died the next day. No, sir, the body's out hunting for cowards. He don't want to fool away any time amongst them Shepherdsons, because they don't breed any of that kind. Next Sunday, we all went to church, about three mile, everybody a horseback. The men took their guns along, so did Buck, and kept them between their knees or stood them handy against the wall. The Shepherdsons done the same. It was pretty ornery preaching, all about brotherly love and such like tiresomeness, but everybody said it was a good sermon, and they all talked it over going home and had such a powerful lot to say about faith and good works and free grace and pray for ordinance station. And I don't know what all, but it did seem to me to be one of the roughest Sundays I had run across yet. About an hour after dinner, everybody was dozing around, some in their chairs and some in their rooms, and it got to be pretty dull. Buck and a dog was stretched out on the grass in the sun sound asleep. I went up to our room, and I judged I would take a nap myself. I found that sweet Miss Sophia standing in her door, which was next to ours, and she took me in her room and shut the door very soft, and asked me if I liked her, and I said I did, and she asked me if I would do something for her and not tell anybody. I said I would. Then she said she'd forget her testament and left it in the seat at church between two other books, and would I slip out quiet and go there and fetch it for her, and not say nothing to nobody. I said I would, 
so I slipped out and slipped off up the road, and there weren't anybody at the church, except maybe a hog or two, for there weren't any lock on the door, and hogs likes a punchin' floor in summertime because it's cool. If you notice, most folks don't go to church only when they've got to, but a hog, it's different. Says I to myself, some things up. It ain't natural for a girl to be in such a sweat about a testament. So I give it a shake, and out drops a little piece of paper, with half past two wrote on it with a pencil. I ransacked it, but couldn't find anything else. I couldn't make anything out of that, so I put the paper in the book again, and when I got home and upstairs there was Miss Sophia in her door waiting for me. She pulled me in and shut the door. Then she took in the testament till she found the paper, and as soon as she read it she looked glad, and before a body could think she grabbed me and gave me a squeeze and said I was the best boy in the world, and not to tell anybody. She was mighty red in the face for a minute, and her eyes lighted up, and it made her powerful pretty. I was a good deal astonished, but when I got my breath, I asked her what the paper was about, and she asked me if I had read it, and I said no, and she asked me if I could read writing, and I told her no, only coarse hand, and then she said the paper weren't anything but a bookmark to keep her place, and I might go and play now. I went off down to the river, studying over this thing, and pretty soon I noticed that my nigger was following along behind. When he was out of sight of the house, he looked back and around a second, and then comes a running, and says, Mars Judge, if you'll come down into the swamp, I'll show you a whole stack of water moccasins. Thinks I, that's mighty curious. He said that yesterday. He ought or know a body don't love water moccasins enough to go around hunting for them. What is he up to anyway? So I says, all right, trot ahead. I followed a half a mile. Then he stuck out over the swamp, and he waded ankle deep as much as another half mile. We come to a little flat piece of land, which was dry and very thick, with trees and bushes and vines, and he says, You shall ride in there just a few steps, Mars Judge. Dar's what day is. I seed him before. I don't care to see him no more. Then he slopped right along and went away, and pretty soon the trees hid him. I poked into the place a ways, and come to a little open patch, as big as a bedroom all hung around with vines, and found a man lying there asleep, and, by jigs, it was my old Jim. I waked him up, and I reckoned it was going to be a grand surprise to him to see me again, but it weren't. He nearly cried. He was so glad, but he weren't surprised. Said he swum along behind me that night, and heard me yell every time, but doesn't answer, because he didn't want nobody to pick him up and take him into slavery again. Says he, I got hurt a little and couldn't swim fast, so I was a considerable ways behind you, de lass. When you landed, I reckoned I could catch up with you on de land, bout having to shout at you, but when I see dat house, I begin to go slow. I was off too fur to hear what they say to you. I was afraid of de dogs, but... When I is all quiet again, I knowed you's in de house, so I struck out for the woods and to wait for day. Early in the morning, some of the niggers come along, going to the fields, and they tuck me and showed me this place, while the dogs can't track me on account of the water, and they brings me a truck to eat every night and tells me how you's getting along. Why didn't you tell my Jack to fetch me here sooner, Jim? Well, twa'n't no use to disturb you, Huck, till we could do something. But we's all right now. I been a buying pots and pans and vittles as I got a chance, and a patching up the raft nights when. What raft, Jim? Our old raft. You mean to say our old raft weren't smashed all to flinders? No, she wa'n't. She were tore up a good deal. One end of her was, 
but there want no great harm done only our traps was most all loss if we hadn't dived so deep and swum so fur under water and the night hadn't been so dark and we want so scared and been such pumpkin heads as the saying is we'd have seed the raft but it's just as well we didn't case now she's all fixed up again most as good as new and we's got a new lot of stuff in the place of what was lost why how did you get hold of the raft again jim did you catch her how i going to catch her and i out in the woods no some of the niggers found her catched on a snag along here in the bend and they hid her in a crick amongst the willows and they was so much jawn about which an um she belonged to the most that i come to hear about it pretty soon so i ups and settles the trouble by telling em she don't belong to none of em but to you and me and i asked em if they going to grab a young white gentleman's property and get a hiding for it then i gin em ten cents apiece and they is pretty well satisfied and wist some more rafts that come along and make em rich again they's mighty good to me decent niggers is whatever i wants em to do for me i don't have to ask em twice honey dat jack's a good nigger and, and pretty smart yes he is he ain't ever told me you was here told me to come and how'd he show me a lot of water moccasins if anything happens he ain't mixed up in it he can say he never seen us together and it'll be the truth i don't want to talk of much about the next day i reckoned i'll cut it pretty short i waked up about dawn and was a-goin to turn over and go to sleep again when i noticed how still it was didn't seem to be anybody stirring that weren't usual next i noticed that buck was up and gone well i gets up a-wondering and goes downstairs nobody around everything was still as a mouse just the same outside thinks i what does it mean down by the woodpile i comes across my jack and says what's all it about says he don't you know mars judge no says i i don't well then miss sophia's run off did she has she run off in de night some time nobody don't know jis when run off to get married to dat young harney shepherdson you know least way so dey speck the family found out about half an hour ago well, maybe a little more and i tell you dey warn't no time lost sich another hurrying up guns and hosses you never see de women folks has gone for to stir up de relations and old miss saul and de boys took they guns and rode up de river road for to try to catch dat young man and kill him or he can get across de river with miss sophia i reck they gwine to be mighty rough times buck went off without waking me up well i reck they did they don't gwine to mix you up in it mars buck he loaded up his gun and loud he's gwine to fetch home a shepherdson or bust well there'll be plenty of em da i reckon and you bet he'll fetch one if he gets a chance i took up the river road as hard as i could put by and by i began to hear guns a good ways off when i come in sight of the log store and the wood pile where the steamboats lands i worked along under the trees and brush till i got to a good place and then i clumb up into the forks of a cottonwood that was out of reach and watched there was a wood rank four foot high a little ways in front of the tree and first i was going to hide behind that but maybe it was luckier i didn't there was four or five men cavorting around on their horses in the open place before the log store cussing and yelling and trying to get at a couple of young chaps that was behind the wood rank alongside of the steamboat landing but they couldn't come it 
every time one of them showed himself on the riverside of the woodpile he got shot at the two boys was squatting back to back behind the woodpile so they could watch both ways by and by the men stopped cavorting around and yelling they started riding towards the store then up gets one of the boys draws a steady bead over the wood rank and drops one of them out of his saddle all of the men jump off their horses and grab the hurt one and started to carry him to the store in that minute the two boys started to run they got halfway to the tree i was in before the men noticed then the men see them and jumped on their horses and took off after them they gained on the boys but it didn't do no good the boys had too good a start they got to the wood pile that was in front of my tree and slipped in behind it and so they had the bulge on the men again one of the boys was buck and the other was a slim young chap about nineteen years old the men ripped around a while and then rode away as soon as they was out of sight i sung out to buck and told him he didn't know what to make of my voice coming out of the tree at first he was awful surprised he told me to watch out sharp and let him know when the men comes in sight again said they was up to some devilment or another wouldn't be gone long i wished i was out of that tree but i doesn't come down buck began to cry and rip and load that him and his cousin joe that was the other young chap would make up for this day yet he said his father and his two brothers was killed and two were three of the enemy said the shepherdsons laid for them in ambush buck said his father and brothers ought to be waited for their relations the shepherdsons was too strong for them i asked him what was become of young harney and miss sophia they said they got across the river and was safe i was glad of that but the way buck did take on because he didn't manage to kill harney that day he shot at him i ain't ever heard anything like it all of a sudden bang 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 goes three or four guns the men had slipped around through the woods and come in from behind without their horses the boys jumped for the river both of them hurt and as they swum down the current the men run along the bank shooting at them and singing out kill them kill them it made me so sick i most fell out of the tree i ain't a-goin to tell all that happened it would make me sick again if i was to do that i wished i hadn't ever come ashore that night to see such things i ain't ever goin to get shut of them lots of times i dreamed about them i stayed in the tree till it began to get dark afraid to come down sometimes i heard guns away off in the woods and twice i seen little gangs of men gallop past the log store with guns so i reckon the trouble was still a goin on i was mighty downhearted so i made up my mind i wouldn't ever go a near that house again because i reckoned i was to blame somehow i judged that that piece of paper meant that miss sophia was to meet harness somewheres at half past two and run off and i judged i ought to told her father about that paper and the curious way she acted and then maybe he would a locked her up and this awful mess wouldn't ever happened when i got down out of the tree i crept along down the river bank a piece and found the two bodies laying in the edge of the water and tugged at them till i got them ashore then i covered up their faces and got away as quick as i could i cried a little when i was covering up buck's face for he was mighty good to me it was just dark now i never went near the house but struck through the woods and made for the swamp jim weren't on his island so i tramped off in a hurry for the crick and crowded through the willows red hot to jump aboard and get out of that awful country the raft was gone my souls but i was scared i couldn't get my breath for most a minute then i raised a yell a voice not twenty-five foot from me says good land is that you honey don't make no noise it was jim's voice nothing ever sounded so good before 
I run along the bank a piece and got aboard, and Jim, he grabbed me and hugged me. He was so glad to see me. He says, Laws bless you, child. I's right down show sure you's dead again. Jack's been here. He say he's reckon you's been shot case you didn't come home no more. So I's just dis minute a startin to raft down toward de mouth of de crick, so's to be all ready for to shove out and leave soon as Jack comes again, and tells me for certain you is dead. Lawsy, I's mighty glad to get you back again, honey. I says, all right, that's mighty good. They won't find me, and they'll think I've been killed and floated down the river. There's something up there that'll help them think so. So don't you lose no time, Jim, but just shove off for the big water as fast as ever you can. I never felt easy till the raft was two miles below there and out in the middle of the Mississippi. Then we hung up our signal lantern and judged that we was free and safe once more. I hadn't had a bite to eat since yesterday, so Jim, he got out some corn dodgers and buttermilk and pork and cabbage and greens. There ain't nothing in the world so good when it's cooked right. And whilst I eat my supper, we talked and had a good time. I was powerful glad to get away from the feuds, and so was Jim to get away from the swamp. He said there weren't no home like a raft after all. Other places do seem so cramped up and smothery, but a raft don't. You feel mighty free and easy and comfortable on a raft. End of chapter 18「Of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 19 Tying Up Daytimes An Astronomical Theory Running a Temperance Revival The Duke of Bridgewater The Troubles of Royalty Two or three days and nights went by. I reckoned I might say they swum by. They slid along so quiet and smooth and lovely. Here is the way we put in the time. It was a monstrous big river down there, sometimes a mile and a half wide. We run nights and laid up and hid daytimes. Soon as night was most gone, we stopped navigating and tied up. Nearly always in the dead water, under a towhead, and then cut young cottonwoods and willows, and hid the raft with them. Then we set out the lines. Next we slid into the river and had a swim, so as to freshen up and cool off. Then we sat down on the sandy bottom, where the water was about knee-deep, and watched the daylight come. Not a sound anywheres, perfectly still, just like the whole world was asleep. Only sometimes the bullfrogs are cluttering, maybe. The first thing to see, looking away over the water, was a kind of dull line. That was the woods on t other side. You couldn't make nothing else out. Then a pale place in the sky. Then more paleness spreading around. Then the river softened up a way off, and weren't black any more, but gray. You could see little dark spots drifting along ever so far away trading scows and such things and long black streaks rafts sometimes you could hear a sweep squeaking or jumbled up voices it was so still and sounds come so far and by and by you could see a streak on the water which you know by the look of the streak that there's a snag there in the swift current which breaks on it and makes that streak look that way and if you see the mist curl up off the water, and the east reddens up, and the river, and you make out a log cabin in the edge of the woods, away on the bank on t other side of the river, being a wood yard, likely, and piled by them cheats, so you can throw a dog through it anywheres, then the nice breeze springs up, and comes fanning you from over there, so cool and fresh and sweet to smell on account of the woods, in the flowers, but sometimes not that way, because they've left dead fish lying around, 
gars and such, and they do get pretty rank, and next you've got this full day, and everything smiling in the sun, and the songbirds just going it. A little smoke couldn't be noticed now, so we would take some fish off of the lines and cook up a hot breakfast, and afterwards we would watch the lonesomeness of the river, and kind of lazy along, and by and by lazy off to sleep wake up by and by and look to see what done it and maybe see a steamboat coughing along upstream so far as toward the other side you couldn't tell nothing about her only whether she was a stern wheel or a side wheel then for about an hour there wouldn't be nothing to hear nor nothing to see just solid lonesomeness next you'd see your raft sliding by away off yonder and maybe a galoot on it chopping because they're most always doing it on the raft you see the axe flash and come down you don't hear nothing you see that axe go up again and by the time it's above a man's head then you hear the crunk it had took all that time to come over the water so we would put in the day lazying around listening to the stillness once there was a thick fog and the rafts and things that went by was beating tin pans so the steamboats wouldn't run over them a scow or a raft went by so close we could hear them talking and cussing and laughing heard them plain but we couldn't see no sign of them it made you feel crawly it was like spirits carrying on that way in the air jim said he believed it was spirits but i says no spirits wouldn't say durn the durn fog soon as it was night out we shoved when we got her out to about the middle we let her alone and let her float wherever the current wanted her to then we lit the pipes and dangled our legs in the water and talked about all kinds of things we was always naked day and night whenever the mosquitoes would let us the new clothes buck's folks made for me was too good to be comfortable and besides i didn't go much on clothes nohow sometimes we'd have that whole river all to ourselves for the longest time yonder was the banks and the islands across the water and maybe a spark which was a candle in a cabin window and sometimes on the water you could see a spark or two on a raft or a scow you know and maybe you could hear a fiddle or a song coming over from one of them crafts it's lovely to live on a raft we had the sky up there all speckled with stars and we used to lay on our backs and look up at them and discuss about whether they was made or only just happened jim he allowed they was made but i allowed they happened i judged it would have took too long to make so many jim said the moon could a laid them well that looked kind of reasonable so i didn't say nothing against it because i've seen a frog lay most as many so of course it could be done we used to watch the stars that fell too and see them streak down jim allowed they'd got spoiled and was hove out of the nest once or twice of a night we would see a steamboat slipping along in the dark and now and then she would belch a whole world of sparks up out of her chimbleys and they would rain down in the river and look awful pretty then she would turn a corner and her lights would wink out and her powwow shut off and leave the river still again and by and by her waves would get to us a long time after she was gone and juggle a raft a bit and after that you wouldn't hear nothing for you couldn't tell how long except maybe frogs or something after midnight the people on shore went to bed and then for two or three hours the shores was black no more sparks in the cabin windows these sparks was our clock the first one that showed again meant morning was coming so we hunted a place to hide and tie up right away one morning about daybreak i found a canoe and crossed over a chute to the main shore it was only two hundred yards and paddled about a mile up a creek 
amongst the cypress woods to see if i couldn't get some berries just as i was passing a place where a kind of a cow path crossed the crick here comes a couple of men tearing up the path as tight as they could foot it i thought i was a goner for whenever anybody was after anybody i judged it was me or maybe jim i was about to dig out from there in a hurry but they was pretty close to me then and sung out and begged me to save their lives said they hadn't been doing nothing and was being chased for it said there was men and dogs a coming they wanted to jump right in but i says don't you do it i don't hear the dogs and horses yet you've got time to crowd through the brush and get up the crick a little ways then you take to the water and wade down to me and get in that'll throw the dogs off the scent they done it and soon as they was aboard i let out for our towhead and in about five or ten minutes we heard the dogs and the men away off shouting we heard them come along toward the crick but couldn't see them they seemed to stop and fool around a while then as we got further and further away all the time we couldn't hardly hear them at all by the time we had left the mile of the woods behind us and struck the river everything was quiet and we paddled over to the towhead and hid in the cottonwoods and was safe one of these fellows was about seventy or upwards and had a bald head and very gray whiskers he had an old battered up slouch hat on and a greasy blue woolen shirt and ragged old blue jeans breeches stuffed into his boot tops and home knit galooshes no he only had one he had an old long-tailed blue jeans coat with slick brass buttons flung over his arm and both of them had big fat ratty looking carpet bags the other fellow was about thirty and dressed about as ornery after breakfast we all laid off and talked and the first thing that comes out was that these chaps didn't know one another what got you into trouble says the bald-headed to to other chap well i'd been selling an article to take the tartar off the teeth and it does take it off too and generally the enamel along with it but i stayed about one night longer than i ought to and was just in the act of sliding out when i ran across you on the trail this side of town and you told me they were coming and begged me to help you to get off so i told you i was expecting trouble myself and would scatter out with you that's the whole yarn what's yawn well i'd been running a little temperance revival there about a week and was the pet of the women folk big and little for i was making it mighty warm for the rummies i tell ya and taken as much as five or six dollars a night ten cents a head children and diggers free and business a growin all the time when somehow or another a little report got around last night that i had a way of put in my time with a private jug on the sly a nigger roused me out this morning and told me the people was gatherin on the quiet with their dogs and horses and they'd be along pretty soon and give me bout half hours start and then run me down if they could and if they got me they'd tar and feather me and ride me out on a rail sure i didn't wait for no breakfast i weren't hungry old man said the young one i reckon we might double team it together what do you think i ain't undisposed what's your line mainly you are a printer by trade do a little in patent medicines theatre actor tragedy you know take a turn to mesmerism and phrenology when there's a chance teach singing geography school for a change sling a lecture sometimes oh i do lots of things most anything that comes handy so it ain't work what's your lay i've done considerable in the doctoring way in my time laying on our hands is my best halt for cancer and paralysis and sich things and i can tell you a fortune pretty good when i've got someone along to find out the facts for me preachin's my line too and workin camp meetin's and missionarying around nobody ever said anything for a while then the young man hove a sigh and says alas what are you alasin about says the bald head to think i should have lived to be leading such a life and be degraded down into such company 
and he begun to wipe the corner of his eye with a rag. Durn your skin. Ain't the company good enough for you? Says the bald head, pretty pert and uppish. Yes, it is good enough for me. It's as good as I deserve. For who fetched me so low when I was so high? I did myself. I don't blame you, gentlemen. Far from it. I don't blame anybody. I deserve it all. Let the cold world do its worst. One thing I know. There's a grave somewhere for me. The world may go on just as it's always done, and take everything from me. Loved ones, property, everything. But it can't take that. Some day I'll lie down in it and forget it all, and my poor broken heart will be at rest. He went on a-wiping. Drop your poor broken heart, says the bald head. What are you heaving your poor broken heart at us for? We ain't done nothing. No, I know you haven't. I ain't blaming you, gentlemen. I brought myself down. Yes, I did it myself. It's right I should suffer. Perfectly right. I don't make any moan. Brought you down from war? War was you brought down from? Ah, uh, you would not believe me. The world never believes. Let it pass. Tis no matter. The secret of my birth. The secret of your birth? Do you mean to say? Gentlemen, says the young man, very solemn. I will reveal it to you, for I feel I may have confidence in you. By rights, I am a duke. Jim's eyes bugged out when he heard that, and I reckon mine did too. Then the bald head says, No, you can't mean it. Yes, my great-grandfather, eldest son of the Duke of Bridgewater, fled to this country about the end of the last century to breathe the pure air of freedom, married here, and died, leaving a son, his own father dying about the same time. The second son of the late duke seized the titles and estates. The infant real duke was ignored. I am the lineal descendant of that infant. I am the rightful duke of Bridgewater, and here am I, forlorn, torn from my high estate, hunted of men, despised by the cold world, ragged, worn, heartbroken, and degraded to the companionship of felons on a raft. Jim pitied him ever so much, and so did I. We tried to comfort him, but he said it weren't much use. He couldn't be much comforted, said if we was a mind to acknowledge him, that would do him more good than most anything else. So we said we would, if he would tell us how. He said we ought to bow when we spoke to him and say, Your Grace, or My Lord, or Your Lordship. And he wouldn't mind if we called him plain Bridgewater, which he said was a title anyway, and not a name, and one of us ought to wait on him at dinner and do any little thing for him he wanted done. Well, that was all easy, so we done it. All through dinner, Jim stood around and waited on him, and says, Will your grace have some of this, or some of that? And so on, and a body could see it was mighty pleasing to him. But the old man got pretty silent by and by, didn't have much to say, and didn't look pretty comfortable over all that petting that was going on around that duke. He seemed to have something on his mind. So, along in the afternoon, he says, Looky here, Bill Jordan, he says, I'm nation sorry for you, but you ain't the only person that's had troubles like that. No? No, you ain't. You ain't the only person that's been snaked down wrongfully out in a high place. Alas. No, you ain't the only person that's had a secret of his birth. And by jigs, he begins to cry. Hold, what do you mean? Bilgewater, can I trust you? Says the old man, still sort of sobbing. To the bitter death. He took the old man by the hand and squeezed it and says, that secret of your being. Speak. Bilgewater, I am the late Dolphin. I bet you, Jim and me stared this time. Then the Duke says, You are what? Yes, my friends, it is true. Your eyes are looking at the very moment on the poor disappeared Dolphin. Louis the Seventeenth? 
son of Louis the Sixteenth, and Marie Antoinette. You? At your age? No. You mean you're the late Charlemagne. You must be six or seven hundred years old, at the very least. Trouble has done it, Bilgewater. Trouble has done it. Trouble has brung the grey hairs and this premature baltitude. Yes, gentlemen, you see before you, in blue jeans and misery, the wandering, exiled, trampled upon, and suffering, wrathful king of France. Well, he cried, and took on so that me and Jim didn't know hardly what to do. We was so sorry, and so glad and proud, we'd got him with us too. So we set in, like we done before with the duke, and try to comfort him, but he said it weren't no use, nothing but to be dead and done with it all could do him any good, though he said it often made him feel easier and better for a while if people treated him according to his rights, and got down on one knee to speak to him, and always called him your majesty, and waited on him first at meals, and didn't sit down in his presence till he asked them. So Jim and me set to majestying him, and doing this and that and to other for him, and standing up, till he told us we might sit down. This done him's heaps of good, and so he got cheerful and comfortable, but the duke kind of scoured on him, and didn't look a bit satisfied with the way things was going. Still, the king acted real friendly toward him, and said the duke's great-grandfather and all the other dukes of Billagewater was a good deal thought of by his father, and was allowed to come to the palace considerable. But the duke stayed huffy a good while, till by and by the king says, Like as not we got to be together a blamed long time on this her raft, Bilgewater, and so what's the use o' your being so sour? It'll only make things uncomfortable. It ain't my fault I weren't born a duke. It ain't your fault you weren't born a king. So what's the use to worry? Make the best of things the way ye find em, says I. That's my motto. This ain't no bad thing that we've struck here. Plenty grub and easy life. Come, give us your hand, Duke, and let's all be our friends. The Duke done it, and Jim and me was pretty glad to see it. It took away all the uncomfortableness, and we felt mighty good over it because it would have been a miserable business to have any unfriendliness on the raft. For what you want, above all things, on a raft, is for everybody to be satisfied, and feel right and kind towards the others. It didn't take me long to make up my mind that these liars weren't no kings nor dukes at all, but just low-down humbugs and frauds. But I never said nothing, never let on, kept it to myself. It's the best way. Then you don't have no quarrels, and don't get into no trouble. If they wanted us to call them kings and dukes, I hadn't no objections, long as it would keep peace in the family. And it weren't no use to tell Jim, so I didn't tell him. If I never learnt nothing else out of Pap, I learned that the best way to get along with this kind of people is to let them have their own way. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20 of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 20 Huck Explains. Laying out a campaign. Working the camp meeting. A pirate at the camp meeting. The duke as a printer. They asked us considerable many questions. Wanted to know what we covered up the raft that way for, and laid by in the daytime instead of running. Was Jim a runaway nigger? Says I, goodness sakes, would a runaway nigger run south? No. They allowed he wouldn't. I had to account for things some way, so I says, my folks was living in Pike County, in Missouri, 
when I was born, and they all died off, but me and Pa and my brother Ike. Pa, he'd break up and go down and live with Uncle Ben, who's got a little one-horse place on the river, four to four mile below Orleans. Pa was pretty poor and had some debts, but when he squared up there weren't nothing left but sixteen dollars and our nigger Jim. That weren't enough to take us fourteen hundred mile deck passage nor other way well when the river rose pa had a streak of luck one day he catched this piece of a raft so we reckoned we'd go down to orleans on it pa's luck didn't hold out the steamboat run over the forward corner of the raft one night and we all went overboard and dove under the wheel jim and me come up all right but pa was drunk and ike was only four years old so they never come up no more. Well, for the next day or two, we had considerable trouble, because people was always coming out in skiffs and trying to take Jim away from me, saying they believed he was a runaway nigger. We don't run daytimes no more now. Nights, they don't bother us. The Duke says, Leave me alone to cipher out a way so we can run in the daytime if we want to. I'll think the thing over. I'll invent a plan that'll fix it. We'll let it alone for today because, of course, we don't want to go by that town yonder in daylight. It mightn't be healthy. Towards night, it begun to darken up and look like rain. The heat lightning was squirting around low down in the sky, and the leaves was beginning to shiver. It was going to be pretty ugly. It was easy to see that. So the Duke and the King went to overhauling our wigwam to see what the beds was like my bed was a straw tick better than jim's which was a corn shuck tick there's always cobs around about in the shuck tick and they poke into you and hurt and when you roll over the dry shucks sound like you was rolling over a pile of dead leaves it makes such a rustling that you wake up well the duke allowed he would take my bed but the king allowed he wouldn't, he says. I should have reckoned the difference in rank would have suggested to you that a corn shuck bed weren't just fitten for me to sleep in. Your grace'll take the shuck bed himself. Jim and me was in a sweat again for a minute, being afraid there was going to be some more trouble among them. So we was pretty glad when the duke says, "'Tis my fate to be always ground into the mire under the iron heel of oppression. Misfortune has broken my once haughty spirit. I yield, I submit, tis my fate. I am alone in the world. Let me suffer, can bear it. We got away as soon as it was good and dark. The king told us to stand well out towards the middle of the river, and not show a light till we got a long ways below the town. We come in sight of the little bunch of lights by and by, that was the town, you know, and slide by, about a half a mile out, all right. When we was three-quarters of a mile below, we hoisted up our signal lantern, and about ten o'clock it come on to rain and blow and thunder and lightning like everything. So the king told us to both stay on watch till the weather got better. Then him and the duke crawled into the wigwam and turned in for the night it was my watch below till twelve but i wouldn't a turned in anyway if i had a bed because a body don't see such a storm as that every day in the week not by a long sight my souls how the wind did scream along and every second or two there'd come a glare that lit up the white caps for about a mile around and you'd see the islands looking dusty through the rain, and the trees thrashing around in the wind. Then comes a whack. Bum, bum. Bumble, umble, bum, 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 bum. And the thunder would go a rumbling and grumbling away, and quit, and then, rip, comes another flash, and another sucked oligar. The waves most washed me off the raft sometimes, but I hadn't any clothes on, and didn't mind. We didn't have no trouble about snags. The lightning was glaring and flittering around so constant 
that we could see them plenty soon enough to throw her head this way or that and miss them i had the middle watch you know but i was pretty sleepy by that time so jim said he would stand the first half for it for me he was always mighty good that way jim was i crawled into the wigwam but the king and the duke had their legs sprawled out so there weren't no show for me so i laid outside i didn't mind the rain because it was warm and the waves weren't running so high now about two they come up again though and jim was going to call me but he changed his mind because he reckoned they weren't high enough to get to do any harm but he was mistaken about that for pretty soon all of a sudden along comes a regular ripper and watched me overboard it most killed jim a laughing he was the easiest nigger to laugh that ever was anyway i took the watch and jim he laid down and snored away and by and by the storm let up for good and all and the first cabin light that showed i roused him out and we slid the raft into hiding quarters for the day the king got out a ratty old deck of cards after breakfast and him and the duke played seven up a while five cents a game then they got tired of it and allowed they would lay out the campaign as they called it the duke went down into his carpet bag and fetched up a lot of little printed bills and read them out out loud one bill said the celebrated dr armand de montalban of paris would lecture on the science of phrenology at such and such a place on the blank day of blank at ten cents admission and furnished charts of character at twenty-five cents apiece the duke said that was him in another bill he was the world-renowned shakespearean tragedian garrick the younger or drury lane london in other bills he had a lot of other names and done other wonderful things like finding water and gold with a divining rod dissipating witch spells and so on by and by he says but the historic muse is the darling have you ever trod the boards royalty no says the king you shall then before you're three days older fallen grandeur says the duke the first good town we come to we'll hire a hall and do the sword fight in richard the third and the balcony scene in romeo and juliet how does that strike you i'm in up to the hub for anything that will pay bilgewater but you see i don't know nothing about plain actin and hain't ever seen much of it i was too small when pap used to have em at the palace do you reckon you can learn me easy all right i'm just a freezin for something fresh anyway let's commence right away so the duke he told him all about who romeo was and who juliet was and said he was used to being romeo so the king could be juliet but if juliet's such a young gal duke my peeled head and my white whiskers is going to look uncommon odd on her maybe no don't you worry these country jakes won't ever think of that besides you know you'll be in costume and that makes all the difference in the world juliet's in a balcony enjoying the moonlight before she goes to bed and she's got on her nightgown and her ruffled nightcap here are the costumes for the parts he got out two or three curtain calico suits which he said was medieval armor for richard the third and t other chap and a long white cotton nightshirt and a ruffled nightcap to match the king was satisfied so the duke got out his book and read the parts over in the most splendid spread eagle way prancing around and acting at the same time to show how it had got to be done then he give the book to the king and told him to get his part by heart there was a little one-horse town about three mile down the bend and after dinner the duke said he had ciphered out his idea about how to run in daylight without being dangerous some for jim so he allowed he would go down to town and fix that thing the king allowed he would go too and see if he couldn't strike something we was out of coffee so jim said i'd better go along with them in the canoe and get some when we got there 
there weren't nobody stirring, streets empty, and perfectly dead and still, like Sunday. We found a sick nigger sunning himself in a back yard, and he said everybody that weren't too young or too sick or too old was gone to camp meeting about two mile back in the woods. The king got the directions, and allowed he'd go and work that camp meeting for all it was worth, and I might go too. The duke said what he was after was a printing office. We found it a little bit of a concern up over a carpenter shop. Carpenters and printers all gone to the meeting, and no doors locked. It was a dirty, littered-up place, and had ink marks and handbills with pictures of horses and runaway niggers on them all over the walls. The duke shed his coat and said he was all right now, so me and the king lit out for the camp meeting. We got there in about a half an hour fairly dripping, for it was most awful hot day. There was as much as a thousand people there from twenty mile around. The woods was full of teams and wagons hitched everywheres, feeding out of the wagon troughs and stopping to keep off the flies. There was sheds made out of poles and roofed over with branches where they had lemonade and gingerbread to sell and piles of watermelons and green corn and such like truck. The preaching was going on under the same kinds of sheds, only they was bigger and held crowds of people. The benches was made out of a outside slab of logs with holes bored in the round side to drive sticks into four legs. They didn't have no backs. The preachers had high platforms to stand on at one end of the sheds. The women had on sunbonnets, and some had linsey woolly frocks. Some gingham ones, and a few of the young ones had on calico. Some of the young men was barefooted, and some of the children didn't have on any clothes but just a tow linen shirt. Some of the old women was knitting, and some of the young folks was courting on the sly. The first shed we come to, the preacher was lining out a hymn. He lined out two lines. Everybody sung it, and it was kind of grand to hear it. There was so many of them, and they done it in such a rousing way. Then he lined out two more of them to sing, and so on. The people woke up more and more, and sung louder and louder. And towards the end, some began to groan, and some began to shout. Then the preacher began to preach, and begun in earnest too, and went weaving first to one side of the platform, and then on the other, and then a-leaning down over the front of it, with his arms and his body going all the time, and shouting his words out with all his might. And every now and then he would hold up his Bible, and spread it open, and kind of pass it around this way and that, shouting, It's the brazen serpent in the wilderness! Look upon it and live! And people would shout out, Glory! Amen! And so he went on, and the people groaning, and crying, and saying Amen. Oh, come to the mourner's bench, come black with sin. Amen. Amen. Come sick and sore. Amen. Amen. Come lame and halt and blind. Amen. Amen. Come poor and needy, sunk in shame. Amen. Amen. Come all that's worn and soiled and suffering. Come with a broken spirit. Come with a contrite heart. Come in your rags and sin and dirt. The waters that cleanse is free. The door of heaven stands open. Oh, enter and be at rest. Amen. Amen. Glory, 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 hallelujah. hallelujah. And so on. You couldn't make out what the preacher said any more on account of the shouting and crying. Folks got up everywhere as in the crowd and worked their way just by main strength to the mourner's bench with the tears running down their faces and when all the mourners had got up there to the front benches in the crowd, they sung and shouted and flung themselves down on the straw, just crazy and wild. Well, the first I knowed, the king got a-going, and you could hear him over everybody, and next he went a-charging up on to the platform, and the preacher, he begged him to speak to the people, and he done it. 
he told them he was a pirate been a pirate for thirty years out in the indian ocean and his crew was thinned out considerable last spring in a fight and he was home now to take out some fresh men and thanks to goodness he'd been robbed last night and put ashore off of a steamboat without a cent and he was glad of it it was the blessedest thing that ever happened to him because he was a changed man now and happy for the first time in his life and poor as he was he was going to start right off and work his way back to the indian ocean and put the rest of his life trying to turn the pirates into the true path for he could do it better than anybody else being acquainted with all pirate crews in that ocean and though it would take him a long time to get there without money he would get there anyway and every time he convinced a pirate he would say to him don't you thank me don't you give me no credit it all belongs to them dear people in pokeville camp meeting natural brothers and benefactors of the race and that dear preacher there the truest friend a pirate ever had and then he busted into tears and so did everybody then somebody sings out take up a collection for him take up a collection well a half a dozen made up a jump to do it but somebody sings out let him pass the hat around then everybody said it the preacher too so the king went all through the crowd with his hat swabbing his eyes and blessing the peoples and praising them and thanking them for being so good to the poor pirates away off there and every little while the prettiest kind of girls with the tears running down their cheeks would up and ask him would he let them kiss him for to remember him by and he always done it and some of them he hugged and kissed as many as five or six times and he was invited to stay a week and everybody wanted him to live in their houses and said they'd think it was an honor but he said as this was the last day of the camp meeting he couldn't do no good and besides he was in a sweat to get on to the indian ocean right off and go to work on the pirates when we got back to the raft and he come to count up he found he had collected eighty seven dollars and seventy five cents and then he had fetched away a three gallon jug of whiskey too that he found under a wagon when he was starting home through the woods the king said take it all around it laid over any day he'd ever put in in the missionarying line he said it weren't no use talkin heathens don't amount to shucks alongside of pirates to work a camp meeting with the duke was thinking he'd been doing pretty well till the king come to show up but after that he didn't think so so much he had set up and printed off two little jobs for farmers in that printing office horse bills and took the money four dollars and he had got in ten dollars worth of advertisements for the paper which he said he would put in for four dollars if they would pay in advance so they done it the price of the paper was two dollars a year but he took in three subscriptions for half a dollar apiece on condition of them paying him in advance they were going to pay in cordwood and onions as usual but he said he had just bought the concern and knocked down the price as low as he could afford it and was going to run it for cash he set up a little piece of poetry which he made himself out of his own head three verses kind of sweet and saddish the name of it was yes crush cold world this breaking heart and he left that all set up and ready to print in the paper and didn't charge nothing for it well he took in nine dollars and a half and said he'd done a pretty square day's work for it then he showed us another little job he printed and hadn't charged for because it was for us it had a picture of a runaway nigger with a bundle on a stick over his shoulder and two hundred dollar reward under it the reading was all about jim and just described him to a dot it said he run away from st jacques plantation for a mile below new orleans last winter and likely went north and whoever would catch him and send him back he could have the reward and expenses now says the duke 
after tonight we can run in the daytime if we want to whenever we see anybody coming we can tie jim hand and foot with a rope and lay him in the wigwam and show this handbill and say we captured him up the river and were too poor to travel on a steamboat so we got this little raft on credit from our friends and are going down to get the reward handcuffs and chains would look still better on jim but it wouldn't go well with the story of us being so poor too much like jewelry ropes are the correct thing we must preserve the unities as we say on the boards we all said the duke was pretty smart and there couldn't be no trouble about running daytimes we judged we could make miles enough that night to get out of the reach of the powwow we reckoned that the duke's work in the printing office was going to make in that little town then we could boom right along if we wanted to we laid low and kept still and never shoved out till nearly ten o'clock then we slid by pretty wide away from the town and didn't hoist our lantern till we was clear out of sight of it when jim called me to take the watch at four in the morning he says huck do you reckon we gonna run across any more kings on this trip no i says i reckon not well says he that's all right then i don't mind one or two kings but that's enough this one's powerful drunk and the duke ain't much better i found jim had been trying to get him to talk french so he could hear what it was like but he said he had been in this country so long and had so much trouble he forgot it end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the adventures of huckleberry finn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the adventures of huckleberry finn by mark twain chapter twenty one sword exercise hamlet's soliloquy they loafed around town a lazy town old bogs dead it was after sun-up now but we went right on and didn't tie up the king and the duke turned out by and by looking pretty rusty but after they jumped overboard and took a swim it chippered them up a good deal after breakfast the king he took a seat on the corner of the raft and pulled off his boots and rolled up his breeches and let his legs dangle in the water so as to be comfortable and lit his pipe and went to getting his romeo and juliet by heart when he had got it pretty good him and the duke began to practice it together the duke had to learn him over and over again how to say every speech and he made him sigh and put his hand on his heart and after a while he said he'd done it pretty well only he says you mustn't bellow out romeo that way like a bull you must say it soft and sick and languishing so romeo that is the idea for juliet's a dear sweet mere child of a girl you know and she doesn't bray like a jackass well next they got out a couple of long swords that the duke made out of oak lads and begun to practice the sword fight the duke called himself richard the third and the way they laid on and pranced about the raft was grand to see but by and by the king tripped and fell overboard and after that they took a rest and had to talk about all kinds of adventures they'd had in other times along the river and after dinner the duke says well cap it we'll want to make this a first-class show you know so i guess we'll add a little more to it we want a little something to answer encores with anyway what's encores bilgewater the duke told him and then says i'll answer by doing the highland fling or the sailor's hornpipe and you well let me see oh i've got it you can do hamlet's soliloquy hamlet which hamlet's soliloquy you know the most celebrated thing in shakespeare ah it's sublime sublime always fetches the house i haven't got it in the book i've only got one volume but i reckon i can piece it out from memory i'll just walk up and down a minute and see if i can call it back from recollections vaults so he went to marching up and down thinking 
and frowning horrible every now and then. Then he would hoist up his eyebrows. Next he would squeeze his hand on his forehead and stagger back a kind of moan. Next he would sigh, and next he let on to drop a tear. It was beautiful to see him. By and by he got it. He told us to give attention. Then he strikes a most noble attitude, with one leg shoved forwards, and his arms stretched away up, and his head tilted back, looking up at the sky. And then he begins to rip and rave and grit his teeth. And after that, all through his speech he howled, and spread around, and swelled up his chest, and just knocked the spots out of any actor ever I have seen before. This is the speech. I learned it easy enough while he was learning it to the king to be or not to be that is the bare bodkin that makes calamity of so long life for who would fidel's bear till burnham wood do come to dunsinane but that the fear of something after death murders the innocent sleep great nature's second course and makes us rather sling the arrows of outrageous fortune than fly to others that we know not of there's the respect must give us pause wake duncan with thy knocking i would thou couldst for who would bear the whips and scorns of time the oppressor's wrong the proud man's contumony the law's delay and the quietus which his pangs might take in the dead waste and middle of the night when churchyards yawn in customary suits of solemn black but that the undiscovered country from whose bourne no traveller returns breathes forth contagion on the world and thus the native hue of resolution like the poor cat i the adage is sickled o'er with care and all the clouds that lowered o'er our housetops with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action tis a consummation devoutly to be wished but soft you the fair ophelia up not thy ponderous and marble jaws but get thee to a nunnery go well the old man he liked that speech and he might as soon got it so he could do the first rate it seemed like he was just born for it and when he had his hand in and was excited it was perfectly lovely the way he would rip and tear and rear up behind when he was getting it off the first chance he got the duke he had some show bills printed and after that for two or three days as we floated along the raft was a most uncommon lively place for there weren't nothing but sore fighting and rehearsing as the duke called it going on all the time one morning when we was pretty well down the state of arkansas we come in sight of a little one-horse town in a big bend so we tied up about three-quarters of a mile above it in the mouth of a crick which was shut in like a tunnel by the cypress trees and all of us but jim took the canoe and went down there to see if there was any chance in that place for our show we struck it mighty lucky there was going to be a circus there that afternoon and the country people was already beginning to come in in all kinds of old shaggy wagons and on horses the circus would leave before night so our show would have a pretty good chance the duke he hired the courthouse and we went around and stuck up our bills they read like this shakespearean revival wonderful attraction for one night only the world-renowned tragedians david garrick the younger of drury lane theatre london and edmund keen the elder of the royal haymarket theatre whitechapel Pudding Lane, Piccadilly, London, and the Royal Continental Theatres, and their sublime Shakespearean spectacle, entitled The Balcony Scene in Romeo and Juliet. Romeo, Mr. Garrick, Juliet, Mr. Keene, assisted by the whole strength of the company. New costumes, new scenery, new appointments. Also, the thrilling masterly and blood-curdling broadsword conflict in richard the third richard the third mr garrick richmond mr keen also by special request hamlet's immortal soliloquy by the illustrious keen 
done by him three hundred consecutive nights in Paris, but one night only, on account of imperative European engagements. Admission, twenty-five cents. Children and servants, ten cents. Then we went loafing around town. The stores and houses were most all old shackety dried up frame concerns that hadn't ever been painted. They was set up three or four foot above ground on stilts, so as to be out of reach of the water when the river was overflowed. The houses had little gardens around them, but they didn't seem to raise hardly anything in them but jimson weeds and sunflowers and ash piles and old curled up boots and shoes and pieces of bottles and rags and played out tinware the fences was made of different kinds of boards nailed on at different times and they leaned every which way and had gates that didn't generally have but one hinge a leather one some of the fences had been whitewashed some time or another but the duke said it was in columbus's time likely enough there was generally hogs in the garden and people driving them out all the stores was along one street they had white domestic awnings in front and the country people hitched their horses to the awning posts there was empty dry goods boxes under the awnings and loafers roasting on them all day long whittling them with their barlow knives and chong tobacco and gaping and yawning and stretching a mighty ornery lot they generally had on yellow straw hats most as wide as an umbrella but didn't wear no coats or waistcoats they called one another bill and a buck and hank and joe and andy and talked lazy and drawly and used considerable many cuss words there was as many as one loafer leaning up against every on and post and he most always had his hands in his breeches pockets except when he fetched them out to lend a chaw of tobacco or scratch what a body was hearing amongst them all the time was give me a chaw of tobacco hank can't i ain't got but one chaw left ask bill maybe bill he gives him a chaw sometimes he lies and says he ain't got none some of them kind of loafers never has a cent in the world nor a chaw of tobacco of their own they get all their chawing by borrowing they say to a fellow i wished you'd lend me a chaw jack i just this minute give ben thompson the last chaw i had which is a lie pretty much every time it don't fool nobody but a stranger but jack ain't no stranger so he says you give him a chaw did you so did your sister's cat's grandmother you pay me back the chaws you've already borrowed off me leif buckner then i'll loan you one or two ton of it and won't charge you no back interest nother well i did pay you back some of it once yes you did bout six chaws you borrowed stored tobacco and paid back nigger head store tobacco is flat black plug but these fellows mostly chaws the natural leaf twisted when they borrow a chaw they don't generally cut it off with a knife but set the plug in between their teeth and gnaw with their teeth and tug at the plug with their hands till they get it in two then sometimes the one that owns the tobacco looks mournful at it when it's handed back and says sarcastic here give me that chaw and you take the plug all the streets and lanes was just mud they weren't nothing else but mud mud as black as tar and nigh about a foot deep in some places and two or three inches deep in all the places the hogs loafed and grunted around everywheres you'd see a mighty sow and a litter of pigs come lazying along the street and wallop herself right down in the way where folks had to walk around her and she'd stretch out and shut her eyes and wave her ears while the pigs was milking her and look as happy as if she was on salary and pretty soon you'd hear a loafer singing out hi so boy sick him tige and away the sow would go squealing most horrible with a dog or two swinging to each ear and three or four dozen more a-coming and then you would see all the loafers get up and watch the thing out of sight and laugh at the fun and look grateful for the noise then they settled back again till there was a dog-fight 
there couldn't anything wake them up all over and make them happy all over like a dog fight unless it might be putting turpentine on a stray dog and setting fire to him or tying a tin pan to his tail and see him run himself to death on the river front some of the houses was sticking out over the bank and they was bowed and bent and about ready to tumble in the people had to move out of them the bank was caved away under one corner of some others and that corner was hanging over people lived in them yet but it was dangersome because sometimes a strip of land as wide as a house caves in at a time sometimes a belt of land a quarter of a mile deep will start in and cave along and cave along till it all caves into the river in one summer such a town as that has to be always moving back and back and back because the river's always gnawing at it the nearer it got to noon that day the thicker and thicker was the wagons and horses in the streets and more coming all the time families fetch their dinners with them from the country and eat them in the wagons there was considerable whiskey drinking going on and i see three fights by and by somebody sings out here comes old boggs in from the country for his little old monthly drunk here he comes boys all the loafers looked glad i reckon they was used to having fun out of boggs one of them says wonder who he's a gwine to chaw up this time if he'd a chawed up all the men he's been a gwine to chaw up in the last twenty year he'd have considerable reputation now another one says i wished old boggs to threaten me cause then i'd know i won't gwine to die for a thousand year boggs comes a-tearing along on his horse whooping and yelling like a injun and singing out clear the track there i'm on the warpath and the price of coffins is a gun to rise he was drunk and weaving about in his saddle he was over fifty year old and had a very red face everybody yelled at him and laughed at him and sassed him and he sassed back and said he attend to them and lay them out in their regular turns but he couldn't wait now because he came to town to kill old colonel sherburne and his motto was meat first and spoon victuals to top off on he see me and rode up and says where'd you come from boy you prepared to die then he rode on i was scared but a man says he don't mean nothing he's always a carrying on like that when he's drunk he's the best naturedest old fool in arkansas never hurt nobody drunk no sober boggs rode up before the biggest store in town and bent his head down so he could see under the curtain of the awning and yells come out here sherburne come out and meet the man you've swindled you're the hound i'm after and i'm gonna have you too and so he went on calling sherburne everything he could lay his tongue to and the whole street packed with people listening and laughing and going on by and by a proud-looking man about fifty-five and he was a heap the best dressed man in that town too steps out of a store and the crowd drops back on each side to let him come he says to boggs mighty calm and slow he says i'm tired of this but i'll endure it till one o'clock till one o'clock mine no longer if you open your mouth against me only once after that time you can't travel so far but i will find you then he turns and goes in the crowd looked mighty sober nobody stirred and there weren't no more laughing boggs rode off blackguard and sherburne as loud as he could yell all down the street and pretty soon back he comes and stops before the store still keeping it up some men crowded around him and tried to get him to shut up but he weren't they told him it would be one o'clock in about fifteen minutes and so he must go home he must go right away but it didn't do no good he cussed away with all his might 
and throwed his hat down in the mud and rode over it. And pretty soon away he went, a raging down the street again, with his gray hair a-flying. Everybody that could get a chance at him tried their best to coax him off of his horse so they could lock him up and get him sober. But it weren't no use. Up the street he could tear again and give Sherburne another cussin'. By and by, somebody says, Go for his daughter. Quick, go for his daughter. Sometimes he'll listen to her. If anybody can persuade him, she can. So somebody started on a run. I walked down the street a ways and stopped. In about five or ten minutes, here comes Boggs again, but not on his horse. He was reeling across the street toward me, bareheaded, with a friend on both sides of him, a hole of his arms, and hurrying him along. He was quiet and looked uneasy, and he weren't hanging back any, but was doing some of the hurrying himself. Somebody sings out, Box. I looked over there to see who said it, and it was that Colonel Sherburne. He was standing perfectly still in the street, and had a pistol raised in his right hand, not aiming it, but holding it out with the barrel tilted up toward the sky. The same second I see a young girl come on the run, and two men with her. Boggs and the men turn round to see who called them, and when they see the pistol, the men jump to one side, and the pistol barrel came down slow and steady to a level, both barrels cocked. Boggs throws up both of his hands and says, Oh, Lord, don't shoot. Bang! Goes the first shot, and he staggers back, clawing at the air. Bang! Goes the second one, and he tumbles backwards, onto the ground, heavy and solid, with his arms spread out. That young girl screamed out and comes a rushin', and down she throws herself onto her father, crying and saying, Oh, he's killed him! He's killed him! The crowd closed up around them, and shouldered and jammed one another, with their necks stretched, trying to see, and people on the inside trying to shove them back and shouting, Mad, mad, give him air, give him air! Colonel Sherburne, he tossed his pistol on the ground, and turned around on his heels and walked off. They took Boggs to a little drug store, the crowd pressing around just the same, and the whole town following, and I rushed and got a good place at the window, where I was close to him and could see in. They laid him on the floor, and put one large Bible under his head, and opened another one, and spread it on his breast. But they tore open his shirt first, and I seen where one of the bullets went in, he made about a dozen long gasps, his breast lifting the Bible up when he drawed in his breath, and letting it down again when he breathed it out. And after that he laid still. He was dead. Then they pulled his daughter away from him, screaming and crying, and took her off. She was about sixteen, and very sweet and gentle looking, but awful pale and scared. Well, pretty soon the whole town was there squirming and scourging and pushing and shoving to get at the window and have a look but people that had the places wouldn't give them up and folks behind them was saying all the time say now you've looked enough you fellows tain't right and tain't fair for you to stay thar all the time and never give nobody a chance other folks has their rights as well as you there was considerable jawing back so i slid out thinking maybe there was going to be trouble the streets was full and everybody was excited everybody that seen the shooting was telling how it happened and there was a big crowd packed around each one of these fellows stretching their necks and listening one long lanky man with long hair and a big white fur stove pipe hat on the back of his head and a crooked handled cane marked out of the places on the ground where bog stood and where Sherburne stood, and the people following him around from one place to the other, and watching everything he'd done, and bobbing their heads to show they understood, and stooping a little and resting their hands on the thighs to watch him mark the places on the ground with his cane, and then he stood up straight and stiff where Sherburne had stood, 
frowning and having his hat brim down over his eyes, and sung out, Boggs! And then fetched his cane down slow to a level, and says, Bang! Staggered backwards, and says, Bang! Again, and fell down fat on his back. The people that had seen the thing said he'd done it perfect, said it was just exactly the way it all happened. Then, as much as a dozen people got out their bottles and treated him, well, by and by, somebody said Sherburne ought to be lynched. In about a minute, everybody was saying it, so away they went, mad and yelling, and snatching down every clothesline they come to, to do the hanging with. End of chapter 21